Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. The, I, sorry, Senator. Oh, on this issue, Senator? No, so um, I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, Senator. Coleman, you were seeking the call. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a brief a statement about pairing arrangements in the chamber. Set. Leave is granted. Senator Coleman. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, uh, pairing arrangements are in this chamber are, of course, informal arrangements, uh, but they are very important arrangements uh, to ensure that the decisions in this chamber appropriately reflect the will of the Australian people as expressed at uh, the previous uh, election and they have uh, worked uh, very effectively for a very, very long time uh, and despite all of our uh, appropriately robust engagement in the battle of ideas, uh, senators from all parties and the crossbench uh, have uh, respected uh, the uh, important convention in relation uh, to uh, pairing arrangements. Uh, it, um, there have been some informal discussions in relation to pairing arrangements in the context of uh, the um, current COVID-induced uh, uh, um, arrangements in the Senate with uh, a number of uh, senators, in indeed in the entire parties, uh, participating uh, in these proceedings uh, remotely. Uh, in, this con in this context, what I would like to uh, set out on behalf of the government is that the government agrees for the ongoing operation of pairing arrangements in the Senate that where requested by any WIP voting instructions for any party or senator that will not otherwise be represented in the chamber during a division shall be provided by that party's whip or the senator concerned before the commencement of any division. Uh, it is indeed reasonable for uh, voting instructions that have been received and are intended to be claimed in the context of pairing arrangements to be provided by uh, the relevant party or senator concerned where requested. Uh, disclosing this information ensures the transparent operation of pairing arrangements uh, and its ongoing success moving forward, and that the voting intention of any party or senator not represented in the chamber is accurately reflected by governments and oppositions. Thank, I thank the Senate. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a short statement in response. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. Um, uh, and I thank the Leader of the Government and the Senate for his contribution. And I just want to make a few comments on Hansard from the, from the opposition's perspective. Uh, as uh, Senator Cormann has said, the system of pairing in the Senate has operated successfully for decades, and that has been as a consequence of, uh, of arrangements between the parties. The pairing of senators who are absent ensures that in all divisions where government and opposition are voting in opposite ways, the result in this chamber is not determined as a consequence of the absence of particular senators voting one way or the other. This is a system of benefit to all parties in a chamber where there is no one group which has a majority and the balance of power exists with a number of crossbench senators. An important feature of this system is the convention of governments and oppositions accommodating minor party and independent senators in their pairs in divisions where government and opposition are on opposing sides in divisions. Clearly, in a hybrid parliament, we do have to look at how we ensure that this system continues to operate, uh, and we agree with the government that in order for this system to work in this context, pairing instructions from senators who are not otherwise represented in the chamber during a division should be transparent, provided in writing, and made e available equally to whips of parties, all parties available upon request. Thank you. Is that 
There being, I will just quickly, if there's no one else seeking the call, pursuant to Standing Order 12, I lay on the table a warrant nominating Senator O'Neill as an additional temporary, of chairs, temporary chair of committees when the deputy president and chair of committees is absent. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Coronavirus Economic Response Package JobKeeper Payments Amendment Bill 2020, further consideration in Committee of the Whole. The committee is currently considering the Coronavirus Economic Response Package JobKeeper Payments Amendment Bill of 2020. The question is, Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President, Madam Chair. Um, I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this uh, bill, and I seek leave to move all these amendments together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted, I, Minister. I, I thank the Senate. Uh, these amendments are minor and technical in nature. They are the result of continued consultation with stakeholders who have indicated to the government that the specific wording used in the bill as it stands, combined with the very technical nature of tax and accounting services, could uh, combine to cause practical issues. As such, for the avoidance of doubt, uh, these amendments will alter the definition of financial service provider in the bill to remove registered company auditors and tax financial advisor from the definition of eligible financial service provider, leaving qualified accountants, registered tax agents and BIS agents. And to ensure that the policy intention of the provision is given effect, make clear that the issuing of the 10 per cent decline in turnover certificate involves a declaration from an eligible financial service provider that relates to a specific employer and confirms that based on the information provided, the employer satisfied the 10 per cent decline in turnover test for the designated quarter applicable to a specified time. This replaces the existing requirement that the provider express an opinion. Thank you, Minister. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam uh, Deputy uh, President. Uh, Labor will not oppose uh, this amendment, <coughs> but <coughs> this is very embarrassing for the government and particularly the, uh, <coughs> the leader in the Senate. Yet again, it appears that the government has made <coughs> an announcement and then discovered they had forgotten to do some pretty important consultation with professionals responsible for an important accountability message. I can see you're agreeing with me, Leader. <clears throat> it seems they forgot to tell the accounting profession that they would be responsible for ensuring the emergency IR powers were legitimately used, that they would provide a certificate to testify that the employer was suffering a 10 per cent turnover decline. The legislation as it stands states that a business which employs more than 15 people would have to obtain a certificate from an eligible financial service provider, which means either a registered company auditor or a registered tax agent, BAS agent or tax financial advisor, or a qualified accountant. Well, the government has just found out that this doesn't sit well with the accounting profession. How does someone who is not a registered tax agent or a BAS agent calculate turnover if they are not uh, qualified or even possibly legally able to do so? Well, these amendments show they won't. Second, the reference in the bill to an eligible financial service provider stating their opinion that the employer has satisfied a 10 per cent decline in turnover test for the designated quarter applicable to the specified time is also highly problematic. The phrase, in the opinion, has particular meaning and it is suggested that this would entail the conduct of an audit. This, of course, would add substantial cost and time, but to do otherwise increases their risk exposure. So again, we have an amendment dealing uh, with that concern. It's better late uh, than never, I guess, but what is actually quite unbelievable is that while the government has uh, listened and responded to the concerns of the accountancy profession, who they forgot to consult with prior to introducing this bill and who are concerned that they may be legally impacted, the government has deliberately chosen to reject Labor's amendments, which would ensure low-paid workers in this country aren't forced to have their take-home pay cut at the same time as their employer's business is recovering. Uh, Madam, Acting, uh, Madam Deputy President, this says everything about the government, absolutely everything. 
is anyone else seeking the call? Not that I can see. So the question is that the amendments uh, moved by Senator Cormann, one to six on sheet SW102 by leave together be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So I'm in the hands of the Senate. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I seek leave to move Green's amendments one and five on sheet uh, one and five together on sheet one zero zero nine. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I mean, if the government was serious about keeping jobs, they would have listened to workers, they would have listened to unions, they would have listened to academics, they would have listened to the Greens, and they would have listened to the countless organisations that have been calling for the expansion of JobKeeper to all casual workers, to all temporary visa holders, to all university workers, and to all um, childcare workers. Instead, the government is overseeing a wage subsidy called JobKeeper that has allowed millions of workers to lose their jobs and be forced into unemployment. It is JobKeeper in name only, I have to say. The scheme is leaving millions of workers behind, and the scheme is still $44 billion under budget, even with a six-month extension. So there is absolutely no excuse for leaving these workers behind. We should be expanding um, the payment to all workers who need it, not cutting it. And I'm moving a series of amendments about this. The first ones, as I suggested, are one and five. Um, and this amendment will expand eligibility for JobKeeper payments to casual workers who have been employed for less than 12 months. The government continues to deny over one million casual workers access to JobKeeper. The majority of these workers are under 24 years old and work in the industries which have been hardest hit um, in this pandemic, such as retail, hospitality, arts, tourism, accommodation, and education. And so by ignoring the calls from workers, from unions, from the Greens, and businesses to expand JobKeeper, the government is forcing workers into unemployment and really struggling businesses to the brink. I commend the amendment to the House, to the Senate. Minister. The government will not be uh, supporting uh, these amendments, and I might just talk to all amendments on sheet uh, one or nine uh, together. Um, in, in relation to um, casuals, temporary visa holders, childcare and universities, casual employees who have been employed for under 12 months as at 1 July 2020 are not eligible for the JobKeeper payment. The JobKeeper payment is a significant program of support for businesses and employees, the program is targeted at employers and em employees with an ongoing relationship. Casual employees who have been employed for more than 12 months on a regular and systematic basis are eligible for the JobKeeper payment as they are expected to have a strong connection with their employer. From 3 August 2020, the relevant date of employment moved from 1 March 2020 to 1 July 2020, which will allow casual employees that have been employed on a regular and systematic basis from on or before 1 July 2019 to be able to meet this eligibility requirement. This has meant that the JobKeeper payment is available to more casual employees. The proposed amendment uh, to change the rules uh, by instead requiring for it to be reasonable to assume that the employee would have continued to be an employee of the entity if the entity had not been directly or indirectly affected by the coronavirus would be very, very difficult for employers to apply and for the Australian Taxation Office to administer, as it is a highly subjective test. An employer may say that it is not reasonable to expect the employee to remain in that employment, thereby potentially disentitling employees who are currently eligible. So it also has uh, counterproductive consequences, even from the perspective of the move of uh, these amendments. In relation to temporary visa holders, employees on temporary visas, with the exception of New Zealand citizens on special category subclass uh, for, for, for visas are not eligible for the JobKeeper payment. The eligibility for the JobKeeper payment is broadly aligned with eligibility through the income support system for job seeker. Australia has historical and special reciprocal arrangements with New Zealand to allow citizens to live and work in each country. For this reason, they are the only temporary visa category to receive access to the scheme. The government has announced the following measures to support temporary visa holders. Many temporary visa holders are eligible for the early release of their superannuation if they meet other eligibility criteria for either 
2019-20 or both 2019-20 and 2020-21, bridging visa holders may be able to access the Status Resolution Support Services Program, which provides short-term tailored support to individuals. During the COVID-19 period, applications for support under the uh, SRSS will be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, and several state governments and tertiary institutions have also announced support packages for international students. Uh, in relation to childcare, from 13 July 2020, the childcare subsidy and additional childcare subsidy recommended, along with a range of new measures to support the sector and its families through the transition, including an eased activity test for families and a new transition payment for providers have been put in place. Nearly one-third of the early childhood workforce was ineligible for the JobKeeper payment. The government is providing a $708 million transition payment, which will support services more broadly and equitably than the JobKeeper payment, which was designed to provide support quickly across the whole economy. As a condition of receiving the transition payment, providers must offer an employment guarantee by continuing to employ those employees over the transition period who were working or being paid JobKeeper at the end of the um, ECEC relief package. Uh, the Minister for Education undertook broad consultation uh, with the childcare sector during the development of the transition package. Therefore, to ensure government support is appropriately targeted, JobKeeper ceased on 20 July 2020 for employees of uh, childcare subsidy approved providers operating a childcare service. In relation to higher education, in response to the COVID pandemic, the government introduced an $18 billion funding guarantee for universities in 2020. It guarantees more than $7 billion in 2020 Commonwealth grant scheme payments, as well as around another $7 billion in higher education loan program advanced payments to providers. The government's funding guarantee is designed to complement the JobKeeper payment. Universities and non-government schools, which are also registered charities, are unable to access the 15 per cent declining turnover test and must use the 30 or 50 per cent turnover test as applicable to be eligible. Universities and non-government schools already receive significant Commonwealth funding that will support them to maintain services and employees. Most universities will need to meet the turnover decline test by comparing the turnover for the six-month period of January to June 2020 with turnover for January to June 2019. This clarification addresses the timing of income for universities, which is focused around the start of academic terms. The changes to the job keeper rules to exempt Table B universities from the six-month turnover decline test were implemented on 22 May 2020 through the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Payments and Benefits Amendment Rules No. 3 2020. The change took effect from 30 March 2020. Table B universities will need to meet a monthly or quarterly decline in turnover test in line, in line with the test for other entities. Uh, Table B universities are the University of uh, Divinity, Torrance University, Bond University and the University of Notre Dame, Australia. These universities have less Commonwealth supported students than Table I universities and they also operate under a different structure with trimesters or more students enrolled over the summer break, meaning the six-month test applying to Table I universities wasn't appropriately target, targeted to these universities. The core Commonwealth Government financial assistance provided to universities is included when they determine their decline in turnover. This will ensure that the bulk of revenue received by universities is taken into account in assessing eligibility for the JobKeeper payment. This change addresses an anomaly that many universities would not have had to count the bulk of their revenue provided by the Australian Government for the turnover decline test. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Chair. I rise to speak on this uh, amendment, and my comments uh, about this amendment will also um, apply to all of the remaining uh, amendments by the Greens Party. Labor has called for the government to expand support for those workers who need it and to ensure that economic support is tailored to the conditions in the economy, including rising unemployment. However, we will not be supporting this amendment, which would not be supported by the other House, as it would increase the appropriation. The government uh, should not have excluded millions of workers from JobKeeper while overpaying some workers. Uh, yet the, the government has uh, the extraordinary power to set the rates and include those workers they have deliberately excluded from the JobKeeper payment. The important test of the Morrison government's management of, the, of this recession and its aftermath 
is what happens to jobs and the businesses which create them. Workers, businesses and communities need and deserve a plan from the Morrison government to promote growth, protect and create jobs, support business and set Australia up for the recovery. We can't afford to see more Australians left out and left behind because the Prime Minister and the Treasurer are not prepared to respond to developments in the uh, labour market to come up or to come up with uh, a proper plan for jobs. Thank you, Minister. Senator Fruki, I'm just wondering if you are interested in moving the rest of those amendments on sheet 109. I'll be moving them separately, okay, and I want to speak to. I haven't spoken to them either. Yet. Okay, so um, I'm going to move the first one. So, uh, the question is that the requests one and five on sheet one double zero nine, as moved by Senator Faruqi, that the request the request for amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. I believe the noes have it. Did you want a division, or do you want it recorded? You want a division. Uh, Ring the bells for four minutes, please.
Stop the bells. So the question is that the requests one to five on sheet 009 as moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order, there being seven ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move Green's amendments two and six together. Two and six on sheet one double zero nine together. Is um, leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Chair. This this amendment will expand eligibility for JobKeeper payments to workers on temporary visas. It is a real shame that this government has created this arbitrary division between temporary work, uh, visa holders and you know permanent citizens, as if the virus discriminates based on visas. People are in the same terrible situation in the pandemic, and they need all the support that this government can provide them. And it is our job to support people who are in Australia. I mean, there's report after report of international students who are basically being left destitute. And the minister did say that the states were providing some support packages for them, and good on them, but they are not near enough. International students and higher education is a responsibility of the federal government, and you are abrogating your responsibility by not providing support to students who are finding it hard to put food on the table and have a roof over their head at a time when they need it most. And the government has watched as thousands of temporary visa holders have lost their jobs. You have stood by as hundreds have resorted to lining up at food banks because you have denied them the access to the financial support they deserve and need. You know, you're not even being transparent in actually telling us if you ever considered such a support. Um, you know, my uh, OPD, to actually get some documents, which we know that the government has, just, you know, the door was shut on that. And there was a big debate happening on government transparency and accountability um, yesterday. And many of uh, the senators on this side of the chamber you know, spoke very eloquently about the government hiding everything in the dark. At a time when we need to be more transparent, you won't even tell us if you ever considered supporting international students, let alone providing them with any support. Migrant communities, unions and support organizations have been raising concerns since the, since the beginning of this pandemic but the government, yet again, has ignored their calls. 
when this is a humanitarian crisis that is unfolding here in our own country, which is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, surely this government can find it in their hearts, in their budgets, in their coffers to provide support to international students enough for them to live above the poverty line during this pandemic. I commend the amendments to the Senate. Is anyone else seeking the call on this amendment? Senator Farrell? Okay, in that case, the question is that Australian Greens amendments 2 and 6 move together on sheet 1009 be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. So the question is that Australian Greens amendments two and six on sheet one double oh nine be agreed to. Uh, I call Senator Seawitt teller for the eyes and Senator McCarthy teller for the nose. Order. There being six ayes and 29 noes, the amendments are not agreed to. Senator Faruqi, do you seek the call again? Senators, could I remind you to either leave the chamber or resume your seats in silence? Senator Faruqi, you have the call. Thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move Green's amendments two, uh, no, three and seven together on sheet 1009. So we've granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Um, thank you, Chair. I mean, I did expect uh, the government to have no sympathy for casual workers and those on temporary visas, but it is pretty sad to see the Labour Party sitting again and again with the Liberals, voting with them against the interests of workers. That is a very sad situation and a very sad scene to see. Uh, this amendment is about reinstating JobKeeper for early education workers. It, it really boggles my mind, and it's quite inexplicable how um, you know, childcare became the first and the only sector to be kicked off JobKeeper. Um, you know, there's been report after report, day after day, telling us of the importance of that sector uh, for the children for the parents, for the families, uh, for women in particular, for our society and for our economy. Yet, JobKeeper was taken away from them in July, and the government keeps saying that this will not be reinstated. Everyone in the community knows that childcare support is a vital part of our response to the pandemic. Childcare workers have been on the front line providing essential support, while also being on the front line for these horrible cuts. I mean, axing JobKeeper for childcare workers, we know predominantly impacts women. Um, there's discussion after discussion about the pink recession that we are having, um, you know, how women already make up the vast majority of the low-paid workforce, um, the gender pay gap that keeps persisting year in, year out, and that women have been left to pick up the bulk of childcare responsibility at home while juggling work while this pandemic is happening. And, you know, we're in this for a while, and the government keeps saying we're in this together, but obviously we're not in this together. There's so many people who are being left behind, left out of support. The government should immediately reinstate 
job keeper for early education workers. I commend the amendments to the Senate. So any other senator wish to speak to these amendments? In that case, the question is that Australian Greens amendments 3 and 7 on sheet 1009 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Do you wish a division or you just wish it to be recorded? Ring the bells. Uh, both sides happy with one minute? Ring the bells for one minute. Sorry, with Matisse, just ask for one. Are you on four? Sorry, go for four minutes.
Stop the bells. So the question is that Australian Greens amendments 3 and 7 on sheet 1009 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair. The noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seward, teller for the ayes, and Senator McCarthy, teller for the noes. Order. There being five ayes and 28 noes, the amendment is not supported. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Chair. I request leave for moving amendments 4 and 8 on sheet 1009 together. Uh, just before I ask for leave, Senators, I advise that we have probably at least two more divisions on these amendments have come fairly quickly. I intend to only ring the bells for one minute to facilitate the operation of the chamber unless there's objection from witnesses. Uh, so please remain adjacent to the chamber. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Faruqi, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, these amendments have been about expanding eligibility for JobKeeper to the workers that have been left behind by the government in this pandemic. And I want to talk about universities now. Um, universities, tens of thousands of workers in the universities have already less, lost their jobs and there are tens of thousands who are going to lose their jobs even before the end of the year, all during this pandemic. And the government changed JobKeeper rules three times to make sure that no public university was left eligible for JobKeeper. The government was warned that this was going to happen, that they could actually stop this from happening, but they didn't. But even worse than that, today, in the other place, the government has brought forward a bill that will further cut funding from universities, that will hike fees for students, and that will decimate our, our higher education sector. There is no shame at all in this government. They don't hide their hatred for universities at all. They have just accelerated their attacks on universities during the pandemic. Following years of funding cuts that we have seen in the sector happened under various governments of both colors. Now they have denied this vital wage subsidy and are further punishing universities. When this is the time to actually invest in education, this is the time to fully publicly fund universities so that staff and teachers can actually educate our young people, our students to the highest of quality while also having security of jobs. This is the time to make higher education universities and TAFE fee free so students can actually train and retrain 
in what the future of our country and the world needs. But what this university is doing is leaving universities completely abandoned, completely high and dry, thousands of jobs being lost. No fun little funding for research. Nothing in this package that is being debated in the other place today improves the situation for any university, for any student, for any staff member. It's an attack on universities, and it must be stopped. I commend the amendments to the Senate. Is any other senator wish to speak to the amendments? In that case, the question is that Australian Greens Amendments 4 and 8 on Sheet 1009 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that Australian Greens amendments 4 and 8 on sheet 1009 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I point Senator Seawitt to tell her for the ayes. Senator McCarthy, tell her for the noes. Order there being five ayes and 26 noes, the amendment is not agreed to. Again, I remind senators uh, there will be another division, and I only intend to ring the bells for one minute. Senator Faruqi, you have the call. Um, thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move Greens amendments one and two on sheet 1011 together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, this amends the Coronavirus Economic Package Payments and Benefits Act 2020. <coughs> to prevent the minister from establishing a tiered payment system. While the JobKeeper bill doesn't deal specifically with tiered payments, it does extend the rulemaking power, which allows the minister to establish tiers. The amendment will insert a new section that specifies the minister must not create rules for different rates of pay for different employees. On the 21st of July, the government foreshadowed a number of changes to the JobKeeper program including the introduction of tiered payments from the 28th of September 2020. Under the changes announced by the government, the hours worked in the four, week, four weeks prior to 1 March 
2020 or 1 July 2020 will determine what level of payment workers will receive, specifically whether they worked more or less than 20 hours. This is despite the high unemployment rate during those times. So in March, the underemployment rate was 8%. 10.6% for women compared to 7.2% for men. 19.1% for young people aged between 15 and 24 years old. In July, the underemployment rate soared to 11.2%. It was 12.2% for women. 19.6% for young people aged between 15 and 24 years old. This government intends to slash payments for underemployment low-income workers in insecure, jo in insecure jobs, predominantly impacting women and young people. And this sends one resounding message, that the government won't hesitate to kick workers when they're down and throw vulnerable workers off a financial cliff in the midst of a recession, in the midst of a pandemic. Also of concern is the impact that tiered payments will have on workers who work more than 20 hours across multiple jobs. Someone who works 38 hours a week across two jobs, that's 19 hours in each, will still see their JobKeeper payments slashed. The Greens, of course, support the extension of JobKeeper, but not at the expense of low-paid workers in the midst of a recession. I commend the amendment to the Senate. Minister. We are opposing those amendments. Two tiers of payment uh, under JobKeeper enables employers to more closely align the JobKeeper payment might to eligible employees with the payment they received prior to the public health restrictions being imposed to address coronavirus. And this is one of the outcomes and recommendations out of the uh, review conducted by Treasury after the initial three months of operation of the JobKeeper program. Uh, and um, th that is the basis on which we oppose these amendments. Does any other senator wish to speak to these amendments? In that case, the question is, Australian Greens amendments one and two on sheet 1011 be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Would you like to record that or do you require a division? Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is Australian Greens Amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 1011 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt, tell her for the ayes. Senator McCarthy, tell her for the noes.
Order. There being four ayes and 30 noes, the amendment is not agreed to. Senator Patrick, would you like to move your amendment on sheet 1028? Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I uh, seek leave to move amendment 1 and 2 on sheet 1028 together. Uh, is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Patrick. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Oh, sorry, Mr Chair. Um, We've got a situation where taxpayers' money, which is designed to support uh, businesses and is designed to support uh, their workers and keep them connected, is being funnelled into uh, companies' investors' pockets by way of dividends and also being funnelled into, into executives' salary uh, packages by way of executive bonuses. In, uh, in expressing my concern to the chamber, I'm actually going to read from uh, uh, the honourable uh, Dr. Uh, Lee's contribution, the member for uh, Ferner, uh, Fenner, yesterday in the in the uh, in the other place, where he said, "But a scheme designed to reduce inequality is being misused by a small number of firms who are channelling it to executive bonuses." Accent Group received $13 million in JobKeeper and gave CEO Daniel Agostinelli $13 million in JobKeeper and gave C— uh, uh, oh, Sorry, so let me start that again. Accent Group has received $13 million in JobKeeper and paid its CEO uh, $1.2 million in, in bonuses. IDP Education has received $4 million in JobKeeper and gave C its CEO $600,000. Last year, uh, the, the CEO, Andrew Barkler, was Australia's highest paid CEO, taking in $37 million. Star Casino received $64 million in, in JobKeeper and gave CEO Matt Beckler an equity bonus worth $800,000. C-Link received $8 million in JobKeeper and gave CEO Clinton Fewhart a $500,000 bonus. And then there is Dividend Keeper, diverting money for workers into shareholders' payouts. Furniture firm uh, Nick Scarley received $4 million from Australian and New Zealand taxpayers. It increased dividends uh, and will deliver $2 million to the, that will deliver $2 million to the Scarley family. 1300 Smiles got $2 million in JobKeeper and paid $3 million to shareholders. Uh, Managing Director Darrell Holmes owns two-thirds of the company, and so he will get around about $2 million roughly what his company received in JobKeeper support. As Ownership Matters Dean uh, Patch put it, I don't think it was ever the intention of the government to subsidise executive salaries. If you're getting taxpayer subsidies, the CEO should not be getting a bonus. Now, my amendment requires the equivalent payment uh, that has been paid for workers under JobKeeper to be returned by the company back to the tax ta taxpayer in circumstances where the Commissioner is satisfied, having regard to the amount of the dividend, bonus or other similar payments and the extent to which it exceeds the amount of the last such payment by the entity or any other matters that the Commissioner uh, considers relevant. Uh, there is a caveat in here that the entity's conduct in making those payments <coughs> indicates the, the entity was not uh, affected directly or indirectly by coronavirus, known as COVID-19, to the extent that the entity required financial support under this Act. So what this amendment seeks to do, just to be really clear, we want to stop money that is designed to support businesses, that is designed to support uh, workers, getting taken from the taxpayer and funnelled into the pockets of investors or the pockets of uh, chief executives and senior executives within, within the company. No one would have anticipated that, uh, that this sort of conduct would occur. It's unethical, and we should do something about it. And I point out my amendment is retrospective, so we can go back and look at those companies that have reaped 
a taxpayer's benefit whilst claiming JobKeeper. And for, for that reason, I ask that the Senate supports this amendment. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the um, JobKeeper payment was designed to apply consistently across a range of business sizes, structures and industries and to target support to those entities who have been significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. It was also designed to deliver uh, support quickly and at scale, which is why it was important that the eligibility criteria were as straightforward as possible, drawing upon existing tax and revenue concepts and definitions. To support confidence and encourage businesses to get back up and running, the government decided that once a business had established its eligibility, assistance would be provided until the end of the first six months phase of the program. The review of the JobKeeper program recommended that there should be a retest of eligibility for any extension to the program to ensure that the payment is targeted to those businesses who are the most in need of ongoing support and indeed who are in need of continuing support. Uh, modifying the eligibility criteria to include a measure of the profitability of a business or other criteria such as the payment of dividends would introduce significant complexity uh, into the program. Such a test would be difficult to design and implement with integrity on the scale required given the variety in business models and structures across industries and given the flexibility that businesses have in the management of their balance sheet. While there may be merit in considering such design elements if this was intended to be an ongoing program, it is less clear that this would be feasible or desirable in the current context of a, of a temporary uh, transitional support program. Some countries have, under their wage subsidy schemes, placed limitations on, uh, limitations on the payment of dividends. However, there are many that have not, including the UK, Canada, New Zealand and Singapore. In other cases where limitations have been put in place, it is not clear how these are being appropriately enforced. Uh, so the government will be opposing these amendments. Senator Gather. Uh, I thank you. Uh, Labor will also be opposing this amendment. This amendment has only been circulated uh, this morning and um, does propose some quite significant uh, changes to the scheme as it currently operates. Um, so really, we haven't had the time to understand the impact of what these proposed changes might have. Um, I think if there's an issue about businesses getting JobKeeper and not using it for the right purposes or using it to um, you know, support investors or um, executive remuneration. I think that is a, an issue the government you know, should be looking at. And if, if further changes need to be made, I think probably the government and the ATO, the people collecting the data, are in the best position uh, to respond to that. I think there are concerns around the retrospectivity um, of, of the requirements where eligibility criteria would have been satisfied at the point of being provided um, these payments and then subsequently changing the rules. I think those are legitimate issues which would normally, if we were going through legislation, be able to be uh, uh, examined and scrutinised in the context of, of some sort of Senate process that this morning hasn't allowed, so Labor won't be supporting them. Senator Faruqi. Um, the Greens do agree in principle with what, is, uh, what this amendment is um, trying to achieve. Uh, the Greens first raised these concerns about this in April um, during the COVID-19 committee hearing, actually, when Senator Wish Wilson as Treasury Secretary Stephen Ken asked Treasury Secretary C Stephen Kennedy whether the JobKeeper review would consider changing the eligibility criteria for businesses, recording profits and paying increased dividends. Disappointingly, it was not considered in that review. Senator Wish Wilson also wrote to the Secretary um, Kennedy last month proposing that eligibility criteria be changed for companies paying dividends. Unfortunately, the government has not acted to address this loophole. Um, and the amendment, I'm afraid, was only circulated a little while ago. Um, the Greens have really not had enough time to review the amendment fully and its consequences in detail. And in the short time we have had to look at it, we are concerned that under Section 9 of the Enabling Payments and Benefits legislation, workers of these companies would be liable to repay the amount. I don't think that that's what um, Senator Patrick has intended, but that is how it appears uh, on its face. So we are concerned that there may be other unintended consequences too. Uh, the Greens definitely support the principle of what Senator pa Patrick is trying to achieve. 
But unfortunately, the Greens can't support this amendment at this time, and we do hope that we get another opportunity to address this important issue. Does any other senator wish to address the amendment? In the case, the question is in amendments one and two on sheet 1028 from Sorry, Senator Patrick. So I just have a couple of questions for the minister. Uh, does the minister think it's ethical for companies to take taxpayers' money and uh, funnel it into the, the hands of uh, investors uh, and indeed or, or executive uh, pay, po uh, pay packets? Minister. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, the test here is uh, whether what uh, businesses do is lawful uh, in all of the circumstances, and uh, I've explained in my contribution uh, to uh, this amendment, uh, you know, the reasons why the government uh, moved as swiftly as we did. Um, there, there was clearly a need uh, to act uh, quickly. There was a need uh, to ensure that the system uh, was um, as uh, simple and as efficient as possible on, uh, in terms of providing the necessary support on a large uh, scale. Uh, that is what we've done. That is what countries uh, in other parts of the world have done, including, as I've indicated, uh, New Zealand, the UK, Canada and others on uh, a similar basis uh, to Australia, similarly not making uh, the uh, arrangements uh, overly uh, complex. Uh, and uh, you know, no nobody is forced uh, to uh, participate in these arrangements, but the arrangements uh, should be available on an, on an equal basis. Uh, on, on the same terms and conditions to all businesses and any businesses that complies uh, with uh, uh, the law, of course, uh, should be able to, to participate as appropriate. Senator Patrick. Yes, so Minister, uh, I, I note the contrast in the approach taken by government uh, to allow funding to go to, uh, uh, to, sh to dividend uh, recipients and or uh, executive uh, pay salaries. Uh, I, the contrast with that, for example, we, in this instance you're not trying to recover money, uh, but in the case of robo-debt, where uh, uh, the government has found that it's legally uh, insufficient to uh, pursue money, that in the past it has pursued this money. Can you see the, the, uh, the, the frustration that most Australians would have in your dogged pursuit of people uh, uh, on welfare uh, versus uh, allowing uh, investors and company executives to receive bonuses through a taxpayer-funded uh, arrangement. Minister, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, I I don't agree with um, the analogy on a, a whole range of uh, grounds. Uh, you know, clearly, whether it's our tax laws or or, or our income support payment arrangements, uh, if somebody pays too little tax uh, compared to what the law requires, or somebody is paid more uh, than they uh, should have been based uh, on the law of the land. And this has been a position uh, for uh, governments of both persuasions uh, forever and a day, appropriately so. Um, then, then, of course, uh, part of the uh, compliance arrangements appropriately is to recoup uh, any money that is either not paid in taxes, uh, and that's what our anti-avoidance measures in our tax laws are all about, or to recoup uh, any money that has been overpaid. I mean, the, uh, issue uh, in relation uh, uh, the, the uh, issue that Senator Patrick mentions is not so much that principle. Uh, the, the issue uh, that uh, Senator Patrick uh, raises relates to the fact that uh, governments of both persuasions again have uh, used a particular methodology where, um, where income support recipients do not engage with the government. Uh, those gov governments have been forced to make assumptions and have used the methodology which ultimately the court found to be unlawful. And, and of course, uh, governments, uh, businesses, individuals, everyone has to comply with the law. Governments have to comply with the law. Uh, and uh, given uh, the findings there, the government is, consist is acting consistent uh, with legal requirements. In the same way as uh, businesses have to act consistent with legal requirements when they access uh, the um, JobKeeper support payments. Uh, I, I don't think that anything that Senator Patrick has raised in any way uh, su uh, suggests or provides a proof for the proposition uh, that uh, any of the businesses that he references is uh, breaching the law. Senator Patrick. Uh, if I accept, oh, thank you, um, to, the, to the minister again. If I uh, accept uh, your proposition that these companies have been acting lawfully, uh, but uh, I, you know, I, I ask the question, do you think they're, they're operating ethically? And 
moving forward, moving forward, how do we prevent a situation uh, where we've got companies that are profiting from uh, from JobKeeper, and that money is being funnelled into the pockets of investors uh, and and or executives. What are the government's plans moving forward to prevent that sort of situation from occurring again? Minister, thank you very much. And I mean, this is really the last contribution I can sensibly make on the same point. Um, I mean, businesses make commercial uh, decisions uh, all the time, consistent, you know, in, in the context of the legal framework that is applicable at any one point in time. Uh, the government, with the support of the parliament, uh, has made uh, the JobKeeper payment, uh, uh, payment arrangements available to support business and to support employees uh, in businesses uh, that were experiencing significant reductions in turnover, uh, subject to the same terms and conditions. We understood that because of the uh, speed that was required in terms of getting the uh, support into the economy uh, and to businesses and to employees that there were some trade-offs there in terms of the simplicity required. Um, in terms of the point uh, or the question about what the government is proposing to do, move, to, to do about this moving forward, well, as I've indicated, this is a temporary arrangement. This is not proposed to be an ongoing program. I mean, if this was to be an ongoing program that was going to operate for years on end and decades on end, then you would ensure that you uh, refine uh, your um, integrity and compliance arrangements uh, accordingly. But this, this is a, a temporary support mechanism uh, to provide much needed support into the economy at a difficult time in the context of uh, the economic impact of a global pandemic here in Australia. And uh, you know, we believe we got the balance right and we thank uh, the opposition uh, for uh, their forbearance in relation to this amendment. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, Ch changing attack slightly, there are 1,119 uh, grandfathered large proprietary companies in Australia that, where, that uh, do not have to file financial reports to, uh, to, uh, to ASIC. Is the minister aware of how many of those uh, 1,119 companies are receiving JobKeeper? Minister. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Chair. I mean, this is obviously an issue that has been uh, discussed at length in the Senate uh, in the context of a number of bills. And I mean, the short answer is no, I'm not aware. Uh, but I'm happy to get that uh, information uh, for Senator Patrick on notice. Senator Patrick. And uh, in circumstances uh, where, of course, uh, the public can't see their financial reports, can't see what's happening, there's a complete lack of transparency. Is the government confident that? Uh, there's no, there's no abuse of JobKeeper taking place in, in, the, in, uh, in those particular uh, companies that have elite status and not having to report uh, their, their financial circumstances or, or make financial reports to ASIC? Minister. Well, well I, I reject that final uh, assertion that somehow some businesses don't have to uh, provide appropriate reports to the tax office. Uh, I mean, the issue that uh, Senator Patrick raises relates to uh, tax arrangements. Uh, JobKeeper, JobKeeper, ASIC has got no role in relation uh, to the administration of the JobKeeper program, none whatsoever. Uh, this is a program uh, that is appropriately administered uh, through the ITO. Uh, the ITO uh, has appropriate uh, compliance arrangements in place, but bearing in mind, in the context of a program that was rolled out necessarily very quickly, and you know, we believe that we've got the balance right. Senator Patrick. So just uh, coming back to it, I apologise if I said tax office. Um, of course, any, any information that's reported to the tax office is, is uh, reported as uh, what is uh, protected information and can't be revealed uh, uh, generally publicly. Uh, the normal way in which uh, people who are uh, observing and watching the, the, the behaviour of companies uh, obtain information is by going and looking at the financial reports that are filed uh, uh, with ASIC. And there are 1,119 large, uh, grandfathered large proprietary companies in Australia that simply don't have to do that. They have a privilege that has been in place since 1995, a temporary measure. Uh, and obviously uh, a lot of wealthy people involved in these, in these companies, so they don't have to file uh, a, uh, financial reports to ASIC, and I apologise for uh, uh, perhaps uh, misdirecting my previous question. Uh, just going back uh, to that, 
is, how can the government be, government be satisfied uh, that uh, because it doesn't have a, 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 a view as to these companies' financial reports, uh, that uh, there's no abuse taking place in respect of uh, JobKeeper. Minister. Again, it is a final contribution on this point. Uh, you know, uh, Senator Patrick didn't uh, uh, say, well, he, he didn't say the ITO, he did say ASIC. What I said is that ASIC is irrelevant here. And I understand that Senator Patrick is always keen to find a way to make this uh, ASIC related point wherever he can. Uh, and that's fine. I mean, it's, uh, it's one of uh, you know, the issues that uh, Senator Patrick feels strongly about, and, and I respect that. But ASIC has no role here. The, the compliance arrangements uh, are managed through the Australian Taxation Office. And every business uh, that generates um, uh, income um, you know, and uh, profits uh, in Australia needs to um, provide relevant information about their income and their tax arrangements to the tax office on the same basis, subject to the same laws and the same conditions. And the same applies in relation to JobKeeper. Senator Lambie. Um, yeah, Minister, I just thought I'd ask that since we have no vaccine and this COVID-19 could go on for another year, two years, three years, and you're talking about taxpayers' money that's probably being rorted into dividends, do you actually, are you going to get anyone in to at least have a look at it in one of the departments? Because it may go on for years, and you're talking about the economy in, in, in the dark contrast that it's sitting in, but we're just going to leave this sitting on the side, because I don't want to come back here in two years later and go, hey, we had this conversation two years ago and we're still in the same situation and it's rotting into the dividends and, quite frankly, it is ethically wrong. Minister. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, I, I don't accept that it's rotting. Uh, you know, b all businesses are required to comply with the law and there are compliance arrangements in place to ensure uh, that, to ensure that the law Order. is... Uh, you know, the, the compliance arrangements are in place uh, you know, as appropriate uh, through the usual... Uh, agency and the usual uh, processes. What I would say is that the uh, bill that is in front of us deals with the extension of JobKeeper uh, to the end of March 2021. We're not putting in place arrangements uh, on uh, an ongoing basis. I mean, in the scenario that um, Senator Lambie envisages where uh, the, you know, which is a plausible scenario, it's not an impossible scenario, so I, I certainly accept that. But in the scenario that Senator Lambie envisages where this goes on for years and years and years, uh, the Senate will be asked or will be required uh, to reconsider uh, you know, any arrangements uh, down the track to provide advice into the um, economy in that sort of context um, you know, at that point in time. I mean, we're not dealing here with legislation that puts in place an ongoing arrangement beyond the end of March. We're dealing here with an arrangement that is in place until the end of March only. Are there any further contributions to this amendment? In that case, this time, sorry, Senator Hanson. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Minister, if you're extending this COVID out to March next year, and in light of the budget hasn't been handed down, what was the forecast um, that has told your government that you must extend it out to March? Minister. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Senator Hanson. I mean, you would be aware that the government uh, released an uh, uh, um, economic and fiscal update uh, in July, uh, which uh, you know, provided uh, our uh, assessment of um, the fiscal impact of uh, the various uh, measures that we've adopted as a result of COVID, uh, as well as the fiscal impact of the economic um, parameter changes as well as our uh, assessment of the cost over the two financial years, 2019-2021. Treasury also conducted a review uh, of um, the JobKeeper arrangements uh, over the initial three months, uh, halfway through the initial six-month operation of the program, and Treasury provided advice uh, based on the review and based on their assessment of the economic outlook uh, moving forward. And you know, in the context of, in particular, what's, uh, happened, what's been happening in Victoria in more recent times, um, you know, we've made the judgments that we've made. I mean, the judgments that we've made is that, yes, we do need to uh, transition out of this uh, historically unprecedented level of transitional support. We're phasing uh, down uh, the um, uh, payment from uh, the end of September uh, to the end of uh, December and then again from January to the end of March. And we're also reapplying the turnover test to, to ensure that the businesses that receive 
uh, this support uh, still genuinely require that support on an ongoing basis. And so we, we do believe that the steps that we're taking are part of a pathway uh, to transition uh, the economy out of what is historically unprecedented fiscal support for businesses and workers. Thank you. Minister, it is unprecedented having the COVID that's hit Australia and worldwide. And of course, we had put measures in place to, to ensure that people were protected, those on job seeker and job keeper. The fact is that the government has made a huge mistake by putting people on job keeper when in light of the fact is of $1,500 a fortnight, when a lot of these people were only earning possibly around about four or five hundred dollars a week. So you have actually overpaid them. What you've done now in light of that is that you've actually um, set a precedent in this country that people expect those high payments now, trying to get out of it, that people are getting paid this money from the government and they don't want to go back to work. People are getting paid prior to COVID, on the 27th of April, we had 700, approximately 727,000 people on New Start Allowance. Immediately, those people went on to Job Seeker with an increase of $550 a fortnight. They, their circumstances had not changed whatsoever, but you put them on that. Then you've actually started the Job Keeper to connect people with the businesses. Regardless of the number of hours that they worked, you put them on $1,500 a, a a fortnight. What we found now is that people, and I'm hearing from businesses, they don't want to go back to work. We have the agricultural sector, people who want their fruit picked, who can't even get workers. No one wants to apply for the job because they're getting paid more on job seeker and job keeper. And when I hear about an accountant, a kid who goes to work three days a week for an accountant, he said, I'm not going to come into work. Why should I work? I get paid more on job keeper. So these are the circumstances that are happening. What I can't understand is why you have actually passing this bill today with the support of Labor to pass the bill to take it out to seven months. Admittedly, you are reining it in. So job seeker is now going to be from 1115 a week down to 815 a week, but you're going to give them $300 support that, that they can actually make. So go out and work for it. Then you've actually got job keeper that is actually going to be reduced as well to 1200 a fortnight. But that is not actually encouraging businesses or people to go to work. So my question is, what are you going to do? Why extend it out to March when it should have actually just been taken out to November to see if we were, are recovering? Because you're actually saying to people out there, don't bother going to work, don't bother finding a job because we're going to keep paying you till March next year. So you're actually putting so much pressure on businesses order. out there. Senator all Hanson, we have uh, Senator up. Hanson Young on her feet for a point of order. Senator Hanson Young. A point of order. I just find um, perhaps uh, Senator Hanson could reflect on her comments about people not showing up to work. We neither he, her nor her colleague have bothered to come to order. Canberra. Senator Hanson, that's not, that not a point of order. It's not a point of order. Senator Hanson, you have the call. Thank you very much. So what I'm saying is, you're not giving the businesses out there any guarantee that they're actually going to get people who actually want to go to work and turn up to work. What I'm asking the government is, why didn't you actually look at cutting this off? So you were going to cut it off in September. And I understand what is happening in Victoria and the problems down there because of poor leadership by Daniel Andrews, that you actually are going to extend this out for seven months. Uh, do you, give me any reason why this should not have been cut off by the end of November, seeing how the economy was travelling at that time, how businesses were, were recovering, to encourage people to go out there and start working instead of supported by the government. And I truly believe this is why the states are keeping the border shut, particularly here in Queensland, as a political motivation that people are getting paid, this job keeper and job seeker payments, that is, they are, they are reluctant to go back to work because it's destroyed tourism and industry here in Queensland, and there's no incentives for people to go back to work. So why didn't you actually cut it off in the end of November, reassess it then, we come back to Parliament in December, you could have actually then extended it then at that time? Minister. Minister. 
th thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you very much, Senator Hansen. Um, I mean, the truth is we're dealing with a very, very difficult set of circumstances. We're dealing with a global uh, pandemic with devastating health effects all around the world, including here uh, in Australia. We're dealing with a, a pandemic that is having a very severe impact on uh, our economy, on jobs, on people's livelihoods, on families. Uh, and uh, yes, we did have to make very quick decisions to provide the appropriate and necessary supports uh, into the economy and, and into supporting families. Uh, and we knew at the time that because of the requirement for speed at a scale, uh, that the uh, need for simplicity and, and, and speed would mean that there would be trade-offs in terms of some of the uh, equity issues that uh, you ha have referenced, uh, Senator Hansen. I mean, in this bill, we address that um, somewhat, you know, in particular the issue around uh, people who previously were earning less, getting $1,500 on the, on the job keeper. Well, we, we have, uh, of course, separated payments into two. Um, and uh, if you earn, uh, if you work less than 20 hours, you're in one on one payment. If you wor work more than 20 hours, you're on another payment. But I would also make the, the more general point. I mean, different parts of the economy are impacted in different ways. It's true to say that some parts of the economy and some businesses have recovered better than others. And the design of the ongoing JobKeeper arrangements for six months do take into account. Do take that into account. I mean, if you are a business that is fortunate enough to have recovered, and if you are a business in you know, Western Australia or uh, Queensland that uh, is fortunate enough to have recovered, then you will no longer be eligible for JobKeeper. JobKeeper will come to an end, as you are calling for, for that business at the end of uh, September. But for those businesses who are not in uh, such a fortunate position uh, and, uh, but are employing um, workers uh, you know, on the basis that they believe that they have a future beyond uh, this, uh, this next six months period and beyond uh, the uh, heaviest impact of the coronavirus uh, in an Australian economic context, well, then we do believe it is appropriate to provide uh, additional support to those businesses uh, on a somewhat scaled back basis as part of a transition, a sensible transition out of this crisis level support. But nevertheless, I mean, we, we don't believe that it would have been sensible to go, to go cold to Turkey uh, from one day to the next, uh, given the circumstances that Australia and Australian families continue to be in. And I'm grateful that uh, there is a consensus around this chamber, uh, overwhelmingly a consensus around this chamber, that that is indeed uh, appropriate uh, for a further six-month period. Are there any other questions on that amendment? Yes. Uh, yes. Senator Hanson. Thank you. Minister, I have grave concerns that we have not been told, the Australian people have not been told the truth about COVID deaths in Australia. Now, I have a letter here which is on government letterhead, and it's from um, Dr Brendan Murphy on the 8th of August. And it's this, he said, he states, I write to seek your assistance in reporting of COVID-19 um, related deaths in your respective facilities. This was to the aged care providers in Victoria. Uh, Senator Hanson, um, I believe we have Senator Gallagher on a point of order. The point of order, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, just um, asking for your direction on the relevance of this contribution to the bill that we are currently um, considering. It doesn't seem to be. I, I can't seem to draw a link between the two issues, and I wonder whether you could explore that with Senator Hanson. Bring it back. Of, thank you, Senator Gallagher. I would direct Senator Hanson to be relevant to the amendment as moved by Senator Patrick, which we are currently discussing. Well, when we're talking about COVID deaths, well, in relation to uh, Senator Patrick's, if it comes down the government paying out for job seeker and job keeper, this is all related to, brought about because of COVID deaths in this nation. That's why we're in the situation that we're in. So I think it's very relevant to actually speak about the, the truth mat of the COVID deaths. So I think it is very relevant and the people need to hear it. So I'll go back to the letter. So he's asked a right to seek your assistance in reporting of COVID-19 related deaths in your respective facilities. Specifically, I'm asking that any death of a resident who has tested positive for COVID-19 be reported immediately to the Victorian Public Health Unit and the Australian Government Department of Health via the Aged Care Process Government website. This request relates to all COVID-19 related deaths, including those involving other causes of comorbidity factors. So it's meaning that it doesn't necessarily mean to say that they've died of COVID-19 deaths, but they could have died 
of other related issues, but we're, we're putting this in the basket of COVID deaths, which is making a big um, the people are Senator very Senator Hanson, order. I, I think that there may be other times during the day where you can make the points that you are currently trying to make. Um, I will uh, right, well, turn, you, turn your mind to the amendment as moved by Senator Patrick. Right. Well, Senator Patrick, then I want to know, if these people that have actually paid huge dividends or bonuses to themselves in relation to um, the, the um, uh, business increase and turnover, and that these businesses have received the job keeper over the period of time, will you be asking these businesses to pay back the job keeper payment to the Australian taxpayer? Minister. Uh, th th thank you very much. It's very hard for me to make uh, like a, a judgment uh, mm. you know, without knowing the individual circumstances of specific businesses. I mean, what I would say is that the eligibility requirements for JobKeeper are very clear. Uh, they are applied consistently uh, to all businesses. I mean, they involve a turnover test. If the turnover test uh, uh, is appropriately uh, complied with, uh, then uh, you know, obviously relevant businesses are able to access JobKeeper payments to help support uh, the wages of their employees, of their eligible employees. Uh, and that is, that is the beginning and the end of it. Um, you know, other, as long as the business has acted lawfully, there is no ground and no reason uh, for the government to seek uh, reimbursement of uh, funds that have been dispersed under this program. Thank you, Minister. Minister. Then uh, Senator Hanson, are you seeking the call? Yes, I am. Okay. Minister, how often do these businesses have to report to the government to keep on a JobKeeper um, program? Minister. Well, I mean, any business that is profitable and that uh, has recovered and is re has, has the uh, turnover test reapplied at the end of September, as we've indicated, will no longer be eligible and will no longer receive the JobKeeper payment moving forward. Senator I see the call. Thank you. That wasn't my question. I said you've extended this payments out till March next year. If you're going to keep paying this business, is how often are you going to be asking them to um, send in reports of where their profits are or their turnover is at? I mean, say so you can't just extend it and then allow it to go for seven months. These businesses, a lot of them actually make a lot of money out of, their, out of the government and they're getting paid the job kit payments. How often do they have to report to the government to see they still comply with the rules and regulations? Because if you pay them JobKeeper, they've been making profits over these months. You, you've said you won't be asking them for their taxpayers' dollars back. How often do they have to report? Is it, is it weekly? Is it monthly? Is it three monthly? Or are you going to let them go for the full six months? Minister. As I've indicated in my remarks in response to uh, Senator Patrick moving the amendment, uh, the initial six-month period, we said that once qualified, uh, a business would be eligible for the full six months. Uh, the uh, turnover test will now be reapplied at the end of September and again at the end of uh, December. Do I have any other senators seeking to ask questions on the amendment? No. Uh, that being the case, the question is that the amendment moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. All those in favour of the amendment say aye and against say no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. No division. Senator Lambie, did you want to have your uh, dissent recorded? And Senator Patrick, did you also wish to have your dissent recorded? Uh, oh, I'm, I'm right. supporting the bill. Uh, so supporting the amendment. I think that's the attention. Yes, of Senator that is Lambie. exactly the term I meant. So Senator Lambie and Senator Patrick will both have their support. And Senator Hanson. Apologies, Senator Hanson. Hello. Um, will have their um, approval of the amendment recorded. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye and against say no. I believe the ayes have it. The question is now that the bill be reported. All those in favour say aye, aye. and against say no. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Coronavirus Economic Response Package JobKeeper Payments Amendment Bill 2020 and agreed to it with amendments.
I call the minister. Uh, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye and against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the minister. Uh, I move that the bill be now read a third time. The uh, question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the coronavirus economic response and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number two. Payment times reporting bill 2020 and a related bill. Resumption of second reading debate. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm doing this on behalf of Senator Farrell. Um, Labor welcomes the debate on these bills as we've long advocated for better payment practices to small business suppliers. From the, outset, from the onset, I emphasise that Labor supports the intent of the bill as a first step in improving payment practices of large businesses to their smaller suppliers of goods and services. As my colleagues and I are all too aware, cash flow and prompt payment times are critical for small businesses. Unlike large businesses, which have a variety of ways to increase working capital, small businesses rely far more on payments and bank finance, the latter of which often involves high interest rates. And yet, increasingly so in Australia, we see large businesses using small businesses as their piggy banks and to boost their own working capital position. Labor has been particularly concerned by the unconscionably long contracted payment times often coupled with the practice of supply chain financing or reverse factoring. And in situations where long payment times are coupled with reverse factoring, if the small business supplier wants to be paid on time, they essentially pay a fee, often to a third party financier. Labor has been saying for years this is unacceptable. As my colleague in the other place, the member for Fenner, noted in 2016, the reason these large companies are squeezing suppliers is simple. It improves their cash flow and makes them money. That was 2016. At the time, data from Dun & Bradstreet showed that, on average, large companies in Australia are almost 20 per cent slower in paying their bills than small companies. However, during the COVID-19 crisis, we've heard some shocking examples of large companies unilaterally telling small suppliers that their payment terms are being blown out to 180 days or more from the day of invoicing. In fact, just this fortnight we've seen more examples. One of the most egregious is by Premier Retail and Just Group, run by a supporter of the Treasurer, Solomon Liu, who had written to their small business suppliers saying due to COVID-19 they were unilaterally extending payment term terms to 180 days, or six months. What makes this particularly galling is that Mr Liu and Just Group also told landlords they weren't paying rent, access JobKeeper and reported record profits for the financial year. And now we've learned that this company told small businesses they wouldn't pay them for six months. But Just Group aren't the only ones. The small business and family enterprise ombudsman, Kate Carnell, has been inundated with examples from small business suffering because big business refused to pay them on time. And that's not to mention the ones who abuse reverse factoring, where payment times are blown out well beyond 30 days and a third party financier steps in to pay the bill on time but at a discount. In other words, small business needs to pay a fee to be paid on time. It's outrageous and nothing in this bill will stop it. Only Labor has a plan to reduce payment times and stop these practices, which I will discuss in more detail during Committee of the Whole. In contrast, while we welcome this as a first step, this bill has clear and obvious loopholes. Labor found it troubling that this transparency initiative originally provided no means to differ differentiate a firm that pays in 61 days from a firm that pays in 180 days or more. We understand the government will move an amendment to fix this glaring error, which we will support. This bill introduced a new payment times reporting scheme, which requires approximately 3,000 large businesses and government enterprises with annual turnover of $100 million and above to, report, to publicly report biannually on their payment terms and practices for their small business suppliers. The government argues that by providing access to information on large business payment performance, small business will be able to make a more informed decision about their potential customers. 
The government also contends that greater transparency on payment practices and performance will also create pressure for cultural change to improve payment times. Payment time reports will include aggregated data on the reporting entity's payment terms and practices, identifies the entity and other relevant information. Reporting entity reports will be published by the regulator on a central public register known as the Payment Times Reports Register, and a regulator will be created to oversee the scheme. Entities that fail to maintain payment records or provide false and misleading information in a report may contravene a civil penalty provision. And it is at this juncture that we should start to put forward reasons why we are sceptical about the government's soft-touch approach to payment times for small business. Internal documents reported on in The Australian reveal that the government's planned procurement-linked policy has not been implemented to date. Implementation is likely to take place in late 2021. Furthermore, should the procurement link payment time policy be enacted after this bill, it only provides an incentive to pay small businesses within 20 days for large businesses looking for federal government contracts. Many of the businesses with payment times of 60 days or more are not ones that provide services to government, and therefore the government's three measures are unlikely to have an effect on their behaviour. The bill does not mandate maximum payment times to small businesses nor does it provide for penalties or remedies on invoices that are paid late or with payment times greater than 30 days. Small business stakeholders, including COSBOA and the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, have welcomed the reporting framework as a step in the right direction, as we do. But the reason it remains a first step is because, as many stakeholders note, the government's argument for the reporting scheme involve a belief that small businesses can shop around for large business customers. Such a belief is not reflective of the power imbalance large businesses have over their small suppliers. Small business stakeholders unanimously welcomed transparency, but noted that the framework is unlikely to significantly change the behaviour of most firms. Importantly, it is likely this regime will not dampen the abuse of supply chain financing. Supply chain financing has attracted scrutiny from the opposition, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, small business stakeholders, including the Small Business Ombudsman, who issued a critical report on the practice, and of course the media. It isn't just Labor raising concerns about supply chain financing, finance solutions. Stakeholders across the board are particularly concerned about the increasing prevalence of reverse factoring. Given these concerns, the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman Kate Carnell has launched a review of supply chain finance. In addition, we know that the Australian Accounting Standards Board is already looking into the tiger trap of reverse factoring and would be discussing further with international accounting standard boards and other regulators. Labor is part of an international chorus of voices concerned about certain supply chain finance arrangements, including ratings agencies and international audit firms. It is also telling as to who isn't raising their voice. The Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison, the Small Business Minister, uh, Michaelia Cash, like to talk a big game on small business but are conspicuously silent on this issue. We've heard barely a peep about the practice from the government. The Banking Royal Commission was a lesson on how our economy has become over-financialised. We've seen the problems that arise when middleman financiers insert themselves into the arrangement of small business, but it appears the government hasn't learned anything from this. In November 2019, The Guardian reported that the Prime Minister had a one-hour meeting with a leading proponent of reverse factoring, Lex Greensill, who had pitched the use of reverse factoring into the payment system for public servants. While local and international regulators swim one way, the government swims another. The Australian Security Investment Commission confirmed in correspondence to the opposition that it was investigating the use of such arrangements by an unnamed large firm for possible non-compliance with auditing and financial reporting requirements. As senators in the chamber knows, the Senate Economics Legislation Committee conducted an inquiry into the bill. During the course of the inquiry, coalition senators ran defence for the big business arguments against incentives to pay in 30 days. Their only additional recommendation was to review the bill in two years' time. In stark but unsurprising contrast, it was Labor senators who outlined the flaws in the bill and the areas that need fixing. 
We will elaborate on these concerns and how Labor's payment time failsafe mechanism can fix this issue during the committee stage. In the meantime, as mentioned, Labor welcomes this debate on such an important issue. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Uh, I believe we have Senator Wish Wilson remotely. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, the Greens have long uh, led policy and new legislation to help small business in Australia. We care about small business and recognise their importance and how hard they work. Uh, indeed, my wife and I have both successfully run small businesses for a number of years, uh, and my, my better half still does. Uh, we're small business people. Ultimately, much of our good work here in the Senate, and I will recognise the collaborative approach and cooperative approach for politics over many years in regards to small business, uh, in this chamber, from well, both sides of the chamber, has been focused on tackling the power imbalance and indeed the abuses of market power between big business and small business. In a nutshell, that's what we're attempting to do today with this legislation. And I concur with Labor uh, in their uh, speech that they've just given, uh, Senator Gallagher, that this is a step in the right direction in terms of this reporting framework. Uh, in the 2013 election, the Greens were the first to campaign for a tax cut for small business, uh, which I note was legislated in the Senate uh, shortly after in 2014. We also campaigned on increasing the instant asset write-off threshold from $6,500 to $10,000 in 2013 and proposed new uh, loss carryback provisions. These initiatives provided small business with new incentives to invest, uh, both in their businesses and in their employees. The instant asset threshold was successfully increased, legislated again after the 2013 election, although I note that initially uh, the new Abbott government tried to wind back the instant asset thresholds from $6,500 to $1,500. And I'd like to thank uh, Deputy President that Greens' leadership on this issue, a clear signal to the Liberal Party and to small business that they had a true ally in the Senate uh, to help get these changes through Parliament. Uh, I also introduced a bill uh, to the Senate uh, in 2014 called the Small Business Commissioner Bill 2013 to have a properly resourced advocate for small business with significant powers. Now, three years later, this resulted in the creation and appointment of an Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman. Now, speaking about power imbalances and small business getting bent over a barrel, two of the Greens' most proud achievements in helping small business was in leading the long campaign to have a banks or financial misconduct Royal Commission to hold the big end of town, the big banks and the big insurers to account. And I'll note uh, on this point that I look forward to that significant legislation in this chamber in a few months' time. And I certainly hope there's no more delays to this critical reform because of COVID. But many of the recommendations by Commissioner Hain will help tip the balance in favour of small business, especially in areas of access to finance, insurance claims, fees for no service and financial redress. This is importantly, we pushed for years, since 2012, to get an effects test to reform competition policy in this country. And in a rare political opportunity, our friends from the National Party joined the Greens to get the long overdue but significant reform to Section 46 of the Competition and Consumer Act 2010. I understand that was legislated uh, in 2016. Um, that's a very interesting story in itself. Uh, for those who who didn't follow uh, competition policy reform, uh, we managed to get the effects test through because the party supported a Greens motion and crossed the floor and voted against their Liberal colleagues on the day uh, that Malcolm Turnbull uh, top, toppled, uh, toppled leadership in this country. And it opened up a significant reform uh, that uh, we feel will make a big difference. Um, we could throw in the establishment of a financial ombudsman as well, another initiated legis uh, legislation, thanks to pressure from opposition in this place. 
and I will say also, uh, ultimately, thanks to cooperative politics. Uh, and coming back to the legislation before us today, it was a successful Greens amendment to the Treasury Legislation Amendment, Small Business and Unfair Contracts Terms Bill 2015, that ensured most small business would be protected from unfair terms in standard contracts. Now, we work very closely with a number of small business stakeholders over many years to uh, successfully get that uh, legislation through the Senate. And that, by the way, included, included franchise agreements. This amendment increased the coverage of legislation from 80 per cent of small businesses to 95 per cent of small businesses under that unfair contract legislation. Um, but I don't want to leave this chamber with the impression that the Greens have had only wins in regard to small business. Uh, we haven't seen every Greens policy legislated yet. We still continue to push for the small business entity threshold to increase from $2 million to $10 million per annum, as we've seen in many overseas countries. And an increase in the threshold for GST registration from $75,000 to $150,000 and $150,000 to $300,000 for not-for-profit uh, entities. That, of course, would significantly reduce the, uh, the burden on many small businesses and the, uh, the constant requirement for paperwork, which I know is a huge, huge burden for any operator and owner of a small business. So, uh, Deputy President, we support any measures that help correct the power imbalance between small business and big business, any measures that level the playing field. Uh, we'll be supporting today's legislation because this is a step uh, in the right direction. Um, we hope that we see uh, improvements on this legislation. A register provides transparency, uh, but without um, further developments, especially in relation to uh, coercive powers uh, and uh, penalties, uh, we'll, we remain sceptical that this will tip that power in balance. Uh, we'd also like to see um, more detail around Labor's amendments and Senator Lambie if she's still going ahead with her amendments. But I will uh, wait till we get to the committee of a whole before the Greens will talk on those issues. So we'll be supporting this legislation today as a step in the right direction, but we look forward to uh, assisting Australian small business, as the Greens have done proactively and constructively in the nearly a decade. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Trying to find a speaker's list, which is Senator Stoker. I appreciate we're only a minute, 45 seconds before question time, so I won't necessarily call a speaker. Oh, Senator Stoker, I didn't see you there. My apologies. Thank you, Mr. President. Mark is a tradesman on the Gold Coast. And yes, Mark is his real name. His business works for builders in residential construction, and he's a contractor. In his career of 40 years, he has hired tradesmen, he's hired apprentices and subbies. He's really proud of what he does. In his career, he has seen this industry go up and down. He recalls with frustration the late 80s and early 90s during the recession we had to have, where he had in quick succession. Order, Senator Stoker, you'll be in continuation. Thank you for your understanding. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Every three months, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission reports on their compliance checks of the aged care sector. Can the minister confirm that for July to September 2019, standards were not met in 37.3 per cent of site visits and 100 per cent of review audits? When did the minister become aware of these alarming results and what immediate action did he take in response to these warnings? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. President, uh, Senator Gallagher is correct. The Quality and Safety Commissioner uh, does report on a quarterly basis, and uh, as is required. Uh, and the Quality and Safety Commissioner provides a reporting process to government as well, Mr. President. And the expectation of government is that all aged care providers respond to the uh, and and comply with the regulatory framework 
that is in place across the country, Mr. President. And so, uh, my conversation with the Quality and Safety Commissioner is to ensure that the regulatory actions that are being taken by the Quality and Safety Commissioner, as an independent agency of government, uh, ensures that uh, they work with the providers to ensure that they are brought to compliance with uh, with their requirement with the requirements of the quality uh, quality code mr president so that's that's the requirement the the quality and safety commissioner as an independent agency has the responsibility to ensure uh, that they take appropriate regulatory action uh, and compliance action with respect to what they find uh, as a result of their inspections and their reporting processes. So my expectation, Mr. President, is that all providers comply with the quality standards. And again, my expectation of the Quality Commission is that they ensure that providers do come back to conformance once they uh, have met. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister confirm that for the October to December 2019 reporting period, Standards were not met in 45 per cent of site audits and 100 per cent of review audits. 100%. When did the minister become aware of these alarming results and what immediate action did he take in response to this warning? Minister, uh, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, as, as I've just said in my answer to the primary question, uh, as an independent regulator, it is the responsibility of the Quality Commissioner to, mean, to take regulatory action and Order. to work with providers to ensure that they bring their compliance back to standards. That's the responsibility Order. of the uh, Commissioner. Mr. President, uh, the Labor Party voted with the government late last year to complete the formation of the Order. Quality Commission to bring it under one control Order on my left. To, to ensure that we have, as has been recommended by a number of reform processes, Mr. President, that uh, that we bring it to, on into one organisation that has regulatory responsibility across the aged care sector, Mr. President. So, and I expect both providers to meet the standard and the Quality Commissioner to do its role, which is to ensure that they do. Order. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. For January to March 2020, the latest reporting period, standards were not met in 41 per cent of site audits and 87.5 per cent of review audits. Given these appalling and shameful audit results came before the series of warnings he ignored, including Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmarch House, how can Australians possibly have confidence he will ever protect Australians in aged care. Senator Colbeck. Mr. Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. Order, Order. Mr. Senator Watt. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President, and thanks, Senator. Order on my left. Mr. President, all of us have our respo various responsibilities within uh, the government. Senator Watt. And and with, with, within the re regulatory process, Mr. President, my expectation as minister is that Senator all Watt. providers comply with the quality standards, Mr. President. That is the expectation of the government, and, and Mr. President, I expect that it's an expectation of all of those who use residential aged care in this country, Mr. President. We all expect that there's high quality care provided by residential aged care providers, and. And that's why we have the regulatory frameworks in place uh, to undertake that. And that's why the Quality Commissioner has the responsibility Order. for the oversight of those Order regulatory frameworks and, and the compliance with those frameworks and to ensure that, co that providers come into conformance with those standards. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's skill reform agenda has strengthened our vocational education system for the road to economic recovery? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McLaughlin for the question. Mr. President, as Australia and Australians recover from the devastation of COVID-19, supporting a skilled workforce has never been more important. In addition to the support of the JobKeeper payment, which, as we know, is seeing around 3.5 million Australians maintain that 
so important connection with their employer. The Morrison government will invest a record $6.5 billion in schools to keep apprentices and trainees on the job, but also to ensure that Australians have the skills they need to move into employment. Our $6.5 billion investment includes $2.8 billion in terms of our support for apprentices and, tra and trainees and keeping them on the job, and of course the $1 billion job trainer fund uh, to help Australians upskill and reskill in areas of demand. Uh, South Australians will be pleased to know that yesterday, Mr President, I announced with the South Australian Premier Stephen Marshall and the South Australian Skills Minister David Pisoni the launch of the South Australian Job Trainer Fund. That is a skills funding boost of around $69 million in South Australia. And I congratulate the South Australian government on working with the Commonwealth to ensure that we have this important injection of additional funds into the South Australian economy. Mr President, that around $69 million will now support thousands of South Australians to transition into further training or employment in areas of demand in South Australia. And of course, the $1 billion job trainer investment by the government, matched by with the states and territories, builds on the substantial skills reform agenda that we have been implementing since 2018. We've established the National Skills Commission to, of course, improve labour market forecasting and skills needs assessments, which will inform the work in terms of the job trainer fund. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Minister, in addition to this record invest investment in training, what steps has the government taken to repair the reputation of our vocational education system since coming to government, and why is this essential to support a skilled workforce to drive our economic recovery? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, uh, the former Labor government, as we know, were the architects of the greatest damage ever, ever on the vocational education and training sector in Australia. They implemented in their wisdom, in Labor policy wisdom, the failed vet fee help scheme. What did that do? It saw billions of dollars defrauded from vulnerable students who were simply trying to attain a qualification to better their employment prospects. Colleagues, to date, to date, the Australian taxpayer has now recredited in excess of $2 billion because of Labor's vet fee help failure. And in fact, Senator McLaughlin, in South Australia, around 8,500 stu students to date, because there will be more, have had their funds recredited. Senator Watt, in uh, Queensland, 38,000 Queenslanders, 38,000 students in Queensland have had to be recredited because of Labor's failed vet fee Order, policy. Senator Cash. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. How is the government building on this achievement to ensure quality remains at the centre of our skills and training system as we emerge from the economic impacts of COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And as Senator Wong is saying so eloquently across the chamber, you know, it's seven years in government, and you're still talking about what Labor did. Well, you see, Senator Wong, when you wreak devastation on Australia's vocational education and training sector, when you actually decimate its reputation, it does take years to rebuild. We have now recredited in excess of two billion dollars because of Labor's failed scheme. And uh, Senator Wong, eight and a half thousand students in South Australia, they had to have their monies recredited because of your failed scheme. But Mr President, what else, what else has the Morrison government done to ensure that we restore the integrity to Labor's failed system? Well, as you know, skills is a priority for this government, and as such, we've taken action to bolster the regulator, uh, the Australian Skills and Quality Authority, to ensure that quality training is now being delivered by private providers, uh, and that is what we are doing. Senator Keneally. President, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Citizens, Senator Colbeck. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday, the minister was not able to advise the Senate how many older Australians had died in aged care this year, not as a result of COVID-19, but as a result of neglect. When asked about the deaths by neglect, the minister shrugged and dismissed deaths as, quote, one of the functions of residential aged care. Can the minister today outline the Senate? Order, order, Senator Keneally. Order, order. Across the chamber, order. 
Senator, Senators, Senator Watt, Senators Payne and Wong, Senator Keneally, I will ask you to continue your question from the conclusion of the quotation you, you referenced. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister today advise the Senate how many older Australians have died as a result of, age, of neglect in aged care residential homes he is responsible for? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And I have to say again the dishonest misinterpretation. Order. Order. The dishonest misinterpretation or misuse of my words by Labor again and the mischaracterisation of what I was saying yesterday uh, continues in the chamber. And Mr President, uh, Se Senator, Senator Keneally is, is a master at this. In fact, uh, she, she attacked the former CEO, uh, CMO in a Senate in inquiry order. over Senator the use Wong, of language. I, I, I can anticipate it, but I'm going to let you make your point of order. Point of order direct relevance. The response is not directly relevant to the question, which is a serious question about how many people have died as a result of neglect in aged care homes for which this minister is responsible. Senator Cormann on the point of order. Uh, th thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, the, the minister could not be more directly relevant. Just because he's not following the uh, partisan political script that Labor would like him to follow doesn't make him irrelevant. Order. On the point of order. I, I, Senator Wong has a point on the minister turning to characterising other actions of the per senator who asked the question. That is not directly relevant. It is, however, directly relevant for the minister immediately prior to that was challenging the way a quotation was used to characterise a question. So turning to other conduct of the senator asking a question, however, is not directly relevant. So, um, but the minister is allowed to challenge the way the question was put. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, what I did yesterday was to state, merely state a fact, to state a fact, Mr. President, that about 60,000 Australians pass away in aged care every year. It is Order. a sad fact, Mr. President. Senator and I Watt. don't believe that you could characterise in any sense. Senator Watt. I don't think that you could characterise in any sense the question that Senator Keneally tries to. Uh, imply. Senator, Senator Watt. Mr. Mr. President, how do you classify what Senator Keneally is trying to pursue? Mr. President? There are 40 per cent of residents in aged care facilities in this country who pass away with no visitors. Mr. President. Uh, the, the Royal Commission report talked about neglect, yes. It talked about the system that we have all we that, that we that we have on my left. that governments over a period of time have uh, have not built to a standard that it should be. That's Mr. President. That is the that is the focus of this government. We want to see all senior Australians treated with respect in a healthy and safe way, and ensuring that all residential aged care providers are providing aged care in a way that we all expect. Uh, the Royal Commission's Order, report. Senator Colbeck. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The head of Monash University's Health, Law and Aging Research Unit, Professor Joseph Ibrahim, told the Royal Commission that, and I quote, hundreds of residents will die prematurely because people have failed to act. Isn't this why the Royal Commission has characterized the Morrison government's handling of aged care with a single word, neglect? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And, Mr. President, um, the government has contested the evidence provided to the Royal Commission by Professor Ibrahim, uh, and that was uh, quite strongly contested by the Chief Medical former Chief Medical Officer and now uh, Secretary of my department at the hearing of the Royal Commission uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, Mr. President. So we can we can test the evidence provided to the Royal Commission by Professor Ibrahim. Uh, and so, uh, Senator, so Senator Keneally might like to select one witness. That's fine. Uh, the Labor Party can select one witness that suits their particular argument. But, Mr President, the, the government has been working with the sector since January to assist 
them to be prepared for COVID-19, which was the subject that Professor Ibrahim was talking about. And we quite rightly took the opportunity to contest the evidence provided to the Royal Commission by Professor Ibrahim. Senator Keneal, a final supplementary question. The Morrison government refused to act when the Royal Commission said it would take an additional $621 million per year to improve the aged care system. When the minister is putting off, why is the minister putting off until tomorrow what he knows older Australians need today? How can Australians possibly have confidence he will protect Australians in aged care? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And the report that Senator Keneally uh, refers to was a submission made uh, to the Royal Commission recently, and it uh, does an assessment of the aged care sector based on a number of uh, combined criteria, not the criteria that uh, we are using uh, in the context of the assessment of uh, quality of care, Mr. President. And it makes it makes a number of estimates as to what the costs might be to uh, with with respect to the, the system as it currently stands. But what we're looking to do, Mr President, is to improve the aged care system. That is the whole point of the Royal Commission. That is the whole point of the Royal Commission. And so the so the report that uh, so, so the, 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 the point of that report Order, is to Senator assess Watt. the system as it stands now uh, and to give the, give the Royal Commission and the government some direction as to where we might go to, to the future, including on a range of issues including, uh, which incorporate potential additional costs under Order. a number of different frameworks. Senator Colbeck. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Cormann, representing the Prime Minister. Senator Cormann, isn't it true that without Commonwealth environmental protections, the Franklin River would have been dammed, the Great Barrier Reef would have been riddled with oil rigs, and whaling in Western Australia would have continued? Order on my right. Senator, you've concluded your question, Senator Hanson Young? Yes. Senator, Senator Cormann. Uh, th 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 thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Hanson Young for that question, and it's my great privilege to confirm for Senator Hanson Young that our government supports environmental protection. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, note that the minister didn't actually answer my question. Um, the environment minister has said that this government will introduce in national environment standards after the passage of this piece of legislation currently before the House. Why would we trust that this government would do anything? to act in the interests of the environment when we know all they're doing is acting in the interests of the fossil fuel industry. Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. I completely reject the premise of that question. Uh, what I would say is what I uh, have said often in this chamber over my 13 and a half years here, and that is on our side of the chamber, we support environmental protection in a way that is economically responsible. And we do want to see uh, Australia continue to go from strength to st strength creating opportunities for Australians today and into the future to get ahead. We want to have projects get up across Australia. and We want those projects to be rigorously assessed to ensure they comply with all of the relevant environmental laws at the state and federal level, but we want those processes to be conducted in a way that is efficient. That is efficient. And that is why we are prepared to entrust uh, these uh, sorts of um, arrangements to state governments. And, you know, in Western Australia, that is a state Labor government. Unless you are saying that the state Labor government in Western Australia is a bunch of environmental vandals, then I don't know what it is that you're accusing of, us of. I'm not accusing them of that. I think that the state government in WA has Order. got the same Senator objectives Senator Coleman, as us. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Interesting that the minister refers to WA because, uh, of course, we've seen what happens when there's not strong enough environmental protections. Rio Tinto blows things up. How many times has this government had representative meet with Rio Tinto or Santos in relation to the Narrabi gas project to get these laws passed to vandalise our environment? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I think the issue that Senator Hanson Young is referencing there relates to state legislation, actually not federal legislation. Uh, the second point I would make is uh, that uh, our government does not support uh, e environmental vandalism ever. Order. Uh, we, we support environmental protection in a way that is economically responsible. We want to see uh, opportunities created for Australians today into the future to get ahead uh, while we are also preserving and protecting the great value of our environment. 
but we don't want to lock, lock Australia up. We don't want to lock Australia up. We don't want to prevent further development uh, in a way that is environmentally responsible. And you know, the truth is, listening to the interjections, which I should be ignoring, I know, Mr. President, the truth is there's no level of uh, development that the Greens would ever accept. I mean, if it came down to the Greens, we would be all going back into the caves. We would be all going back into the caves. We wouldn't be driving any cars. Although, I mean, I'm sure that you got here by car. We wouldn't fly planes. Although you came here by plane. Order, I mean, Senator Cormann. Um, Senator Griff. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. In the past week, we have had two reports flagging problems with aerial firefighting arrangements. Yesterday, the Royal Commission into Natural Disasters published an interim report which found the Commonwealth's aerial firefighting procurement requires reassessment. And last week, the New South Wales Bushfire Inquiry report found a lack of aircraft hampered firefighting, including the vital work of extinguishing small fires before they spread out of control. That inquiry recommended a review of the current mix of aviation assets. Minister Littleproud is committed to acting quickly and says the government's financial commitment will be there. But, Minister, what will the government actually do? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, um, Senator Griff, for the question and uh, for some advance notice on the topic. Um, well, as you rightly point out, the Royal Commission um, interim report in relation to the National uh, natural disaster arrangements was brought down yesterday and made reference in that uh, report uh, to Australia's capacity to deal with natural disasters, but particularly in relation uh, to bushfires. Uh, but it also did make the point that, uh, that bushfires are not our only natural disaster of which we have to address. In, in relation to, um, to aerial firefighting, um, Minister Littleproud has made it very clear that the Australian government understands that we do need to, to I suppose, address uh, aerial firefighting capability on the basis of what is going to be um, the new normal when it comes to, to bushfires. In fact, I think the Royal Commission itself acknowledged the fact that the conditions leading up to last year's bushfires were absolutely unprecedented, but we should never expect them to be unprecedented again. Um, so, as part of that, the Australian government has, uh, has made a commitment in this year's budget uh, to 26, uh, over $26 million to the National Aerial Firefighting Centre. And this money will contribute towards the purchase of 100, uh, sorry, for the lease of 150 firefighting aircraft. Um, they um, will be made up of a, of a number of different types of aircraft, some of which will be dedicated to the, the smaller um, um, response to smaller fires that you refer to, whilst other things like the large fixed-wing aircraft are obviously an air tankers are, are much more dedicated towards um, delivering a service to fight fires on a much wider scale. Uh, but the government has uh, has absolutely acknowledged the, the need and the commitment towards supporting our amazing um, um, firefighters out on the ground to deal with what has uh, has proved to be over recent years um, continuing worsening of our bushfire season, and also acknowledge the, the extraordinary on the ground support that we receive from Senator the ADF. Rustin, Senator Grip, a supplementary question. Minister, both reports identified procurement arrangements, which includes leasing that you referenced as being inadequate, and both flagged the risk of converging fire seasons will make it far more difficult to ensure access to aircraft. Has the government studied the possibility of requiring or having an Australian dedicated firefighting aircraft fleet? And if not, uh, will you commit to urgently undertaking such a study? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. Um, and uh, as you um, point out, uh, the, the, the changing nature of, of our bushfire seasons are, are requiring us to take a new uh, look at how we address the assets that we need in order to combat them. And one of the things that the Royal Commission's interim report did highlight was that we did need to have a look at the ongoing capacity of the Australian uh, ongoing Australian capacity. Um, but as you would be aware, um, we have um, in the past um, used leased aircraft for, for a number of reasons. One um, clearly is that the cost of purchasing aircraft is, is, quite, is extremely high and the maintenance of specialist firefighting equipment that may only be used occasionally and we hope will only ever be used occasionally. Um, it, and, and actually comparing that with the capacity to be able to lease aircraft, but also the opportunity to be able to share resources with colleagues in the northern uh, um, counterparts in the northern hemisphere 
whose seasons are often countercyclical. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Minister, recommendation 50 of the bushfire inquiry was that the Commonwealth trial the feasibility of retrofitting RAAF C-130 aircraft with modular airborne firefighting systems. Now, the New South Wales government also supported this recommendation. Will the government support such a trial, and if not, why not? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the government obviously um, is very keen to investigate all options to make sure that we have a, a full capacity um, for our firefighters um, come fire season. But um, we have. Uh, it's been very clear that the ADF is not trained to be, uh, or equipped, or certified to undertake um, firefighting, whether it be um, on-ground firefighting or aerial bushfire fighting. Um, so, uh, civilian aircraft that are used for aerial firefighting are significantly modified for the purpose of firefighting, uh, and Defence's transport aircraft fleet is primarily configured uh, for airlift missions to support military activities, which are terribly important when it comes to uh, assisting our firefighting activities. Uh, however, um, whilst of course we're going to look at all the recommendations that exist in the interim report, as we will in the final report, um, clearly uh, the ADF's capability is much better suited for on-ground activity because of the extraordinary requirements Order. for modification. Senator Rustin, Senator McAllister. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. In its response to the final report on the Newmarch House COVID-19 outbreak, the Liberal New South Wales government determined, and I quote, neither the Commonwealth nor Anglicare Executive had an operational plan for how the residents should be managed. Why did the minister fail to have a COVID-19 plan for aged care? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and as we've discussed a number of times in this chamber, Mr. President, there are order. There are responsibilities uh, of varying parties with respect to who controls what particular matters, Mr. President. Uh, and as uh, is as I've said before in the chamber, the responsibility for the public health response to an age to a COVID-19 aged care outbreak. <laughs> Lies Order. with the state governments, Mr. President, and and that's and that that information, Mr. President, is actually confirmed in the agreement that we have published on the New South Wales uh, uh, Health Department website and ours that uh, the, the public health response lies with the with the uh, New South Wales government, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, uh, aged care providers are all provided required to have uh, order. Uh, an Senator, infection control management plan. Senator McAllister on a point of order. Senator McAllister. Uh, Mr President, my point of order goes to relevance. I asked about why there was a failure to plan. So far I've heard about a public health response, and I would ask you to uh, ask the minister to return to the question. Um, I'm listening carefully to the minister. Um, that was the end of the question. I appreciate the preamble was quite narrow. I I'm unwilling to say to go to the exact terminology a minister uses to rule on direct relevance, whether it be a response or a plan, but I will continue to listen carefully. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Under the National COVID-19 Health Plan, which was released early in March, uh, the, that, that plan, which contemplates a range of health responses, including for those in residential aged care, supported by Supported by Mr. President, the, uh, the CDNA guidelines, Order which provide advice to, age, to residential Order. aged care providers on how they will establish themselves to, uh, to manage a COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, all of these things are the, all of these things are uh, considered, Mr. President. So, so our plan, Order. backed up, Mr. President, Senator Watt. by the uh, the national the national COVID-19 health plan. Launched in, Order in, on in, my in, left. launched in, in uh, March of this year, supported by the CDNA guidelines, uh, and and contemplates, Mr. President, the co the, the cooperation between state and Commonwealth in the management and the public health management of a COVID-19 outbreak, and that's exactly what occurred at Newmarch. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In its response, the Liberal New South Wales government also found, and I quote. Anglicare had difficulty acquiring adequate supplies from the Commonwealth Government medical stockpile. Although the provision of PPP is the responsibility of the Commonwealth Government, New South Wales Health stepped in to provide this equipment. Isn't this yet another failure, 
another example of the Morrison government's neglect of aged care and its failure to take responsibility to fix it. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And as the National COVID-19 Health Response Plan contemplates, uh, the, the national government provided, uh, provides, uh, and, 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 and this government built a significant stockpile of PPE at a time of global shortage. Uh, we, we do support residential aged care, Mr. President, and we do that in cooperation with state governments, Mr. President. Uh, and in fact, m much of the PPE is channelled through state government services to providers around the country. So this is not an either-or situation, Mr. President. Both the Commonwealth and the states support residential aged care providers, uh, and that's what occurred in this particular circumstance, Mr. President. Uh, we, we, New South Wales provided support directly to Newmarch, and we backfilled their stockpile, stockpile Mr. President. So there is a cooperation, and there was a cooperation at, at Newmarch. And, uh, Mr. President, uh, my conversations on a regular basis. Order, with the Senator Colbeck. Order, order, Senator McAllister. A final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. If even the New South Wales Liberal government, led by Premier Berger Clinton, a state which the Prime Minister commended last week as being, and I quote, the gold standard, doesn't have confidence in the Morrison government's handling of aged care, why should anyone else? Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. It, it's, it, Labor never ceased to put words into other people's mouths, Mr. Mouth, Mr. President. Uh, they just make things up. Uh, assert that Order. somebody else might have implied them or said them. Uh, and then bring them into question time, Mr. President. Mr. President, all through New March, uh, the New South Wales Health Minister and I were in regular discussion to ensure that we were both asking the questions that needed to be asked to, to ensure the, provi the provider had resources in every sense that they required. In fact, Mr. President, uh, we worked extremely closely together to ensure that occurred. It was a very cooperative. A cooperative process. Well, that's a lie, Senator uh, Keneally. That is a lie because I spoke Order. to. Order, oh, yes. Senator. Just my interjection, so I ask your indulgence to correct the um, You should. Sen um, you don't get order. Order. Um, you don't get to correct the record. You don't get to correct the record via a point of order. Um, I'm going to carefully review what he said, only because I, I heard a word there that would normally be unparliamentary, but it depends if it was directed at someone personally. Okay, I'll take Senator. I'll ask Senator Colbeck. I'll ask you to withdraw that. If it, will, that, assist, that, if it will assist, I will withdraw, Mr. President. But I had, thank you. I, I had very regular conversations and discussions with uh, Minister Hazard to ensure that uh, services and were were provided. Oh. At, yep. uh, at Newmarch House, uh, it was it was very much a cooperative process, uh, all through that all through the COVID nineteen outbreak at uh, Newmarch House. Senator Hughes, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister advise the Senate as to the immediate financial services that are available for Australians who have suffered from the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes um, for her question. Um, clearly, many Australians have found um, themselves in very, very challenging circumstances as a result of the COVID pandemic. And many of those people may need now or into the future access to financial tools to assist them to make stable and safe financial decisions going forward. Um, to make sure that people get the advice that they need, um, we have made a, available an additional $20 million to scale up the capacity of our existing financial counselling services in Australia. Um, of that, we have provided $6 million to Financial Counselling Australia. And we did this most particularly because we wanted to make sure that they had the ability to be able to train more interns so that they could get them through their financial um, uh, counselling traineeship so they could get out on the ground and could start assisting Australians who need them. This has allowed us to be able to fast track the, the time frame in which we are able to get these uh, students accredited 
Uh, and so far, I'm pleased to say that 70 agencies have agreed to employ these students to make sure that they are able to get the hands-on experience they need to be able to get their qualifications. So, um, increasing the capacity of the workforce to the sector means that we, as, as, a, as a country, are in a position to be able to respond to what we expect to be uh, an increased demand. And I'd also like to take the opportunity to remind all Australians um, that the supports that have been put in place are there to assist Australians to make sure that, that when they go through the difficult times that clearly many Australians are going to have to go through um, over coming months, that the, the resources are there, the, fight, the um, confidential um, free advice is available to them. Um, and so I would recommend that anybody who finds themselves in difficult financial circumstances make yourself uh, a contact uh, a financial advisor and get the kind of advice you need to assist you in Order, your negotiations. Senator, Rustin. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how is the Morrison government building capacity in the financial counselling sector over the longer term to support vulnerable Australians? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr President. Um, well, well, clearly, part of our response to the COVID pandemic has been around making sure uh, that we provide the resources to the financial counselling sector into the future, not just to deal with the COVID pandemic, which we know um, is going to put many people into financial difficulty, uh, but also to make sure that, in an ongoing sense, that we have the kind of capacity and capability built into our financial counselling services so that they are able to assist Australians going on into the future. Uh, and certainly would like to, to recognise uh, the huge work that was undertaken through the Sylvan report, uh, where recommendations were made about providing greater capacity in the longer term. Um, and it was, uh, it was probably very timely that this capacity was being built uh, and we were providing additional funding to, to the financial and counselling sector to build that capacity, because when the COVID pandemic um, has, had hit, we realised that the need for those services was going to be very strong. So we will continue as a government to invest in financial counselling services Order. to assist Australians, Rustin, no matter what the Senator circumstance. Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how no-interest loans are assisting Australians through the pandemic? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, part of the suite of measures that are available to us um, through the financial counselling um, mechanisms that occur in Australia um, are through no-interest loans. Um, and as part of our COVID uh, response package, we have increased the amount of money that's available to Good Shepherd Microfinance, who have been delivering loans, uh, no-interest loans, to Australians for many, many years. Um, but the most important reason uh, that we wanted to make sure that we provided this money was to enable them to be able to leverage that money up with other providers. And can I acknowledge uh, the National Bank of Australia, um, who have uh, made available $40 million worth of loan capital on the back of the support that the Australian government has been put into to these microfinance loans to make sure that loans of up to $3,000 are made available to people to pay for such things as essential household products that they may need, the payment of bills, and it also gives them the capacity to access high, um, so to, to an alternative to high-risk, high-interest products and Order. in a safe Senator and stable Rustin. way. Uh, we're now going to the screens. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Does the Minister agree with Council assisting the Aged Care Royal Commission, Mr Peter Rosen QC, that the stories of large-scale death in aged care homes in the Northern Hemisphere in February and March meant the Australian aged care sector and the government agencies that fund and regulate it were on notice about the particular vulnerability of the elderly residents in our own in our own care homes. The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australia, yes. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, the government uh, and the uh, health officers, the CMOs, the CHOs from around around the country were all very well aware that uh, senior Australians were extremely vulnerable to this terrible virus, COVID-19. We all very much knew that uh, uh, it was going; it could have a devastating impact. Uh, we all knew that, Mr President, and that's why, in, in our plan to deal with COVID-19 in this country, including in aged care, uh, the, 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 the national COVID-19 health care plan, uh, aged care was uh, a, a significant component, Mr President, and that's why the, uh, the AHPPC uh, put that document together, 
to support the government's response to COVID-19 across the country, including in aged care, supported, Mr. President, by the guidelines that were provided by the CDNA to, uh, uh, to the aged care sector, all part of our plan, Mr. Order. President, to deal with COVID-19 across the country. So, Mr. President, from the beginning uh, of the year, from January, we started working closely with the aged care pro sector, providing them with advice on how they would improve their infection control plans, how they should upgrade their procedures with respect to the utilisation of PPE, how they should upgrade their, the plans within their uh, facilities so that they could be prepared in the circumstance of an outbreak. And, Mr. President, and the Aged Care uh, and, and the Quality and Safety Commission also started working with providers to test their pre preparedness. Mr. President. So, yes, uh, we were well aware Mr. President, of the vulnerabilities of the aged care sector and those uh, who reside within it, very well aware. and That's why our plan, right from the outset, contemplated a number of actions based on the, the AHPP, HPPC advice through the COVID-19 health management plan that was issued in the beginning of, at, in, during February. Order. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Given the warnings of Dorothy Henderson Lodge in March and New March House in April, why did the minister still wait until June to advise, advise aged care providers that 80 to 100 per cent of their workforce may need to isolate in a major outbreak? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. In fact, the advice, the, the advice on what a, an aged care provider might expect to have to replace uh, with, of its own staff was contained in the, the early advice from the CDNA, Mr. President, back in March this year, which was published in March this year, Mr. President. So, so, Order. so, so, so that that contemplated, Order. Mr. President, that contemplated that an aged care provider might that that contemplated, Order Mr. On President, my left. that Senator a provider Keneally, might Senator be Watt, required Senator to. Wong. That, that contemplated, Mr. President, that a provider might be required to replace 30 to 40 per cent of its, of its uh, workforce that they might be required to isolate, Mr. President. But what we saw as the, pandemic, as the pandemic proceeded, Mr. President, was the circumstances at Newmarch where that number grew significantly, Mr. President. And in fact, even, even the report into Newmarch uh, said uh, that we received said that that level of staff Order, isolation Senator was Colbert. not contemplated. Time for the answer has be. expired. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. This minister was warned of the need to bolster the aged care workforce in the 2018 Aged Care Workforce Strategy, the October 2019 Aged Care Royal Commission Interim Report entitled Neglect, the Early Aged Care Outbreaks. Again and again, the minister ignored the warnings and failed to act. How can Australians in aged care and their families possibly have confidence in this minister? Order. Senator Colbert. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I say I completely reject the premise of the question, Mr. President? We acted very quickly to bolster the aged care workforce through our surge capacity, which we announced on the 11th of March this year, Mr. President. So we 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 acted very quickly. Before DHL was at Dorothy Henderson Lodge was over, we, we acted extremely quickly because we saw what had happened. We'd received the advice of uh, the AHPPC, and so we put in place our over $100 million in, in capacity for work, work, surge workforce uh, early in March, Mr. President. So I completely reject the premise of the question. We acted quickly, Mr. President, to make sure the resources were available to residential aged care in this country, that, so that. Any facility that was impacted had the capacity to, uh, could be, to, to be supported by the government in the form that it needed to continue to provide quality care. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. How many residents of aged care facilities, funded and regulated by the Morrison government, have passed away from COVID-19? How many active cases of COVID-19 are there currently in Australia's aged care system? Minister of Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. So, as of uh, 8 o'clock this morning, there were 462 Australians who had passed away uh, across Australia from COVID-19, Mr President, and there were 
876. Order. Um, order. Order. Well, order. Sorry, can you please resume your seat. Um, there were, it is unhelpful for interjections at all times, particularly when they are of that nature and they descend across the chamber. While I'm talking, I ask senators to remain quiet. Senator Colbeck to continue. Oh, sorry, Senator Gallagher. Point of order. Um, Senator Rennick um, used a um, called. Sorry, Senator McGrath called um, Senator O'Neill a term that I would imagine is extremely unparliamentary and should be asked to withdraw. Um, I, I, there were so many interjections I didn't hear. I'm going to offer the opportunity for anyone to withdraw if it would assist the chamber. I withdraw. Thank you. I didn't hear the word, but thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as, as at uh, the same time, there are uh, 876 residents who are currently um, positive within uh, residential aged care in Australia, uh, and uh, 252 staff members, Mr. President. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Last Thursday, the minister told the Senate he first realised he hadn't got it right, and I quote him. When the circumstances at St Basil's occurred in the way that they did, it was clearly obvious to me that we didn't get it right. Given that there have been now more than 400 deaths in aged care from COVID-19 since this minister first realised he hadn't got it right, how many more deaths will occur on this minister's watch before he finally gets it right? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, Senator Wong attempts to make a very, very unfortunate correlation uh, between the circumstances that occurred at uh, St Basil's, Order. Mr. President, uh, Ms. where Mr. Order President on my left. make a very, very unfortunate and I, and I think dishonest correlation between the circumstances at St Basil's, where the government has acknowledged that, with 24 hours' notice, we didn't have in place the staffing requirements to replace the entire staff of that facility. Uh, and, and there were some things that occurred there uh, that we would, would have wished had not occurred, Mr President. Mr President, the Labor Party seemed to, to exist in this little Order local on bubble where they don't understand that there is a global pandemic of COVID-19 occurring. Order there is significant community left. transmission in Order. Victoria, Mr. President, there is significant community transmission Senator Colbert, of COVID-19. The time for in the Victoria. answer has expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the censure of the Minister of, of the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, as circulated in the chamber. Leave is not granted, Senator Wong. I seek, I presume to concede contingent notice standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion of censure of the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Mr President. Mr President, this is a motion which goes to the failure of this minister to take responsibility for the devastating crisis in the aged care sector, which has caused death, grief and untold trauma for vulnerable Australians in, their, in Australia, vulnerable Australians and their families. And we move this motion, Mr President, because ministers are accountable to the parliament. Ministers are accountable to the parliament. And despite the protection racket being run by Mr Morrison, Senator Colbeck is accountable to this Senate. And Senator Colbeck has been found wanting. How much grief and loss must be suffered by Australians as a result of the incompetence of this minister? When the incompetence of a minister is gut measured in the sum of lives lost, when the most vulnerable of our older Australians are the victims of this neglect, when does this chamber say someone must be held accountable? When the consequences for Australian families is the death of a loved one, the consequence for the minister responsible cannot simply be a shrug. And I'll take that interjection. You know what is shameless? His failure to take responsibility and your involvement in the protection racket. That is what is shameless. That is what is shameful, because a minister 
cannot simply absolve himself of, of responsibility by shrugging and blaming somebody else. It, he cannot resolve him, absolve himself of responsibility for deaths by neglect simply saying that that is a function of aged care, because the deaths by neglect are a function of the neglect of aged care by this government. $1.7 billion ripped from aged care by Mr Morrison when he was Treasurer. A situation so dire, Mr Morrison was forced to call a royal commission into their own mismanagement of aged care. A royal commission that summarised this government's care of older Australians in the title of its interim report, Neglect. Warnings from overseas, where aged care was ravaged well before COVID-19 took hold here. Warnings from experts and unions representing carers. Carers given one glove, one glove, and having to choose which hand to put it on. Warnings from tragedies already experienced in Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmarch House in New South Wales, and warnings that have still not been acted upon. Had still have not been acted upon by a government that even now has not produced a COVID-19 plan for aged care. Despite more than 460 aged care residents on today's figures having died, having died, the Royal Commission has said that if this government had acted upon previous reviews of aged care, the suffering of many Australians could have been avoided. And yet, even now, this minister ignores the Royal Commission. Yesterday, this government made more announcements. Senator Colbeck, like Mr Morrison, he loves to list his announcements. But you know what? Announcements don't save lives. It's delivery that matters. It's follow-up that matters. And until Senator Colbeck delivers on the recommendations of the Royal Commission, the one word which will always come to mind at the sound of this minister's name is neglect. Neglect. The Royal Commission has warned Senator Colbeck it will take an additional $620 million per year to improve the aged care system. And once again, this minister ignores yet another warning. He says, we'll wait and see what the report says, what the final report says. Well, when lives are on the line, when the neglect is the Mor in the Morrison government's aged care system is clear, why is this minister putting off until later what he knows older Australians need today? But ultimately, this neglect is not just on Senator Colbeck. It's also on Mr Morrison. And we will soon see if it is on every senator opposite. Will they be part of the protection racket Mr Morrison is running for Senator Colbeck? Will they be part of that? Because if they are, the neglect of our most vulnerable older Australians, it is in this minister's name. It is in Senator Colbeck's name. But you know what? It is not just in Senator Colbeck's name. It is in the name of each and every senator who shields him from accountability. Who shields him from accountability. There is no one on that side who has confidence in this minister anymore. The Senate should do the right thing and censure Order. this minister. Order. 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 I call Senator Cormann. Senator Watt and Rennick. Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Senator Richard Colbeck has worked flat out, absolutely flat out, to, the, to do the best he can to ensure Order. that those residents uh, in aged care facilities across Australia are safe. Listening to the Labor Party, you, you, you'd think that somehow there is no pandemic happening anywhere. Listening to the Labor Party, you think that all of this is happening in isolation of any context whatsoever. Senators, at Mr. President, through you, Mr. President, of course, every passing of a loved one is tragic. And the minister, like all of us, and like every senator in this chamber, of course, uh, are deeply empathetic for the grief felt by families who lose a loved one, in particular in circumstances where they, sadly, because of the restrictions that have had to be imposed to keep everybody else in the community safe, pass away on their own. Of course that is, of course that is tragic. But, Mr. President, the reason we have a particular aged care problem in Victoria is because we have a COVID problem in Victoria. 
It's because Order. we have a COVID problem in Victoria. Order. If you look at the Order. If you Senator Cormann, please resume. Senator Cormann. That, that is Senator a fact. Cormann. That Senator is a Cormann. Fact. I'll ask you to resume your seat for a moment, Senator Cormann. Not your fault. I cannot hear a word. Your quite loud voice is capable of um, dominating the chamber. I need to be able to hear the minister. I ask for compliance with the standing orders, and if not complete compliance, then at least at a level of the volume that I can hear the minister. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It might be an inconvenient truth, and it might interfere with your base political strategy in this chamber, but it is a fact nevertheless. It is a fact, nevertheless. And here is Senator Wong using, using the sad passing of Australians as a political weapon. As a Order. political weapon. You should be ashamed of Order. yourself, Senator, Senator Wong. You should be Order. ashamed of yourself. Across the chamber. As tragic, as tragic as the passing of any Australian in these circumstances Order. is in Australia by any measure, in Australia by any measure, despite what's going on in Victoria, we are in a comparatively better position. And you know what? You know what? You know what? I, 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 would, I, I, would, I would challenge you. I would challenge you to look at what's happening in the United Kingdom, what's happening in the United States, what is happening in a whole range of, in a whole range of comparable jurisdictions and compare the performance of our aged care system with the performance of the aged care system in other parts of the world. Now, and, and here again, we get the political attack. How much is a right? Now, of, course we, of course we want to absolutely minimise the risk, but to suggest that in the context of a global pandemic, which is costing lives all around the world, which is having a devastating impact all around the world, to suggest that somehow this minister is to blame because of what is happening in individual aged care facilities is absolutely and utterly unreasonable. And let me tell you, I have admired Senator Colbeck this fortnight. I have absolutely admired him. He has stood here calmly with his usual compassion, with his usual de dedication to the job. He's been directly accountable. He's been answering all of your questions. He has ignored your political Senator provocations. Watt. I mean, you, you here are here trying to use and abuse the tragedy of Senator individual Watt. Australians as, your, as, as, a, as a political weapon, as a desperate political weapon. And it is a sad Order reflection, on not just left. on Labor senators in this chamber, it is a sad reflection on the Labor Party under the leadership of Anthony Albanese. You should collectively be ashamed of yourself. You should collectively be ashamed of yourself. Our government and this minister will continue to do what we have done every single day during this pandemic. And that is make judgments about the best way forward in very difficult circumstances. I've sat there in the ERC as this minister has come forward with, with measure after measure to strengthen our capacity to respond Order. to what is a very difficult circumstance. You haven't seen that clearly. I mean, this, this, this minister could be walking on water and you would still be finding uh, reasons to criticise him because he can't swim. This, I mean, the truth is, you will, you will, you will try. You've seen an opportunity. There was, there was, there was a clumsy, there was a clumsy moment captured on television. And I know, and the minister has apologised for not having a set of numbers at his fingertips at that time. And that is, that is, that is what you have used. That is what you have used to pursue a base political, partisan political campaign. Uh, this, is, this, is not, this is not about you genuinely caring about what is right and what is wrong. This is about you pursuing the political, partisan political interests of the Labour Party. And you should be seriously ashamed of yourself. On this side of the chamber, we understand that we are dealing with a very serious challenge. We will continue to do the best we can to ensure that all Australians have the best opportunity to get through this period safely. We are sad that some Australians, in the context Order, of the global pandemic, Senator will sadly... Corman. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Colbeck is not the Order. Minister for Aged Care. He is the Minister for Walking Away. He walked away from this chamber when we were moving our motion the other day. Order he on my away right. From the media conference Order. yesterday, refusing to answer questions from the media about the aged care crisis. He is the minister who walks away from interviews, walks away from this chamber. Order. Quite frankly, the only place Minister Colbeck should be walking is back to his office to clear his desk and resign. Too slow, too late. That is this government's response to the COVID-19 crisis in aged care. 
When John Howard was Prime Minister, when there was one kerosene bath incident, what happened to Bronwyn Bishop, the Minister for Aged Care? She was gone. Right now, we have evidence from the Royal Commission that he has presided over. In fact, it's not just evidence, it is a report from the Royal Commission into Aged Care. This minister has presided over a, sy a system of what? Neglect. He has presided over a system of neglect. Neglect that meant when we had an aged care crisis hit with COVID-19, he had no plan. Don't take my word for it. Take Gladys Berejiklian's word for it, the Liberal Premier of New South Wales. And don't just take my word for it, Mr. President. Take the Royal Commission evidence that has made clear that in no way, shape or form was the aged care system ready for a highly contagious virus that was going to devastate older Australians. One kerosene bath and the minister is gone under John Howard. 462 deaths, 876 active cases, workers who only have one glove, aged care residents who have ants in open sores, who are malnourished, who are suffering physical abuse, who have maggots in their mouth. I will take that interjection from the Senator Payne. She said, how did that happen? It is in the Royal Commission's report titled Neglect. It is clear that the cabinet ministers in this government have not even read the Royal Commission report called Neglect. The minister didn't just have one clumsy moment, Senator Cormann. He couldn't even remember if he had briefed the cabinet on the Royal Commission report called Neglect. So neglectful is he of his responsibilities, Mr. President. But we know under this Morrison government, older Australians are being left behind. Older Australians are being ignored. And older Australians are being neglected by the Morrison government, specifically by this minister, Richard Colbeck. Now, I want to say to those people watching at home, when you hear us in here talking about the word neglect, it is not just a word the Labour Party invented. Right. It is the word, it is the title of the Royal Commission's report into aged care the, the, that was established by this government. Now, day in and day out, we have seen the minister in this place really puffing himself up. He talked about the high watermark that Australia has achieved. Unbelievable. He talked about the fact that, quote, the system has performed exceptionally well. Well, it's not exceptionally well if your family member is one of the 462 people who have died, if your family member is one of the over 800 active cases in aged care. How do you think it feels to the son or the daughter to hear the minister in this government gloating about how well it's all going out there, about what a high watermark Australian aged care is? I mean, come on. When is this minister going to take some accountability? Where does the buck stop in this government? All we have heard today, it's New South Wales government's fault. It's the Victorian government's fault. It's the regulator's fault. It's anybody's fault but his. What we know about this uh, Minister for Aged Care is he follows the example set by his Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who never accepts responsibility, who hates accountability, and is all about the photo op and the announcement, but never about the follow-through. Never about the follow-through. Well, if there is one group of Australians who should have been able to rely on their government to look after them, it is the vulnerable and the precious senior citizens, our elderly, who live in residential aged care homes. And they have been failed by this minister, and the, sen the Senate should censure this minister for failing to do his job. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to call the minister, then I'll go to Senator Seward. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I say it is really quite tragic that the Labor Party seeks to say, play such base politics with, Order. With, what is, with what is a completely an Order. national tragedy, Mr. President? Order. Uh, as, as we've indicated, there, there are, Mr. Mr. President, uh, there, there are 462 Australians. Senator Cormann. This is a very serious point of order. I mean, we, we sat here in comparative silence. We did, during your contribution and during yours. 
This is a very serious matter. This is a central motion debate. And to have the Leader of the Opposition and various other senior frontbenchers continuously aggressively interject, it is out of, it's out of order at the best of times, but it is particularly inappropriate and a very low way of operating at this point in time. I am taking the traditionally um, liberal view that motions to suspend standing orders for the purposes of a censure debate allow certain material. I do. After an initial flurry, there was general silence from the government side compared to the previous address. The minister in particular sat there and listened to the speeches in silence. I am going to, I am going to say the standing orders here have a place and I have to be able to hear the minister speak, which I was having trouble doing. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr President. It is, it is, it is tragic that the Labor Party t uh, takes to play such base politics with what is a Really tragic issue, Mr. President. 462 deaths in this country so far. Uh, unfortunately, because of the infection rates, there will be more. Uh, and, Mr. President, as the leader in the, of the government in the Senate has said, uh, there, there are correlations to the level of community spread, as the government has said, as many experts have acknowledged, between the, the level of community spread, the level of infection in the community, and the level of infection that will occur in residential aged care, Mr. President. And if you want to uh, overlay the statistics, uh, there is a direct correlation, Mr. President. And unfortunately, and unfortunately in, uh, in, in Victoria, we had a situation where we got to the, the circumstance where there are over 700 infections every day in Victoria, Mr. President. And unfortunately, some of those people who were infected in the community uh, were working in residential aged care and Mr. President, uh, the only way that you completely protect residential aged care from that community transmission is to completely isolate it, Mr. President. Uh, and that's not been done anywhere in the world. But, Mr. President, when you consider that 97% uh, of the facilities in this country have not had a case of COVID-19 that has infected a, a resident, uh, Mr. President, uh, it demonstrates that a large number of aged care prov providers in this country. Uh, have been well prepared, Mr. President. A large number of them. There are a few. There are a few, about 20 odd, that have had significant infections, tragically significant infections, Mr. President. Uh, and, we've, and, and Mr. President, uh, as was put to me by one of the uh, uh, clinical experts in infection control and uh, infectious diseases, by the time the infection the first case is discovered, the infection has largely occurred, Mr. President. So it's a, quite, it's a very tragic circumstance. And I have issued my condolences, Mr. President, on a number of occasions to all of the families who are involved, Mr. President, uh, and, and for their loss, for their extremely tragic loss. Every single death is a tragedy. In fact, every case I wish in this country had never occurred. But we are living in a global pandemic, Mr. President, and governments at all levels. Uh, are struggling with this, uh, and we continue to work every day, uh, every day, to ensure that we provide the resources and the capacity to protect senior Australians in residential aged care. And we continue to do that, Mr. President. Mr. President, the Labor Party can misrepresent, misrepresent my words, my actions in any way they like. It's not going to change the facts, Mr. President. It is not going to change the facts. This government set out its plan for dealing with COVID-19 very early in the outbreak. We started working with the sector extremely earlier, and we did act, and we continued to work with the sector to improve the capacity to provide them with additional resources. Mr. President, in fact, over $1.5 billion of resources have been supplied to this sector to ensure that it has the resources available and the capacity to assist us to work with them to, to, to look after the residents in residential aged care in this, in this country. Mr. President. Mr. President, I reject the base politics that Labor is attempting to play with this. Mr. President, every single death, every single death, is an absolute tragedy, and I know that from the health professionals at the AHPPC and the CDNA right down through all members of the government, they have been working every day to ensure that Australians, more broadly, but also Australians who are residing in aged care uh, have the best chance, uh, have the best level of resource available, so that we can continue to protect them. And Mr. President, the Labor Party scoff at our national performance, but on a global scale, 
Uh, we have, as a country, performed extremely well, Mr. President. You only need to look at our capacity uh, and, and the level of COVID-19 in this country. And I have to say, Mr. President, I would rather be here in this country than almost any other country in the world. And in the respect of residential aged care, Mr. President, it's the same. Mr. President, in the UK, over 20,000 deaths. Mr. President, each one of them a tragedy. But also, one, all of the 462 in this, in this country is also a tragedy. The Greens will be supporting this censure. We are sick of having Australia compared to the global situations. Australians are sick of hearing that. They are desperately upset that so many people have died in aged care in this country. We are sick of hearing that there was a plan when, quite obviously, there was no plan. No plan. You rip, you rip a cover off one report and stick another one on and said, here's our plan. The planning folks included self-assessment by providers of their preparedness for the pandemic. Self-assessment. And guess what? Most of them said, we're, we're prepared. Well, quite obviously, they were not. We should have had people in these facilities from the beginning. We should have made sure that infectious disease control training was mandatory and not online. It's come to the point where we've got the, the defence forces there in these homes, residential facilities, providing the training that should have been provided from the start. I will admit that the scene for this has been set a long time ago. It just didn't suddenly happen. The fact that we don't have sufficient number of care, uh, uh, hours, provision of hours of care for a start, the fact that we don't have enough workforce in place, the fact that we don't even have minimum standards in residential aged care for staffing ratios has set the scene. The fact that the funding for the provision of care hasn't been dealt with is also set the scene. The fact that we haven't got it right with clinical care, the balance of that provided in aged care, is also a factor here. But the fact is that we knew that if, a, if COVID got into aged care facilities, it was going to have a devastating impact. We did. Where I will accept international comparisons is where we look and see what happened. There have been facilities that have kept it out. All the facilities in this country should have had an audit, not a self-assessment, should have had an audit, should have been prepared for, a pandem for this pandemic, for the fact that it might get into the facilities, the fact that more staff needed training, and make sure we had sufficient PPE so people weren't having to share masks, weren't, weren't having to just use one glove, and knew how to use it. And then we had the excuse, folks, that oh, the staff were catching it in, that were bringing it in, and that's where residents were catching it from. When in fact, we know that healthcare workers are predominantly have caught it in the workplace and weren't bringing it in to the aged care facilities. This has not been handled. We didn't have a plan. We don't have a, a system that's set up to protect workers. And now, all of a sudden, we will have someone that's looking after and ensuring in facilities that we have infectious disease control in place. Now, now we put it in place. Why wasn't it there from the beginning? Making sure that we had somebody checking that. We get accused of base politics. It is base politics not to accept and acknowledge that you did not have a plan, that you weren't prepared, that you didn't learn the lessons internationally. The fact that the regulator does not have enough staff, the regulator has not been there doing its job, also needs to be strongly considered and factored in here. A regulator, a strong regulator in place, a strong cop on the beat, would have also helped to ensure that this did not happen. The fact that we have so many notices now in place on these facilities that have had a lot of infection and that have had a lot of deaths, again, points to the failure of the regulatory process. And it's not as if we haven't been warned. I'll keep saying it, 35 reports over 40 years. A lot 
here under the watch of this government. This was not inevitable, and I will not have it said that it was inevitable. It wasn't. We could have done more, and we should have done more. Yeah. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The opposition uh, does not move this suspension lightly. In fact, um, you know, we uh, we have been asking questions of this minister, holding him to account for the last four, five question times following his appearance before the Select Committee. We have been holding him to account. We get accused of base politics. It's not base politics to require that a minister does his job properly. The minister has failed to lead. He's failed to plan. He's failed to protect. He's failed to take responsibility. He has failed to provide an environment where the appropriate level of care is provided to older Australians. Since this outbreak in Victoria occurred, we have seen cases grow from just a few cases in aged care to when it peaked at over 2,000 across 125 aged care facilities, where we had older Australians trolleyed out of their homes into ambulances and taken to private hospitals because the system was broken. We had older Australians malnourished, dehydrated, soiled. They hadn't eaten for at least 24 hours. They hadn't had their medication. Their families didn't know where they were. The people providing care to them didn't know who they were. This is the system that this minister oversaw, and this is why we are holding you to account. Because People are angry. People are upset. People go into aged care because they think they're going to be protected. They think that the environment of residential aged care will help their loved ones, will care for them, will keep them safe. The minister told the Select Committee that he was first worried about community transmission levels rising in Victoria in mid-June. In mid-June. But action in aged care didn't happen until cases were well underway, staff had it, working across multiple facilities. The Victorian Aged Care Response Centre wasn't established until 23 July. By then, there were more than 100 outbreaks, thousands of cases, hundreds hospitalised, and the death count was increasing. And today we hear 462 Australians have succumbed to COVID-19, 462 in residential aged care in a system that this minister is in charge of. And that's why we're having this debate today. That's why. It's not trivial. It's not base politics. It's real. It's 462 families who entrusted their loved one to the care of the aged care system, and it failed them. And the other thing is you were warned. That's the other thing that I think makes people angry. Not just what has happened, but the fact that this government was warned. It was warned in October. This minister couldn't tell the Select Committee whether or not he had briefed the Cabinet on a report titled Neglect. He couldn't recall if he'd been invited in to the decision-making table, to the people that run this government. He couldn't recall if he had briefed them on Neglect. You were warned. You were warned. You were warned in October. You were warned every three months by the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. Every three months they told you this system is failing. More than half of their site audits failing. A hundred per cent of the review audits failing. And what happened? Oh well, we'll wait for the next one, shall we? See what happens. And the standard that was most not met was personal and clinical care personal and clinical care for older Australians. That means the showering, the getting medication, the being cared for, the meals, the care. That's what failed, and this minister did nothing. And Then he got Dorothy Henderson Lodge, and then he got Newmarch, and then he'd seen what happened in, in um, Northern Hemisphere. And still, we just kicked along and waited as community transmission rates uh, grew and you blame the Victorian government, you blame the New South Wales government, you blame the regulator. Well, this motion today, and hopefully the Senate supports it, is about your actions and your responsibility and your accountability 
for the job that you have. And it's hard. No one's saying it's not hard. But we expect you to be able to do your job. And if you can't do your job, get out of the way and give it to someone who can do the job, because older Australians deserve that. Order. The question is that standing orders be suspended uh, according to the contingent notice moved in the name of Senator Wong. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell her for the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 24, noes 26. The matter is resolved in the negative. I call Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank you. Motions to take note of answers. Senator McAllister. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And may I indicate that someone has left their phone here unlocked. Thank you, Senator McAllister. To retrieve it. it is honest of me, is it not? All right. I rise to take note of answers. Uh, to questions to Minister Colbeck asked by Labor. Well, early in the pandemic, Senator Colbeck announced a scheme that was supposed to deliver 36,000 food boxes to older Australians who were unable to shop safely because of COVID. Just 38 of those 36,000 boxes were ultimately delivered. And when asked about it in this chamber, Senator Colbeck perversely insisted that he regarded this as a success. Well, it should have been a bit of an early warning sign, shouldn't it, about this minister's approach to his job, because that scheme was a failure, and that failure was predictable. The CEO of the Council of the Ageing explained that he was not surprised that this occurred because the program didn't match what older Australians needed or wanted. Early on, we saw the qualities that have allowed Minister Colbeck to oversee a shocking tragedy in Australia's aged care homes, his refusal to listen to stakeholders and older Australians, his unwillingness to take responsibility for his failures, his determination to deny facts, to call a fork a spoon in the face of overwhelming contrary evidence, and, of course, rank incompetence. You can draw a line from the tragedy that is currently consuming our aged care system to the neglect that the government has shown this sector over their three terms in office. They have failed to respond to the recommendations from the many inquiries before them. And the commissioners presiding over the Royal Commission said, had the Australian government acted upon previous reviews of aged care, the persistent problems in aged care would have been known much earlier and the suffering of many people could have been avoided. And it puts it in perspective, doesn't it, when this government insists that the matters that have unfolded in Victoria were unforeseeable, 
because that's not what experts are telling them. It's not what the Royal Commission is telling them. Senator Keneally asked earlier in the week and today how many older Australians have died from neglect. Well, what was the answer today? How would we define this? Well, there's plenty of sources of evidence that could be used to define this. And the minister could go, for example, to the reports that have piled up on his desk quarter after quarter after quarter, the reports that found that between October and December last year, standards were not met in 45 per cent of the site audits and 100 per cent of the review audits. The reports that landed on his desk that said between January and March this year, standards were not met in 41 per cent of site audits and 87.5 per cent of review audits. What was the minister's response to these facts? Well, on the basis of his evidence to this chamber today, on the basis of his answers, absolutely nothing. The minister could not point to a single thing he had done, a single action he had taken. But he did revert to type. He did the thing he has done on every occasion when he's been called to account for his failures, and that is to blame somebody else. So today he blamed the regulator. But in his answers, Question after question after question. In his answers, there was always somebody to blame. If it wasn't the aged care quality and safety regulator, it was the Victorian state government. Or it was the New South Wales state government, because he didn't like their scathing critique of his mishandling. It was the aged care facilities themselves. It was the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee. There's always somebody, somebody other than this minister, this minister who cannot point in any concrete way to a thing he has done. This minister who can't remember the occasions on which he's engaged the National Cabinet or the Commonwealth Cabinet on these questions. And the consequence of this unwillingness to accept his responsibility for managing this system and managing this crisis has been a complete unwillingness to learn from mistakes and listen to experts. Experts knew that aged care facilities would struggle to find staff during a coronavirus outbreak, but nothing was done. We knew this from Newmarch House in my home state of New South Wales, but the government, this minister, knew nothing, did nothing, did not have a plan to prevent this from happening in Victoria. The great shame of all this is that one of the most incompetent ministers in this government has been left in place by this uncaring Prime Minister to preside over a sector full of vulnerable people who deserved our collective protection. And it is a disgrace. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, it's nice to hear Senator McAllister acknowledge that there is a Victorian government. Because during these continual attacks on Minister Colbeck, these disgraceful efforts targeting some of the most vulnerable people in our community that are being absolutely well protected, they are being put at risk thanks to the efforts of a, uh, a security guard who decided to get a bit of action during uh, you know, his work time, thanks to the outstanding management of quarantine by Chairman Dan, which of course we don't hear any uh, recognition. It is uh, not okay to not use people's proper titles. That extends to state parliaments. I'd ask you to withdraw. I withdraw. My mistake. I actually thought that was his title after the six-month grab uh, of Senator emergency Hughes, powers. Senator Hughes, please resume your seat. Uh, order, order. When I ask you to withdraw, please don't make a reference to your previous comment. I would like you to withdraw and then move on with your speech, please. Thank you. And acting Madam Deputy President, I withdraw. Thank you. So as Premier Andrews continues his grasping for emergency powers as he claims that state of emergency is existing due to his absolutely woeful incompetence, that his management of the quarantine program led to the Victorian second wave, not that those opposite have acknowledged that these terrible, tragic deaths that are occurring in aged care homes are because of the second wave. They are occurring in Victoria because of the actions of Premier Andrews and his incompetent cabinet, who are now, thanks to their incredible uh, poor legislative agenda at the beginning of this year, facing, staring down the barrel 
of, of manslaughter charges for their incompetence. It's an extraordinary fact that those opposite have continually failed to acknowledge. You wouldn't know there was a state of Victoria. I mean, luckily, you know, for a lot of these people that they, you know, in Victoria, they're locked away, unable to work, trying to stay safe, keep themselves away from the COVID spread, as Premier Andrews gives himself more and more power, increases his reach into people's lives, ruining the Victorian economy. But let's not mention any of that. It is a tragedy when COVID, of course, when it gets into the community, that it is going to get into our aged care facilities. And of course, we have planned for that. And Minister Colbeck has been working across the board to ensure that those preparations and plans were in place, that we have made sure there is a surge workforce available. And incredibly, many of the other state premiers actually suggested and volunteered and offered assistance of workers from their states to go to Victoria. Not that Premier Andrews could be trusted to acknowledge that, particularly after his disgraceful efforts in defaming the ADF and the offers that were made there, where he you know, seems to think that just because you say it on Zoom, it doesn't count as misleading the parliament. But anyway, as is Victoria. But whilst these deaths are incredibly tragic, what is also incredibly tragic is the people that are dying alone. And they're not only dying alone in Victoria. These people are dying alone across the country because of the actions of other Labor premiers who have implemented hard borders, keeping families and loved ones separated uh, during a time where it is absolutely unnecessary, where we have seen an unborn twin die because of medical assistance that was unable to be, to, to be accessed. We are seeing a situation at the moment between Queensland and New South Wales that is absolutely tragic. We have borders at school who are supposed to be going home for school holidays, who are leaving areas in Queensland with no COVID <coughs> and heading to the family property, 15 k's south of the border, 20 k's south of the border, 50 k's south of the border, onto their family properties as harvest kicks off. The first good harvest in a number of years, I'm sure, as Senator Davey will recognise here. Farmers are finally looking like having a good year. But the kids aren't coming home to help drive the headers. Kids aren't coming home to help muster the cattle because they're not allowed back to school under the absolutely ridiculous and overzealous border closures, which everybody can see are politically motivated by uh, Premier Palaszczuk. I wonder what's going to happen on 1 November. I mean, are we going to get a change of heart from Premier Palaszczuk after the election? Let's hope it's former Premier Palaszczuk by 1 November for the sake of all Queenslanders. But, you know, we are seeing so many people being affected, and yet those opposite don't acknowledge what Premier Andrews has done, don't acknowledge the hard borders and the hardship being created for families on the borders thanks to Premier Palaszczuk. We, you know, we certainly wouldn't hear any acknowledgement of Premier McGowan putting electronic trackers on the ankles of those in quarantine. I mean, it is an extraordinary breach of civil human rights, but those opposite who decry all of these things. Thank you, no, Senator not a word. Hughes. Your time has expired. Senator Polly. Nice uh, deflection from the government senator on that side. We don't hear us saying anything about the Tasmanian borders by Premier Gutwin that has closed the borders because he just happens to be a Liberal Premier. But I'm not going to be diverted away from the attention where it should be, and that is the Minister for Neglect. We have seen day after day, day after day, death after death, the minister come in here and accuse the opposition and anyone else who wants to hold him accountable for his responsibilities as a minister for aged care as playing base politics. Well, base politics, for those that are listening, is when you are a minister of the Crown, the buck stops with you. You are responsible, you are accountable and responsible for your portfolio area. And unfortunately, and it is unfortunate, because too many older, vulnerable Australians have died under Minister Colbeck's watch. But it also goes all the way to the top, and that's the Prime Minister. Because what we have known for more years than we can count since these 
This government has been in power, the Liberals, and that is that the aged care sector has been in crisis. We have been calling out for more unannounced visits to residential homes. More unannounced visits. And what have we seen? No action at all by this government. The minister today, in response to questions in relation to whether or not he can confirm that from July to September last year, standards were not met in 37 per cent of site audits and 100 per cent of review audits. What, what is he doing? What is this minister doing to restore the confidence of the Australian people that they can have confidence that if their loved one has to go into residential aged care that they're going to be safe? Well, he's not done anything. And today in question time, I really, you know how there's some television programs that go, call a friend. Well, I was waiting for the minister to call Minister Hunt because yesterday it was quite quite extraordinary. In a joint supposed media conference, we had the Minister for Health over-talking the Minister for Aged Care, and it was supposed to be an announcement over aged care, putting another band-aid, because we know this government is very, very good at making announcements, having the photo op, but they fail in the delivery. They fail in the delivery. Now, we know that there has been warning for month after month that with COVID-19, the impact that was going to have on older residents was going to be enormous. And for older Australians, we're all vulnerable. But if you were in residential aged care, you were more vulnerable than those people in the wider community. Because we know there's been failings of this government for almost eight years to address the training of people who work in this sector. We know that there was not the PPE available to those who are caring for the most vulnerable in our community. We know that compliance failure has been too high, but we've seen nothing but excuses from this minister coming into this chamber, blaming everyone else for his failing as minister. If you accept the portfolio responsibilities, then you have to take responsibilities for the failings. And it's not as if the government and the minister has not been briefed over and over and over again. I've lost count of how many reports there's been into the failings in the aged care sector. But we've had seven ministers in seven years who have each and every one of them has failed to fundamentally fix the very broken system. The fundamental funding of aged care system is broken in this country, and we've waited seven years and have had no action. And now we have a minister who wants to blame everyone else and accuse Labor and anyone who disagrees with him, who wants to hold him accountable, that we're playing base politics. Well, base politics, as I said from the outset, is a minister being responsible for his portfolio area. It's the Prime Minister who is responsible and gave a commitment at the last federal election that he would make aged care a priority. Well, he has failed dismally. He fails every single day when he doesn't have the Minister for Aged Care in the Cabinet. That's where the Minister for Aged Care belongs. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Madam Deputy President, 462 people have sadly lost their lives in aged care facilities across this country due to COVID-19. 462 we heard today. That is an absolutely tragic number. It represents not just 462 lives, but 462 families that right now are grieving, that right now are really, really distraught, no doubt, by the loss of their loved one, whether it be a family member or a friend. And what we've seen here today, and not just today, but for this whole sitting fortnight, time and time again, the Labor Party coming in here and really, I would say, besmirch the, the memory of these individuals and these families that are dealing with it. By coming in here with cheap politics, coming in here with smear, coming in here to, to, to make a political point that ultimately 
As much as they can hide behind their, their, their bravado and their, their loud noises that they like to make on the other side, they're really doing it at the expense of 462 individuals, their families and their loved ones. And they come in here with their confected outrage, but really what they should be doing is actually coming in here and asking questions about what the situation actually is and how things might be improved. No one on this side is saying that all is perfect. No one on this side has said that it's all gone to plan. Of course there have been times throughout this pandemic where we've had to recognise and adapt to the necessary uh, circumstances and changes and, and necessarily adapt to those to make sure that we're uh, responsive and implementing uh, plans in place that uh, are dealing with the, the pandemic. But this is a pandemic. This, these are unusual circumstances. These are unusual times. But the Labor Party doesn't want to acknowledge any of that. And as we heard from Senator, Senator Hughes before, the Labor Party aren't coming in here and mentioning at all this, the source of the pandemic and, and the, the crisis that is, that is prevailing right now in Victoria. The fact is that because there was no effective control of the virus, of the people that were in quarantine in Victoria, we have had the outbreak that we've seen. And it's the preparedness of governments, it's the preparedness of the state government in Victoria that has caused this problem that we're now debating here today. And I reflect in Western Australia, where, thankfully, we've actually managed quite well with the health crisis. Businesses are back open, businesses, cafes are, are enjoying great trade. Uh, 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 holiday spots uh, north and south of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of Perth uh, have enjoyed a, a, a terrific winter season. Thankfully, I was up there uh, in Kalbarri and I got to see some magnificent new infrastructure and, uh, that's been built by, by the, 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 the Department of Parks and Wildlife. Magnificent. But the reality is I can, I'm concerned about whether or not we are actually fully prepared because what the WA government has done is they've put up this hard border and, I think, convinced the population that we're safe behind this hard border. And you know what? The border does provide some protection. There is no doubt about that. But what happens when one of those 450 trucks that necessarily come across the border to bring food and produce and, and necessary supplies, what happens if one of those truck drivers have the virus because they come from a virus hotspot? Or what happens if someone breaks out of a quarantine uh, hotel? like what we saw on, on, uh, on the, over the weekend in Perth. Someone broke out, went down to the pub, had a few drinks. Now, they were from Queensland. They didn't come from a hotspot. But what if that person had actually come from an area where there was a virus and they themselves had a virus? Is WA prepared? Is WA actually ready? Have we got the testing capability? Have we got the capability to deal with it? And I wonder, I wonder whether we do. And what we need to see is a, is, a, is, a, is a refocusing on our efforts to ensure that we are protecting our states. And we didn't see that in Victoria. We didn't see a preparation. We didn't see a preparedness to do, take the tough decisions to ensure that we've got the capability across our systems to ensure that we lock up the, of the, the, the virus and where it breaks out. And so I want to encourage Premier Mark McGowan to Order. look at the system and make sure that we've got the preparedness Thank you, Senator necessary. O'Sullivan. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, what we have today is a minister and a government who have presided over neglect in our aged care system, neglect of aged care residents prior to COVID-19 and neglect of aged care residents during this pandemic. And what we've heard today is a minister and a government who refuse to take responsibility for their inaction. They refuse to take responsibility for the neglect that they have presided over in the aged care system for seven years. And whether it's about the extraordinary number of aged care homes that are consistently failing quality and safety checks prior to this pandemic and his inaction, this minister's inaction, whether it's about the warnings of COVID outbreaks earlier this year at Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmarch House and his inaction, 
whether it's about the deaths in aged care from neglect, tragic deaths, in addition to the tragic loss of life from COVID-19 and his inaction, whether it's about last year's Royal Commission report entitled Neglect and his inaction, what we have heard today is a minister who refuses to take responsibility, a minister who has no explanation. He has no answers. He can't tell us what he did about the 45 per cent of aged care homes that were failing audits last year prior to COVID-19. He can't tell us what he did to prevent further outbreaks after the lessons of Dorothy Henderson and Newmarch should have been learned. He can't tell us why mistakes were still being made at St Basil's in Victoria months later. And he can't tell us why he hasn't acted on the Royal Commission calling for $600 million a year in extra funding. He can't tell us what the government's response is to the Royal Commission's interim report entitled Neglect. Neglect. He can't explain any of it here today. He won't take responsibility for any of it, but he is responsible and this government is responsible for aged care in this country. He is responsible for not taking action on the warnings that were there, the warnings that were there overseas, the warnings that were here in Australia, in New South Wales earlier this year. He is responsible. And we're talking about the deaths of over 460 people who have tragically died as a result of COVID-19 in aged care in Australia. We are talking about mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters and grandparents. These are real people. They are not numbers in a report, and they deserve a better explanation of what has happened than we have heard from this minister and from this government today. Because I cannot begin to imagine just how difficult it has been for the families of those more, more than 460 people. Um, unable to see their loved ones as they were dying of COVID-19 in aged care homes. The stories that we hear have been absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, it is a tragedy and we are facing an aged care disaster and we have been facing this disaster not just for weeks, not for months, but for years. We have been facing it and we have had warnings. We have had report after report and we have had minister after minister in this government who have refused to take any action, who have refused to put plans in place, who have refused to take responsibility, who refuse to be accountable, who cannot explain to us how it is that they believe that they can keep older Australians safe in our aged care facilities today. Uh, and this minister, this is a minister who last week literally turned his back on this parliament. He literally walked out on the questions that he was being asked to answer, that he was being asked to be accountable for. He turned his back uh, on his accountability, on his responsibility to the parliament and on his responsibility to the Australian people. Uh, the Australian people have lost confidence in this minister, in this minister, Senator Colbeck. They have lost confidence and it is time for this minister to resign, to pack up his office and to resign. Thank you, Senator Walsh. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer from Senator Cormann to my question today relating to the government's plans to rush through legislation that is ultimately going to weaken Australia's environmental laws and to make it easier for big mining corporations and big gas companies to continue to destroy Australia's precious environment, to put in harm's way our native wildlife and animals. Of course, we know that the environment is already suffering greatly. It is in a huge state of decline. We know climate change, land clearing, pollution is pushing our environment and our natural world to the brink. And what do we have from this government? More ways 
to make more money for these companies while destroying our environment. And it's being done under the cover of COVID-19. Now I ask the minister, why on earth would we be wanting to hand powers over to the states without any form of strong environmental standards? Of course, we know that big intervention from the Commonwealth government, important intervention from the Commonwealth government, has actually saved some of Australia's most iconic parts of our environment. The Great Barrier Reef, the Franklin. It stopped whaling in WA. Because this is when the federal government stepped in, when state governments were failing to protect our precious species and our environment. Now, if we hadn't had that, we'd have oil rigs on the Great Barrier Reef, the Franklin would be dammed, and whaling may still be going on in WA if the federal government at the time had not intervened. Real leaders, like former Prime Minister Bob Hawke, former Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser, leaders who stood up for their nation's environment, not like these cowards over here on the red benches who do nothing but hand over more and more ways to big corporations to destroy our environment in the name of profit. Now, I'm not going to take much of what Minister Cormann has said uh, seriously, because of course this guy doesn't really know anything about protecting the environment. Minister Cormann doesn't really care about the environment. I was interested to uh, read in the new book by Marion Wilkinson, that Mr Cormann's experience with, and that of course is the book named uh, The Carbon Club, that Mr Cormann's experience with the environment is huddling together on a weekly basis with Corey Bernardi, remember him, to destroy carbon protecting, environment protecting legislation in this place. Cormann, Minister Cormann has no idea what he's talking about when it comes to looking after the environment. This government simply doesn't care. They can't be trusted. They don't care, and they're trying to make an easy path for the big corporations to keep polluting, to keep mining, to keep logging, and to keep making profits off the back of Australia's environment and uh, the habitat of our wildlife. Now, I asked a question in relation to Rio Tinto, and the reason I ask that is because, of course, the head of Rio Tinto is currently in Australia. He's just arrived two weeks ago. He's been through quarantine. I was listening today about all of the Australians who are still stranded overseas trying to get home. Well, we know one person who, was mani who managed to get into Australia. What is he doing here? He's meeting with the traditional owners in WA who owned the caves that his company blew up. He's having to apologise because we didn't have laws that were strong enough to stop this environmental vandalism. So if there's anyone in this country right now who knows why we need stronger environmental laws, you'd think it'd be the head of Rio Tinto. Why on earth would we trust that this government is going to do the right thing by our country's environment. Their track record is atrocious. I call on Rio Tinto to stand with the Greens and to argue that there needs to be stronger environmental protections to declare their opposition to this push from the government, because they, of all people, know firsthand what happens when there isn't proper protections in place. You know what happens? Big companies blow up ancient Aboriginal Order. heritage Senator and Hanson destroy Young, our please environment. Please resume your seat. question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson-Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of 
Senator Ferravanti Wells, the chair of the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of her intention at the giving of notices on the next sitting day to withdraw business of the Senate, notice of motion number one, standing in her name for two sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Competition and Consumer Industry Codes Dairy Regulations 2019. Are there any other notices of motion? Senator Smith. Uh, again, in the name of Senator Ferravanti Wells, in her capacity as chair of the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, uh, pursuant to notice given yesterday, Senator Ferravanti Wells withdraws business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in her name for tomorrow, proposing the disallowance of the Competition and Consumer Industry Codes Dairy Regulations 2019. It looks very, very familiar, if not the same as what I've just read out. So. Um, I'll hand that to the um, <laughs> attendants. Um, there we go. There being no other notices, I'll proceed to the placing of business and call the clerk to notify postponements and extensions. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Business of, business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senator Fioravanti Wells from 3 September to 8 of October. I remind senators the question may be put. Senator Hanson Young. Mm, sorry, Mr. President, I just missed. I was meant to jump at notices of motion. Right, I'll come back to you in a second. I remind senators that question read out by the clerk can be put at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call Senator Hanson Young seeking leave to submit a notice. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting, I shall move a motion in relation to the ABC and the bushfires over summer. I'll take it that leave was granted. Um, I shall now proceed. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to move uh, a motion in the business of the Senate. Part. So I ask the business of the Senate notice of motion number three be taken as a formal motion. Oh, yes, sure. I was about to go to the discovery oh, of formal okay. business. Sorry. Now, Senator Fruki, you're quite entitled to deal with that now. Um, I was going to try and deal with the less contentious elements to begin with for save Senator's time, but if you'd like to deal with it now, you're quite entitled to. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, I ask the business of the Senate notice of motion number three be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Mr. Faruqi. Mr. President, I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. Question is the business of the Senate motion number three in the name of Senator Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell her for the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is eyes 24, nose 24. The matter is therefore negative. Um, Senator, I ask you to remain in the chamber because I'll be running down the notice paper from this point. Uh, I move to government business notice of motion. Senator Dunningham. Mr. President, I ask the government business notice of motion number one, proposing the reference of a public work to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move, the, uh, I move that motion and I table a statement in relation to the work together with an accompanying document. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. On the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham, number two. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask the government business notice of motion number two relating to the consideration of a disallowance motion be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Number three, Senator Dunningham. I ask the government business notice of motion number three relating to a variation to the hours of meeting and routine of business for the budget uh, week be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. On the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Griff, your matter number 760. You can do it from there if you, or go back to your seat. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice number 760 be taken as formal, a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Griff. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Future staffing and funding models in aged care are currently being explored by the Royal Commission, and work is progressing in the Department of Health regarding the development of a new funding model for aged care. The government will not preempt the findings of the Royal Commission. It's important to take the time necessary to get the aged care model right. The question is the motion moved by Senator Griff be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Chisholm and others. Uh, Senator Urquhart, 761. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 761, proposing an extension of time to report for the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion standing in the names of Senators Chisholm, Dean Smith and Seward. question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Polly, number 762. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. Before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the chamber that Senator O'Neill will also sponsor the motion. I ask that general business notice of motion number 762 be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Uh, Mr President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. The government rejects the premise of this motion. The Morrison government is strongly committed to ensuring we have high quality skills sector that is responsive to industry needs, flexible and attractive to students. Our vocational education and training investment will increase to $6.5 billion in 2020-21 including $3.6 billion in skills programs and employer incentives for Australian apprenticeships, $1.6 billion to the states and territories, 
and uh, 0.7 billion to states and territories via a national partnership agreement, or set of them, including Job Trainer, the Skilling Australians Fund, and Revitalising TAFEs initiative. It's important to note that TAFEs are funded and operated by the states and territories. Senator Faruqi. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. For decades, we've seen our TAFE system rip apart by successive federal governments and state governments through neglect, through lack of funding and through privatisation. This is incredibly short-sighted and destructive. TAFE educates and trains the skilled workers, the communities, the businesses, the industries across the country depend on them. TAFEs will be at the centre of rebuilding after the bushfires and the pandemic as we transition to a renewable energy future. A high-quality, publicly owned and fully funded TAFE system is essential for building an economically and socially just society. Everyone has a right to education, regardless of what you want to study and what stage of life you're at. Not only should TAFE be properly funded, it should be free. The question is that motion number 762 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can we go to 763? Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that General Business notice of motion number 763 relating to the Special Air Service Regiment be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Smith. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Um, Senator Seawood, are you taking care of 764 in the name of Senator Steelejohn? Yes, I am. I ask that general business notice of motion number 764 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seawood. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. The government supports a gas-fired recovery and Australians can be proud of our gas industry. In 2019, Australia was the largest exporter of LNG with an export value of $49 billion and more than 26,000 people directly employed in the LNG sector. New gas suppliers will help to drive down gas and electricity prices for Australian households and businesses. And gas is an essential feedstock and energy source for many of Australia's manufacturers, and it provides hot water, heating and a cooking source for millions of Australian households. Australia's competitive advantage has always been based on cheap energy and gas will be central to our ongoing economic recovery. Question is. Motion number 764 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for. Um, you, would you like a division or would you like to. Yes, division required. Ring the, one minute. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 764 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt, tell if the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, tell if the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 4, noes 34. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator McKim, could I come to your matter number 765? I ask senators to remain in the chamber. Uh, thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 765 in my name be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunning. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Decisions to grant exemptions are considered on a case-by-case -case basis and must be balanced against the potential health risks posed to the Australian community by international travellers. Uh, the Australian Border Force is working with state and territory governments to maximise the number of returning Australians, particularly those Australians considered vulnerable or suffering hardship. Australian citizens must be our first priority, and temporary visa holders may apply for an exemption to enter Australia if they have a compelling reason. Exemptions are considered on their merits, based on all of the relevant facts and, of course, also supporting evidence. Senator Gallagher. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Senate. Labor will not be supporting this motion. While we appreciate the intent of the motion, we don't believe the blanket granting of exemptions is an appropriate way to handle the cases of, of those temporary migrants wishing to return to Australia. There are a range of issues facing te temporary migrants at the moment, starting with those currently living in Australia. There are also 18,000 Australian citizens stranded overseas trying to get home with 15 per cent of those classified as vulnerable, according to the Department of Home Affairs. They, along with the many Australians and migrants in Australia facing difficult times ahead, need to be the Senate's priority. The question is the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 765 in the name of Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 6, noes 32. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Seward, are you taking care of 766 for Senator Rice? Senator Seward. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 766 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government has a strong record on delivering a real reduction in emissions, down 1.4 per cent in the year to March 2020. We've got, a str we've got strong targets and a clear plan to achieve them. The government's record $100 billion infrastructure pipeline is supporting public transport, including active transport and rail projects right across the nation. Uh, the government is also developing a strategy to ensure that consumers are empowered to choose their preferred future fuel technology, whether that's electric vehicles, hybrids, biofuels or indeed hydrogen. The question is the motion number 766 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Can we go to 767? Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, before asking that motion, this motion be taken as formal, um, I'd like to advise that Senators Brockman, Askew, Van, Chandler, Mackenzie, Canavan, McMahon, Davey and Macdonald would all like to have their names added to this motion. And I ask that general business notice of motion number 767 relating to the forestry industry be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. Senator Seward. Senator Wish Wilson wants to make a oh, sorry, seek leave to there. make a short statement. Yep, uh, Senator Wish Wilson leave, is leave granted. Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. This motion is not only rubbish; it's childish and it's disrespectful. Senator Dunham and his government consistently attack, criticise, and ignore scientists and cut science funding. The study referred to in this motion is not alone in concluding native forest logging practices increase fire risk. There are other respected studies. This study was withdrawn because of problems with access to data withheld by Forestry Tasmania. The Tasmanian Liberals need to make this data, these fire maps available, and let the scientific process take its course, rather than allow science and research to be politicised by Senator Dunningham. If the Liberals started listening to scientists like Dr Matthew Webb in Tasmania, whose research highlighted the devastating risk logging presents to threatened species, like the swift parrot, the industry might have a chance of ultimately getting FSC approval. Senator Dunning Order, and his government Senator Wish Wilson, time for the contribution the has expired. Industry. Senator Wish Wilson, um, the question now is that seven, motion 767 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 767 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith teller for the ayes, Senator Seawitt teller for the noes.
The result of the division is eyes 35. Oops, sorry, sorry, it's a bit the wrong way around. Um, no, that's correct. The eye, it is eyes 35, nose 4. Sorry, it is. So the matter is resolved in the affirmative. La that's okay. The last matter is number 768, Senator Davey. I ask the general business motion of number 768 relating to the drought support programs be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Davey. I move this motion standing in my name and in the names of Senators Mackenzie, Canavan and McMahon. Thank you. Senator Seward. Senator Rice wants to make a sick leave. To ah, make yep. a short Thank statement. you for pointing that out. Um, and then I'll go to Senator Roberts next because he's also waving. And Senator Gallagher. So I'll start with Senator Gallagher and then I'll go through the television screen. Thank you. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Le Labor will not be supporting this motion. Rather than writing self-congratulatory motions, national senators should focus their attention on drought-affected farmers and their communities that continue to do it tough through a dr drought that their motion acknowledges remains severe and ongoing in many parts of Australia. I will, uh, can I uh, take it that leave is granted for Senators Rice and Roberts to make a one-minute statement? Leave is granted. I'll take it on that basis. So I'll start with Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President. Look, I thank the Nationals for bringing the current state of the drought across the country and the value of supporting farming communities to the attention of the Senate. However, the Greens fundamentally disagree with this motion because the coalition has failed farmers. The climate emergency is already costing farmers a billion dollars a year, and farmers are feeling the brunt of the devastating heat and drought and fires more than most. They will be going bankrupt across the country and regional jobs are going to be devastated from the climate crisis if we have a gas-led recovery and the government keeps propping up coal. Up coal. Then the coalition should be ashamed of themselves. Of, support, of course, we support the little they're doing, but instead of passing self-congratulatory motions, we call on them to tackle devastating drought seriously by taking serious action about our climate crisis. Senator Roberts for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. One Nation supported these programs and will support this motion. Our sense and integrity, though, mean that we need to go further because the best drought resilience programs are not training programs on leadership. The best drought resilience programs are one, water from dams, two, restoration or compensation for farmers who lost their rights to use the land they bought and they own when the Howard Liberal Nationals government stole farmers' property rights to use their land in order for government to comply with the United Nations 1996 Kyoto Protocol. Three, lower electricity costs. Four, infrastructure, productive infrastructure. We must improve and restore Australia's productive capacity and economic resilience after years of governments handing sovereignty to UN treaties, protocols, declarations and agreements. Yesterday, in answer to my question, Senator Cormann clearly and repeatedly put compliance with overseas agreements ahead of the needs of Australian citizens. Parliament and political parties must start to put the needs of Australians first. Order, Senator Roberts. Time for the statement has expired. The question is that motion number 768 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. I'll ask, give senators a moment to leave the chamber before we move on to our next item. Uh, Senator Seward. Yep. Sorry, could I just record the Greens' opposition to that motion? Please? Absolutely, so recorded. All right, I'll just give senators another couple of moments to leave the chamber if they so desire. Now. Uh, I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 18 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question on which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by a lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator McCarthy. Uh, 
Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I, pre I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The crisis in aged care caused by Minister Colbeck's failure to listen to warning after warning and to have a COVID-19 plan for aged care, instead responding to the pandemic with self-congratulation and hubris, turning his back on scrutiny and dismissing deaths by neglect as a function of aged care. Is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in the today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator McCarthy. Um, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this matter of public importance. The crisis in aged care caused by Minister Colbeck's failure to listen to warning after warning and to have a COVID-19 plan for aged care, instead responding to the pandemic with self-congratulation and hubris, turning his back on scrutiny and dismissing deaths by neglect as a function of aged care. Firstly, let me acknowledge, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the incredible tragedy that's facing families right across the country. The significant number of deaths in aged care facilities more than 450 older Australians have died either in residential aged care or other aged care settings as a result of COVID-19. I remind those opposite that we are talking about real people, not numbers in a report. Australians with families, friends, with memories and stories of lives lived who have contributed to our Australian society. People like Maria Rukovina, the little girl who hid in a haystack from enemy troops and survived World War II and passed away on the other side of the world, a resident of St Basil's home for the aged who died of COVID-19. People like Maria and her family deserve our respect and care. Mr Acting Deputy President, First Nations people look at our old people as our elders. They are our elders. They are the carriers of our stories, our family stories, our culture, our kin, passed down from generation to generation. And I want to tell the Senate about one elder, Ms Numara Murdidi, a traditional owner from Numbawa, who since March 2018 lived in a residential aged care in Darwin, 800 kilometres from her home. She was one of 52 witnesses who gave evidence to the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety when it was in Darwin in July last year. Ms Numamadidi was supported to give evidence by her doctor, Dr Meredith Hansen Nahoy, a general practitioner with Danila Dilber Health Service, an Aboriginal community controlled organisation providing primary health care and community services in Darwin and the surrounding areas. She told the Commission it was difficult for Ms Namaradidi to maintain contact with her family in Numbua, on the far eastern side of the Northern Territory. It took some months to arrange a mobile phone for her and that despite exploring options, it's not been possible at all over that period of time for Ms Namaradidi to return to Numbua. In a video statement to the Royal Commission in July, Ms Namaradudi described how she felt living away from her family and country. And these are her words. My heart is crying because I am far away from my family. Yes, because if I pass away here, I've got my spirit, my culture, my ceremony, way back home at home, my family. They don't want that way because we've got everything there in their home. And if we pass away, culture there our spirit, that is our family. I'm the eldest of my family, and that's my mother's land, Numbuwa. Sadly, Ms Namamadudi passed away not too long ago, not being able to return to our country of Numbuwa. Elders and older people being away from country doesn't just affect the individual. It has consequences for families and communities who miss out on being the recipients of cultural knowledge. Why do I share this story with the Senate? Because it's about aged care. It's about the care of our elders, 
right across Australia, not just in southern Australia but right across this country. And the responsibility of all our aged care across Australia comes right back here to this parliament. Indeed, it is Australia as a whole that suffers when that knowledge of our elders is gone. Ms Olga Havnan, the Chief Executive Officer of Danila Dilber Health Service, told the Commission in Darwin, the point I really want to emphasise is that Aboriginal people have by far the most complex health conditions, complex level of needs and who actually receive the least level of service. And these things are not new. We have talked about it for decades. One of the things we were incredibly concerned about and is still are, certainly in Northern Australia and the Northern Territory, is the impact of COVID-19 and the possible impact of COVID-19 on our First Nations people. Just like our elders, the First Nations people have been considered one of the most vulnerable in our community. I raise this issue with the Senate because, again, aged care is the responsibility of the Commonwealth Government. We have a minister here who has not talked about a report from that Royal Commission which these members of the Northern Territory constituency gave evidence to. And it was that report, titled Neglect, which this minister, Senator Colbeck, could not even remember if he took it into the Cabinet, to talk about it with the Morrison government and the Cabinet ministers. That report came down in October 2019. These constituents from the Northern Territory gave passionate evidence about the failings of the aged care system. This parliament was given notice back in October 2019. But let's go back even a few more years before that. And the database of workers, the report that sat on the desk of our Prime Minister and his fellow ministers in terms of aged care and the workforce. You were warned about the failings in the aged care system. And today is about facing the reckoning and the responsibility or lack thereof of this minister. The Royal Commission heard about the stark challenges faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in terms of poverty, food insecurity, difficulties accessing services, lack of culturally safe and secure services and the distances from services. The neglect report found the aged care system fails to meet the needs of its older, vulnerable citizens. Read that report. It impacts even now as every single day goes by. It found the aged care sector does not deliver uniformly safe and quality care, is unkind and uncaring towards older people, and in too many instances it, instances, it neglects them. And for those in the sector, this is not new. This is something they've been talking about for decades. And yet the Morrison government has chosen to ignore the Royal Commission he set up. It has ignored the warnings from experts and unions it has ignored the warnings from tragedies already experienced in Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmarch House. This is a system that puts profit above people. The truth is, after seven years of neglect, Australia's aged care system was broken long before COVID-19. And the Morrison government is in charge of aged care. The Morrison government regulates aged care. It funds aged care. And the Morrison government has a legislation that determines the quality of aged care older Australians get in this country. When Mr Morrison was the Treasurer, he cut $1.7 billion from aged care providers. The aged care portfolio has churned through seven ministers over seven years, Ministers Andrews, Ministers Fifield, Minister Morrison, Minister Lay, Minister Wyatt, Minister Hunt and Minister Colbeck. If things are not working, if systems are not working, the Morrison government is ultimately responsible for this. The buck stops with the Prime Minister. And the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck, has admitted the federal government 
has no idea about how many aged care employees are working across multiple sites despite the serious risks of this issue. This is critical to preventing the spread of infection. The aged care work workforce is casualised, insufficiently remunerated and has no entitlement to paid sick leave. It means workers work in multiple aged care centres. And the minister has also admitted the Morrison government's regulator ceased unannounced visits to aged care homes at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. This minister needs to go. He needs to take responsibility and go. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This virus, COVID-19, has drastically changed the world we live in and the way we live our lives. But as a government, we are working to keep Australians safe and prevent the further spread of COVID-19. We understand that we need to do everything we can to prevent COVID-19 from spreading to vulnerable Australians, and this government is working with aged care providers and state and territory public health authorities to support arrangements to manage infection control and COVID-19 COVID outbreaks. This has been an extremely difficult time for Australians, and we offer our deep condolences to those families who have lost loved ones. As a government, we have been building on our response to COVID-19 in residential aged care since January 2020. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the federal government has announced funding of more than $1 billion in new measures to respond to the impacts of COVID-19 on aged care. Overall, the Morrison government is delivering record investment across the aged care system over the forward estimates from $13.3 billion in financial year 13 under Labor, growing to $21.4 billion in, this financial year, uh, in last financial year rather, under a coalition government. That is, on average, $1.2 billion of extra support for older Australians each year over the forward estimates. It's important to note when considering our COVID-19 response, uh, particularly as it pertains to aged care, is that we're incorporating learnings not only from our country's own experience of this issue, but also using the experiences of other countries to provide a wider understanding of the virus, its impact on aged care and effective control measures. We are taking all the advice and using all the information available to us to inform the aged care response to COVID-19, which has been closely incorporated into the health response to the pandemic and is a critical part of the health pandemic plan. Across the country, 97 per cent of aged care facilities have not had an outbreak of COVID-19, and we are working incredibly hard, Mr Acting Deputy President, incredibly hard to try and keep it that way. Making improvements to aged care for all senior Australians uh, has always been a priority of the Morrison Coalition government, and it continues to be a priority. That is why the Prime Minister called a royal commission into aged care quality and safety. Our recent track record in improving aged care, including since the royal commission was called, is extensive. We've invested $3 billion since the 2018-19 budget into home care packages to support more Australians to remain living in their own homes for longer. That's an increase of more than 50,000 home care packages. We've released almost 15,000 new residential care packages, including 13,500 residential places and 775 short-term restorative care places. We're investing $5.3 billion from 1 July this year to June 2022 for existing Commonwealth Home Support Program service providers to ensure continuity of in-home support services for more than 800,000 clients across Australia. We've invested $21.9 million for my aged care operating costs. We provided a $320 million boost to residential aged care subsidies. We've given providers um, operating residential and home care access to independent business advisory services and so much more. And unfortunately, I'm not hearing uh, from those on the other side much mention of this great work that this government has done in this debate. 
Recently, the Morrison government announced a scale-up of aged care support programs in Victoria and across Australia with an additional $171.5 million. And this provides a new funding boost for a new COVID-19 response plan, as agreed by National Cabinet last week. It demonstrates that we are continually assessing and adapting to this situation based on the best medical advice to protect older Australians. Funding will be used to continue current programs for infection control uh, training and surge wor workforce staff alongside greater compliance by the Aged Care Commissioner and coordinated response centres. As I said in my initial remarks, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, we understand that we need to do everything we can to prevent COVID-19 from spreading to vulnerable Australians, and we are committed to working with aged care providers and the states and territory authorities to try and get Senator this outbreak under control. Chandler, your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution on, on this um, debate. I articulated earlier in this place uh, today how concerned we are about the failures in aged care in this country, and in particular as it relates to the uh, COVID crisis and the number of um, deaths that have occurred in aged care in this country, and the fact that this government appears to see it as, well, it's less than Europe and justify that as less than what's happened in Europe and other countries, when that is and as if it is an inevitable inevitability. Well, it's not an inevitability. The fact is, is that we, did have no, we didn't have a plan. We had a lack of preparation. We haven't had enough money invested in aged care. We lack the workforce. We lack a surge workforce. We don't provide the hours of care that people need when they are in aged care. And that's just a few of the things that um, need to be addressed and that have led to the failures to adequately protect older Australians in residential aged care. What I wanted to focus on here is the issues around our regulator and the fact that we don't think that the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission is adequately supported or resourced or has the appropriately reg regu appropriate regulatory powers to fully enforce uh, standards in aged care. COVID-19 has further exposed the already significant problems in aged care and, as I've just articulated, but also the significant problems with our existing regulatory framework and, in fact, our approach to regulation. The Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission has been perfectly happy with assessing providers' readiness for COVID-19 through through self-assessment tools and phone contacts, clearly inappropriate in the face of what the potential for COVID had in terms of impacting on older Australians in aged care. They must have known the significant problems that we have in our aged care sector in this country, the lack of staff, the fact that we're still arguing about whether we should have a, a nurse on call, on, in the facility 24-7, the fact that there's still conflict over uh, provision of clinical care. They, they must have known that these problems were there. I think it's incredibly telling how the Commission has approached regulation in general. It is simply not appropriate to take this self-assessment approach and phone contacts to regulation in, in the face of the pandemic. The tick box approach around assessing aged care quality has long been known to experts in the sector for years now. I've had constant complaints about it. People within the sector will openly tell you that quality assessors are not adequately equipped to do their job. They often don't have the capacity to observe outcomes and factors contributing to substandard quality care. In fact, in a submission to the Aged Care Royal Commission in June, the CPSU said that nearly 60 per cent of assessors felt ill-equipped to identify gaps in care because they, they didn't have enough time on site to identify problems. The CPSU also noted that without additional staff to share the workload of monitoring aged care, assessments will continue to be rushed while care is poor. One staff member told the union, 
We often feel we are regulating with our hands tied behind our backs. We're not allowed to pho photographically record information, copy and take information, audio record key interviews. The Commission is a bit toothless in holding providers to account. That's what they said. Another assessor said there is no real penalty, penalty to failing um, to, meet the stand, to meet the standards, just the inconvenience of additional visits from the Commission. It is crystal clear that the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission has failed to properly investigate facilities during the outbreak of COVID-19. I strongly believe that the decision to cease unannounced visits was the wrong decision. The regulator should have been there to make sure these facilities were up to scratch. The Commission is under-resourced and understaffed, not only to deal with this pandemic but also the fundamental problems in aged care. As at the 31st of August, the Australian Defence Force personnel had visited a total of 252 aged care facilities to that date. In contrast, the Quality and Safety Commission had um, conducted spot checks and, and carried out checks, um, 118 checks. This means the ADF are conducting more than double the amount of checks on our aged care facilities. And while that is a good thing, you would have thought the people with the expertise would have been the ones that should have been in there. It is obvious that the Commission doesn't have enough staff to inspect every single um, facility and undertake the, the uh, spread of the work that needs to be done. The Minister told us at, the, at a COVID committee hearing in August that if the Commission requires additional resources, then the government will provide it. If that's the case, why isn't the Minister providing the Commission with significant extra resources and funding to boost, bolster its workforce and let it do the regulation properly? Many stakeholders in the aged care sector, including COTA, OPAN and the AMA, have been calling for stre strengthening of the Commission's functions and powers since it was established. We, the Greens, have also been calling for this. And in fact, we tried to amend legislation passed by the Senate um, last year to in fact strengthen the Commission's powers. It is imperative that the government immediately look at how the Commission could be strengthened and better resourced to, to support facilities throughout the pandemic and beyond COVID-19. This is yet another failure of this government to adequately ensure that our regulator had teeth and that it had the powers and the funding and the resources to make sure that those uh, that it could properly regulate this sector. So the sec sector was in the best state possible as it faced this pandemic. It is unacceptable that this continue any longer. Senator Green. Um, acting, oh, sorry. Um, acting Deputy President, uh, there's been a lot of words thrown around this chamber in the last couple of um, speeches and through the debate we've had not just today but also over the last uh, couple of days and the weeks ahead um, confected outrage with Labor's been accused of confecting outrage over the deaths of vulnerable Australians cheap politics Labor's been accused of using cheap politics well there's nothing cheap about the lives of vulnerable Australians. And when the minister today was given an opportunity to explain himself, he referred to the motion in this Senate as tragic. Well, it is tragic that vulnerable Australians relied on this minister and relied on this government to take care of them during this outbreak, because we know that there were warnings. We know that the government received a report entitled Neglect. We know that there were warnings of outbreaks and what outbreaks would do in an aged care facility and with older Australians. But still, this government and this minister didn't have a plan. They didn't have a plan and now they're trying to shift blame, shift responsibility direct focus away from where it should be, where it should be is on this minister, his job, and he should be resigning. Under this government's watch, 450 aged care residents have died 
and there are currently 890 active cases in residential aged care. These aren't just numbers. This isn't a debate about just numbers. These are real people, family members, elderly residents, our most vulnerable Australians who are dying without their families by their side because this government failed to develop a plan for the aged care sector. The lack of a plan has culminated in a situation where a third of all COVID deaths in Australia have occurred in aged care homes. But we know that the government was warned. There is only one word to sum up this government's response, and it is neglect. It is neglect. They had a report entitled Neglect. They knew. They had warnings. And now they want to shirk responsibility. Well, it is very difficult for this government to shirk responsibility when they had warning after warning that this would happen. The warning bells were ringing in March, but the government wasn't listening. It is now September, and their inaction has been staggering. The other curious thing that is happening now is the aged care minister walks away from responsibility, shrugs off responsibility in this chamber. Is those opposite have had to come to his defence, and in doing so, they've made one of the most illogical, circular arguments I think I've ever heard in this chamber. First of all, they say, we've listened to the best medical health advice about aged care failures, and uh, it's heaps worse in other countries, so we're doing okay. Then they say, actually, this is a result of community transmission in Victoria. They want to lay the blame on somebody else, on another government, on other people who are not responsible for aged care. Then they say Victoria needs a road out of lockdown. They say premiers need to stop making political decisions about borders. They say that premiers aren't listening to health advice and expert advice. Well, can I tell you, one of the reasons that people in other states are terrified about COVID-19 coming into their community is because this government is responsible for aged care and they know that this government and this minister will not take care of them. So instead of trying to shrug the blame off to someone else, why don't you Senator do your Green. job? Senator Green, your time has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, thank you to Senator McCarthy for moving this motion. There is no doubt that in the current environment, any death relating to COVID-19 is tragic, and that older Australians are the most vulnerable to its impacts. In this debate, we mustn't forget the tragic losses that families, friends and loved ones are experiencing due to COVID-19 pandemic. However, for the sixth time, in this sitting period, the Australian Labor Party have come into this chamber and set up a debate that seeks to shift blame away from their own failings in aged care policy. For the sixth time this sitting period, the Australian Labor Party have come into this chamber and tried to protect their Victorian mates from accountability for their systemic failings. Is this just another union protection racket for the Victorian Labor Party? Failings in quarantine that have seen community transmission spread right across the state and forced the most severe lockdown conditions in Australia. Failings in governance that have seen the wrong departments running the hotel quarantine. The refusal of Australian Defence Force resources and the catastrophic under-resourcing of contract, contact tracing. For the sixth time this sitting period, the Australian Labor Party have come into this chamber and ignore the facts from the government by continuing to argue there was no plan in place. Well, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm, I'm very pleased. I'm very pleased to uh, to say on the 24th of August, Prime Minister, the Liberal Prime Minister, 
Scott Morrison provided a detailed response to the Leader of Opposition about the plan. Those opposite in this chamber have clearly not followed what has already been said in the other place. And as such, for the benefit of those opposite, I would like to seek leave to table the Prime Minister's answers. Is leave granted? No, leave's not granted. Uh, well, I expected that because they don't want to listen to the answers. It is clear that those opposite do not want to listen to facts. They do not care about the facts or good policy. For those opposite, this is about politics, grandstanding and trying to get a news grab. Well, shame on you. Well, I will tell you what. On this side of the chamber, we do care about facts. We do care about the truth. And no matter how often the Labor Party want to deny the existence of a plan, the evidence is clear. Give me leave to table it, Senator. Give me leave to table it. I've got it right here for you. You can read it any time. I'll drop it round to your office. There was always a plan, and you know it. And the fact that you won't give me leave just proves it. Oh. No. Um, if the senator could direct his uh, comments um, through the chair, that would be appreciated. And I note that the document he is seeking to table is a matter of public record. It's not necessary. It's not a point of order, Senator Green. But uh, Senator Van, if you could direct your comments through the chair. Uh, as I please. said earlier in my comments, and I think I've said on about three occasions, Madam De Deputy, Acting Deputy President, all my comments so far have been through the chair. And you know, it is curious, Madam Acting Deputy President, through the chair, that each time those opposite decide to bring this debate on, there is not one Victorian senator leading the charge on their side. Where are they? What are they hiding from? They're just not about to take any accountability for what's happened in Victoria. Not once have I heard one Labor senator even mention the word Victoria. This is despite the alleged failing of, a, of aged care in their home state. I will note, however, that Senator Walsh has been the only Labor senator to be brave enough to come into this chamber and debate this issue, although I do note she did not mention Victoria once. I do, however, wonder where the rest of her Victorian ALP Senate colleagues are. Well, we saw Senator Carr earlier. That's, we know where he is. Uh, Senators Kitching and Ciccone, not there. Uh, I haven't heard anything from Senator Rice while she's attending virtually. I've not heard anything from her on this issue. So we've had Labor senators from the ACT, New South Wales, Queensland, Tasmania, Western Australia, and now the Northern Territory, but no Victorians. Is it because, as Victorians, they're too ashamed of Dan Andrews to come into this place and defend his appalling record? Madam Acting Deputy President, there is nothing more hypocritical than every senator on that side who have failed to call out the Victorian government for their disastrous handling of this pandemic. Considering this remarkable situation, I welcome the opportunity to talk fact and refute their unjustified attacks on the Minister for Aged Care and their spurious allegations. So, Senator Reddick, let's talk facts. When Labor left office, total aged care spending was 13.3 billion. This year, under the Liberal National Coalition government, it's $22.6 billion, increasing to $25.4 billion by 22-23. In case your maths needs refreshing, that is an increase of over $1.2 billion each year. When those opposite were thrown out of government, there were 60,308 home care packages across the country. Under this government, we will see that grow to 164,135 places by 22-23. That's an increase of 170 per cent. At the same time, corresponding funding will also increase by 258 per cent. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, through you, one thing about those opposite that annoys voters in Victoria is their ability to say one thing and do another. Let's consider the last election, where the Labor Party had so much new spending they would have resulted in an extra $387 billion in new taxes. But 
Let me just check. How much of that was promised for aged care? Zero. Absolutely zero. None. The hypocrisy. Those opposite had a plan to increase taxes on everything, yet they didn't have a plan for aged care. This is despite the Leader of the Opposition reminding us last week at the National Press Club that he had been shadow ageing and senior spokesperson back in 2001. Yet those opposite come in here, all high and mighty, and decide to lecture us on issues they have clearly ignored. Well, I tell you what, Madam Acting Deputy President, that this government takes aged care seriously. This is a government that values older Australians, a government that realises that the system isn't perfect and the test of a government is what they do. And the Morrison government is a government that is getting on with fixing the problems in the system. We have a Prime Minister that knew that there were significant issues in aged care when he took the job. And that is why this government called a Royal Commission in October 2018. We knew that the Royal Commission was going to find issues. That's its job. Those opposite need to be reminded of the words of the Prime Minister when he announced the Royal Commission. And I quote the Prime Minister here. I think we should brace ourselves for some pretty bruising information about the way our loved ones, some of them, have experienced some real mistreatment, Mr Morrison said. And I think that it's going to be tough for all of us to deal with, but you can't walk past it. And I can say proudly right here, we are not walking past it. We are tackling it head on. There is no doubt that the Royal Commission's interim report was damning. There is no denying that. But that's why we called a Royal Commission to shine a light on areas and to get to the bottom of the problems. It is a reminder that perhaps the government should call a Royal Commission to investigate the quarantine failures in Victoria or to investigate the contact tracing failures. That will shine some light on why we now have such high community transmission in Victoria which spread into aged care. The Aged Care Royal Commission was highly critical of the inaction of successive governments towards aged care industry. We acknowledge that and we are actioning responses as quickly as we can. We are acting on the recommendations that have already been made and we will act on further recommendations. Work continues to progress through the Aged Care Workforce Industry Council. We continue to progress reforms and invest in the critical skills that our aged care sector needs. But where is the commitment from those opposite? In every area in this portfolio, portfolio they dither, they point score, and yet time and time again they have failed. They have provided no policy, no commitment to additional funding. When they come in here day after day throwing mud at Minister Colbeck, who was appointed some seven months after the Royal Commission and some five months before its report was handed down, and he's diligently working through the challenges of this sector. Those opposite reek of total hypocrisy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to contribute in this debate, uh, again, another speech on aged care, because it has been such a major issue confronting not just Victoria but our whole country uh, in recent months. And I have to say that I was disappointed to hear from Senator Van a continuation of the failure to take responsibility that we have seen from Minister Colbeck and from the Prime Minister himself. Not a single person in this government seems willing to take responsibility for the aged care failures that we have seen in this country, particularly but not only in Victoria over the last few months. It could not be any clearer that aged care Senator is a Van. federal responsibility. The federal government funds aged care. The federal government regulates aged care, or they're supposed to regulate aged care. Uh, and yet, despite that, they continue to avoid taking responsibility for what we have seen occur in our aged care uh, facilities. Anyone, they'll find anyone else to blame. Their, their preferred target is Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews. They'll, they'll also sorry, blame. Sorry, Senator Watt, could you just resume your seat? Senator Van, uh, you were listened to in silence. I would appreciate you to I would appreciate you not interjecting while speeches are being made. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. 
As I say, whether it be Minister Colbeck, the Prime Minister, senators in this chamber, they will always find someone else to blame for what we have seen occur in our aged care facilities, as long as that person is not themselves. Uh, now, clearly, this is the responsibility of the federal government, and in particular, the aged care minister, Minister Colbeck. And it wasn't that long ago that I remember there being another aged care minister in this country under a Liberal government, Bronwyn Bishop. She was the minister who oversaw what became known as the kerosene baths scandal, disgraceful circumstances in Australian aged care homes. One death resulted, and she at least had the good grace to resign from her post. And yet, in contrast, we have a minister here completely asleep at the wheel, completely failing to take responsibility for the pandemic entering and spreading like wildfire through aged care facilities in Victoria and now claiming the lives of over 450 older Australians, and yet he remains in a job. Now everyone knows, and you've only got to look at the Senate backbench to see that they know, that this minister is not going to be in the role for very much longer. It is a matter of time. We're all just waiting for the reshuffle that occurs when Senator Cormann retires, and we all know that the deck shares will be reshuffled, rearranged, and there'll be someone else put into the role as aged care minister. But you have to say that it doesn't really seem to matter who is the minister in this government, because whoever has been the minister has presided over a complete disaster in our aged care system. We have seen this government has been in power for seven years. They have had seven years to fix the aged care system that they are responsible for. They have had report after report after review, after submission, after framework, after guideline, telling them over and over again that the aged care system is broken, that it needs more funding. Uh, that it needs fundamental overhaul. And yet, no matter who we've had sitting in the chair of the aged care minister, they have ignored those warnings. They have failed to do what's been recommended. They've been called out by their own Royal Commission for failing to implement recommendations and failing to have a plan. And of course, now we're seeing the consequences. And it's not just about numbers of people being affected. Just let's think about those stories that we've heard about maggots, about ants crawling all over older Australians. My father turned 80 this year. Realistically, it won't be too many more years before he's in an aged care facility. I'm just horrified at the idea that he might have to end up being in a facility where that's the kind of condition that people are treated. But that is how people are being treated in aged care facilities that this federal government is responsible for. The time for action is well past you. This government simply has got to do something about this. We've had this interim report handed down recently labelled neglect, and we're still seeing problems in the aged care system. They set up a Royal Commission saying that that was going to be the solution, and now that it's providing solutions, they're ignoring those as well. We cannot leave Australians, older Australians, to continue Senator to Watt, suffer. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. And can I say uh, to Senator Watt, I do actually think about those stories. I think about the stories of a mother who lost a child, a baby, because she couldn't cross the border because of, because of an outrageous statement, an, an outrageous, bigoted statement that says Queensland hospitals are for our people. Queensland hospitals are for our people. I don't seem to recall Scott Morrison or the Minister for Aged Care, the Prime Minister or the Minister for Aged Care, ever saying, you know, ever saying. Oh, okay, so Senator Pratt, Senator Pratt. Interjections are disorderly. That the Labor Party have again sought to engage in the politics of smear and blame is testament to the fact that they are bereft of ideas and policy. They are an entity focused solely on negativity and po profiting politically from human misery. Today's MPI and the literary of repetitive and malicious questions and statements directed at our aged care minister 
borders on obsession. The root cause of the second wave in Victoria and the bulk of Australia can be found in the failings of the Victorian state government and their failed hotel quarantine program, their failed community transmission program, their failure to consult with the federal government when they pulled out 100 aged care staff out of the St Basil aged care centre with, with as little as 24 hours' notice. Don't you think you would have at least rung up and had some backup in place before you pulled the staff out and left those residents fend for themselves? I mean, we shut down in March so that the state governments would have enough time to get their health systems up to scratch. I mean, you know, the federal government has funded the state governments hundreds of billions of dollars to get their health system procedures up to scratch, to get their quarantine up to scratch, to get their community transmission up to scratch. But yet the one government that failed us, the Victorian Labor government, was the one with the strictest rules and the worst execution. The worst execution. And those opposite us will do anything to run cover for the Victorian Premier. They will constantly run cover for the Victorian Premier. And not once have we had a question here in the last two weeks, in question time, about how we're going to get out of this. Because these guys, the guys on opposite us, don't want to get out of this. They want to keep the country locked down. They want to keep the country locked down because Labor love command and control. In a global pandemic with a new and unknown virus disproportionately affecting the elderly, it was a horrific reality that it was inevitable that some elderly Australians would regrettably pass away from this virus. All loss of life is tragic. Okay. But for those opposite to come into this place screeching and preaching that the minister is responsible for every death and that had they been in government no one would have died from this virus is ludicrous. As the uh, Chief Medical Officer in Victoria has already stated, a number of these people counted as COVID deaths were already in palliative care. Okay, that seems to be overlooked. We are supposed to be fighting our common enemy, the virus, and the economic carnage. But of course, the Labor Party want to find a scapegoat for political point scoring. And unfortunately, the Minister for Aged Care has become the distraction that Labor need to divert away from the Victoria Premier's gross failing. The unfair and dishonest language used in this motion demeans us all. And we've heard uh, mistruths spoken again this afternoon by those opposite us about the fact that the LNP has cut $1.2 billion out of aged care. Well, let me tell you, the ABC, and let, they're no great friends of the coalition, they have come out and they have said that this claim is misleading. Is misleading. And yet those opposite us continually repeat the same old mistruths time after time after time. Instead of asking some constructive questions about how we're going to get out of this and how we're going to look after our children, because they're the ones that have forgotten in all of this, they're the people who are going to have to inherit the debt, inherit this new way of living. Hopefully we can restore their freedoms. I know some of the state premiers are intent on keeping the place locked down, destroying any liberty that's left in this country. I don't know what I can say. But anyway, look, this idea that the minister has avoided scrutiny is a farcical claim. He has come into this chamber every day for the last two weeks and he has stood up and he has answered those questions. He goes into the media, he answers the questions. He has been doing an outstanding job, and what's going on here is nothing short of bullying. Nothing short of bullying for crass political point scoring purposes. I take issue with the notion thrown up in this motion that the minister, or indeed any member of the government, has responded to the pandemic with self congratulation or, or hubris. I think, if anything, the pandemic has humbled us all. An invisible enemy, which we have been thus far unable to completely defeat, reminds us all of our shared humanity. 
The Labor Party, and their relentless focus on this, seems to carry the implication of a couple of things. One, that they have a mortgage on compassion. And two, that somehow they could have prevented the spread of the virus to a much greater extent. We know how the state Labor government managed the outbreak in Victoria. We hear nothing from those opposite us. The most sinister implication from those opposite with this MPI seems to be that those on this side of the chamber don't care about our elderly. Nothing could be further from the truth. Those in the coalition care about our elderly deeply. We all love our, our parents. We all love our parents, and this attempt to imply otherwise is just woeful. You know, in my own maiden speech, I said there was no substitute for mum and dad. It's why I fight to place the importance of the family at the front and centre of everything I do. Because when it comes to childcare and aged care, there's some things governments can't do as well as the family. It should be remembered who set up the Royal Commission. We want to hear the stories and do our best to make sure that aged care is the best we can possibly make it. The fact is 97 per cent of aged care is COVID-free. This is a good result. It is a good result both by objective standards and when compared with the rest of the world. It is not a perfect result, but against an insidious enemy like the virus, it is a good result. But Labor seem to think it is acceptable to lie in the context of this debate. We know their repeated claim that this government cut aged care funding. It is a brazen lie. Funding has increased by almost $10 billion under the coalition government. Furthermore, it should be remembered that the Victorian Chief Medical Officer himself said that people dying with COVID are dying with COVID rather than from COVID, and they are being included in the count. So for those on the other side to be gloating on these deaths and saying that they were all unavoidable is despicable. He has noted that many deaths classified as being COVID has been patients in palliative care. Palliative care is one of the toughest parts of our healthcare system. It is about kindness and minimising suffering. This is an unfortunate reality. I want to go now to this another important issue, and that is, is that we haven't had a plan for COVID. You know, and those opposite us love to refer to the Royal Commission, but they never actually refer to the medical officers who put the submission in to the Royal Commission. They're happy to refer to the barristers, the non-experts, the non-medical experts. So I'll just conclude by uh, market remarking on comment seven from Brendan Murphy, the chief medical officer. In January, in January 2020, the Australian government led the preparation of the Australian Health Sector Emergency Response Plan for novel coronavirus. This was published on the 18th of February and activated on the 27th of February. This plan addressed response to aged care in the context of the overall Commonwealth, state and territory response plan. Senator Rennick, your time has expired. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. You just wonder what it's going to take to get the Morrison government and the senators in this place, the LNP senators, the government senators in this place, to take responsibility once and for all for aged care. What yeah. is it going to take? It is very clear that the Morrison government fund aged care. They regulate aged care. They have legislation around the quality of aged care. So they have a lot of control over this sector, and yet what we've seen is passing the buck blaming others and somehow blaming us when we are in opposition. I mean, what nonsense. I've got to tell you that just ordinary Australians out there are very, very concerned about aged care. And they know, they know it is Mr Morrison and Minister Colbeck who are ultimately responsible 
for aged care. And we've sadly seen a minister who is not up to the job, because clearly the buck stops with the minister. And quite frankly, if Mr Morrison really cared about what's happening in aged care across this country, he would withdraw that minister and put in someone who is at least competent and capable. My thoughts, of course, are to every single person who has lost a loved one during this pandemic, but particularly to those in aged care, and who hasn't been moved from the horrific stories that we've heard, where loved ones don't know where their family members are, where loved ones are not at the bedside when their loved one dies. Many of us in this place have seen our parents pass on. I was with my father when he passed away. And some of the social workers, well-meaning, suggested I put my father into a nursing home. Now this was a couple of years ago, and at that point, even at that point, acting deputy president, I said, no way. No way is my father going into an aged care facility. And I was very firm about it. They put quite a lot of pressure on me. But having worked for the union that organises aged care workers, United Workers Union, I know what nursing homes look like. There was no way my father was going to go into that aged care facility. Workers in aged care are low paid, 20 to $21 an hour. They don't have enough hours. No wonder they work across two and three other facilities just to make ends meet. I heard Pat Sparrow from Aged Care Services say on the radio today that the new funding announced yesterday was welcome, but it's still not enough. So once again we've seen this piecemeal approach. We saw it in the bushfires, running behind, piecemeal approach from the Morrison government, and we're definitely seeing it in aged care. And it is a tragedy, and we should demand better. We are a wealthy country. We can afford to treat aged care workers with respect. Yeah. We can afford to pay them properly for the jobs that they do. The loved ones are currently dying in their arms when family members are not there, and yet we treat these workers with such disrespect. They get about 30 hours a week, they earn 20 to $21 an hour, and they are the people currently in the front line. And yet we see a pathetic attempt from the Morrison government to somehow support them because they've taken away their second job options. And clearly it is way over time for this government to take responsibility, to act, to have a plan for the future. I bet if we asked Minister Colbeck, what's aged care look like in 12 months, he couldn't tell us. If we asked the Prime Minister that, he couldn't tell us. Aged care providers have been saying for years now that the system is in crisis. We have a report entitled Neglect. That should have given some clues to the Morrison government that uh, things were not good. A report entitled Neglect, where there were horrific stories, which I'm not going to repeat today, but we've heard over and over again of that neglect. We heard in all of the, the New March, the St Basil's, Dorothy Henderson Lodge, we heard those horrific stories from family members about their relations. So bang, imagine banging at the window. So get real and take responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lyon. Senator Steele John, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. To come into this place to contribute to this debate and excuse the loss of life, to suggest that it is ever acceptable for people to die in these circumstances simply because they were already on their way out is absolutely vile and completely unacceptable. Those senators that have made those suggestions during the course of this debate should hang their heads in shame. And while they are at it, go and look at some of the accounts of what it is like to suffer 
with this virus and ask themselves a the question whether they would be comfortable if their relative, if their loved one were ending their life struggling to breathe as their bodies shut down due to COVID-19. Let us be very clear. The government had no plan. The regulator was ineffective and underfunded. The government failed to listen to report after report. And the Royal Commission's report titled Neglect says it all in one word. There was failure to collect data. There was failure to support workforce. And as in aged care, so with disability. As with aged care, so with disability. An ineffective regulator, no plan at the outset of the pandemic, failure to listen to report, failure to collect data, failure to support workforce. And in addition to that, a total and continual failure to provide the adequate financial support to those on the DSP and carer payment. And that is before we even touch on PPE and the preparedness of the workforce in terms of infection control. The response of the government in aged care is to run a protection racket for one of the most incompetent ministers ever to congeal in a cabinet position within the coalition. And within disability, it has been to send anxiety scorching and surging through the community with the announcement of the proposed independent assessment framework for those participating in the NDIS. Well, I give this message very clearly to anybody watching at home. The Greens will continue to fight to hold this fool to account, and we will resist any and all measure to impo impose these assessment frameworks upon disabled people. Thank you, Senator Steele John. The time for the discussion has expired, and I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. We have item one, Building Construction Industry Act 2016, or the Fair Work Act 2009. Any senators wishing to speak? In which case we will now move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Davey. I present the report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Corporations and Financial Services on the 2018 to 2019 annual reports of bodies established under the ASIC Act together with the Hansard record of proceedings and documents presented to the committee. And I move that the Senate take note of the report. Senator Fruki. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Report, PFAS Remediation in and Around Defence Bases, Second Progress Report. Sorry, we haven't got, oh. to, that, haven't got to that report oh, yet. Sorry. sorry. Okay. So, did any other senators wish to speak to the first report? From, no? And the, the question is that that uh, report be accepted. All those in favour say aye. Against? No. The ayes have it. Senator Davey. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, I prevent, present the report of the Committee on PFAS Remediation in and around Defence Bases, Second Progress Report and documents presented to the Committee, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, again. Madam Acting <laughs> Deputy President. Um, I rise to take note of um, the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Report, PFAS Remediation in and Around Defence Bases, Second Progress Report, which evaluates uh, government response to the initial inquiry that we had a couple of years ago. The PFAS subcommittee, of which I am a member, was re-established after the federal election last year when the 46th Parliament resumed and this was re-established precisely with the purpose of scrutinizing progress on the recommendations of the parliamentary inquiry into PFAS and government's response to it. I have always said that I would continue to work with the community and in parliament to keep this issue front and center 
until the government prioritizes the needs of the affected communities. And this committee is part and parcel of the work that I am committed to. We all know the nationwide damage wrought by the toxic PFAS chemicals has been extensive and people have suffered for too long. Despite this, people had to wait 15 months for the government response to the committee's original report. The government dragged its heels even after the Senate ordered them to produce the response. After years of stress, they had to wait for months and months. They were anxious, they were frustrated, and they were angry. And rightly so, the government's obfuscation and delay showed real contempt for the community. Finally, when the response did come, it was lukewarm, it was non-committal, and in some, res some respects, completely disrespectful. As the community group Coalition Against PFAS state in their submission to this inquiry, the committee made nine recommendations and called for immediate action. They are broadly sensible recommendations which avoid piecemeal of half-hearted approaches. Those inquiry recommendations have not only been ignored, the communities who fought for them have been. It is these communities that I am fighting for as well. They must get justice. And once again, I want to thank and acknowledge community members and community groups across the country who have been organizing on PFAS issues. They include the Fullerton Cove Residents Action Group, the Williamtown and Surrounds Residents Action Group, Communities Against PFAS, and many brave individuals and families. They are exhausted. Frankly, the onus should never have been on the victims to fight for justice when it's their lives that have been upended. It's the polluter, and in this case, the federal government, that must take responsibility for the contamination and its consequences. It must have been a relief for some communities to finally reach a settlement with the government over PFAS contamination. Um, the $212.5 million settlement points to the serious loss experienced by affected communities and will go some way to alleviating the damage. However, there are many who have been affected by PFAS contamination who the government has left out in the cold. In light of this settlement, it's extremely disappointing that in its long-awaited inquiry response, the government refused to commit to even considering compensation for all affected property holders, including through possible buybacks. Polluter pays is a basic principle of environmental law and justice. While the government says it supports resolution of legal claims by agreement, not litigation, where appropriate, we are still waiting to see if they actually mean that. In evaluating the government's response, communities keep telling us that they are concerned about the lack of commitment from the government to providing compensation for property owners for losses resulting from contamination. This is unacceptable. The government must take responsibility for their actions. Um, this should not have to play out in the courts, but should be driven and coordinated by the government acting in good faith with communities. The committee in its second progress report, which has just been tabled, has again recommended that the government prioritize assisting property owners and businesses in affected areas through compensation for financial losses associated with contamination emanating from defense bases, including the possibility of buybacks. The matter of buybacks is really important. The reality is that the effects of PFAS contamination are not fully known yet, and we know that some properties will be significantly affected. There are no options but for compensation to include buyback. The government is responsible for the pollution, and I strongly encourage the Commonwealth Government to urgently develop a buyback program for properties where contamination is significant. Communities are still concerned about the lack of consistency and a piecemeal approach to PFAS management. They have ongoing worries regarding contamination on non-Commonwealth sites as well. There is also ongoing concern about site investigations and the timeliness, effectiveness, and responsiveness of PFAS management area plans, which are the responsibility of defense. As the committee has noted, 
For people residing near defense bases, the protracted process of investigation and site assessment and the disjuncture between Commonwealth and state and territory responsibilities leaves people like those near Richmond, RAAF, and Williamtown, which is in my home state of New South Wales, um, living in a PFAS half-life of restrictions, but without the benefits of coordinated remediation plan or support services within PFAS management area plans. It is not acceptable for defense to say that they will continue to use PFAS containing forms until certified alternatives to existing firefighting forms become available. As I understand it, alternatives are already available and being used right here, right now in Australia. In their submission to the inquiry, the United Firefighters Union of Australia note that the Melbourne Metropolitan Fire Brigade began trialing fluorine-free forms in various firefighting situations in 2011, and by 2014, all M MFB firefighting appliances were converted uh, for carriage of fluorine-free B-class forms only in their form tanks. This should be happening across Australia without any delay. This is people's lives and livelihoods that we are talking about and putting at risk. The risk can and should immediately be eliminated. The committee recommends that the government expedite the work to ban the use of, uh, contain, and ultimately safely destroy long-chain PFAS-based firefighting forms, including those containing PFOS, PFOA, and PFH excess, with the objective of urgently ratifying the listing of PFOS and expediting the proce process of PFOA and PFH excess in the event that they are listed under the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. Other countries have done this years ago. There is no reason for this government to keep delaying this ratification into the never-never. Overall, the government still needs to do a lot more. If the government cares about the community, if they care about our environment, they should urgently accept and act on all recommendations of the report in full. Communities have waited long enough. They have suffered long enough. It is time to take concrete action to support and help them. Thanks, Senator Pruki. Do you seek leave to? Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I present the second interim report of the Community Affairs References Committee on Centrelink's compliance program, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Throughout the operation of RoboDebt, as the Centrelink compliance program is commonly known, hundreds of thousands of people have been forced to participate in a distressing, difficult process of reconfirming the earned income that they had already reported to Centrelink, in some cases up to seven years earlier. The huge scale of the program's impact cannot be ignored, and there remain many questions about how income averaging was established and allowed to operate for so long before it was found to be unlawful. The Prime Minister's qualified uh, apology um, in, fact, uh, in June did in fact nothing to fix the hurt and harm or very little uh, to fix the hurt and harm caused by robo-debt. The committee is tabling this second interim report today because we are in, not in a position to finalise our inquiry into the income compliance program. This is partly because um, the evidence sought by the committee relating to the legality of the income compliance program has not been provided by the government and department because of claims of public interest immunity. I will be reporting separately on those claims. Um, we have also um, had trouble because of uh, the COVID pandemic from being able to hear from um, witnesses uh, during the inquiry um, because we have been un unable to hold face-to-face um, -face hearings and because of the nature of the evidence to this inquiry, um, I think it's very important that we hear um, from people and also people are sometimes reluctant to uh, give that sort of very confronting ev um, evidence um, on video uh, conference. But that is not to say that we haven't been having uh, hearings, but it's with um, the agencies. 
The uh, evidence that we sought um, from the government, particularly from uh, Services Australia, um, was um, a, a lot of that is based on the uh, uh, concerns around the ongoing court case around robo debt, and as I said, I will report on that um, to the chamber in a, in a separate report. We have learnt that raising debts on the basis of income averaging is unlawful and never should have occurred in the first place. Throughout this inquiry, we have heard uh, devastating. Um, we've heard about the devastating human cost of the income compliance program, as I said, commonly known as robo debt. Themes of disempowerment, disempower overwhelming stress and emotional upheaval continue to be common in accounts and submissions from individuals and community organisations. Robo-debt has had an overwhelming and devastating impact on people's emotional and financial wellbeing and willingness to engage with and trust government services. For many people, repaying a robo-debt they were alleged to owe has resulted in considerable financial hardship and pushed them further into poverty, making it difficult to make ends meet. Individuals felt uh, powerless to dispute letters or debts from Centrelink and wore people down. Even after changes were made to the robo-debt initiation letters and debt notices, people still reported feeling confused and distressed by the debt correspondence from Centrelink and often still called the initiation letter um, debt letters, hence um, quite often leading to uh, confusion, particularly when corresponding with the department. Under the program, the garnishing of tax returns became uh, a commonplace for the recovery of outstanding debts. People have no notice that this is coming and felt um, blindsided. And in some instances where people had already arranged to repay the debt in instalments, the tax return was still garnished. We heard from people who were pursued by external debt uh, collection agencies, in some cases live in fear of debt collectors and law enforcement agencies because of their compliance debt. Um, that is extremely confronting hearing um, when people are faced with those uh, realities. Evidence heard in the committee so far has shown that the implementation of the income compliance program continues to have a disproportionately negative impact on people in vulnerable cohorts. Robo-debt, as it is commonly known, um, has also had ongoing negative impacts on the community sector and Centrelink staff. Despite significant criticisms from the start of this program, it has taken nearly five years for the government to admit that income averaging as it is used under the program is not sufficient legal evidence of the existence of a debt. It is unlawful. In that time, nearly half a million debts have, have been raised against, and raised against and pursued from some of the most vulnerable members of our community without a proper legal foundation. The committee will continue to monitor the, the repayment process and are pleased to see, in fact, that there has been significant progress in um, repaying some of uh, those debts. There are still a, some, some of those that are yet to be repaid and some people that have uh, not responded to the uh, outreach by the department, and we we've, uh, make a recommendation about that. The committee makes some uh, recommendations in this interim report. These recommendations go go towards ensuring that the hurt and harm from the income compliance program uh, doesn't happen again and is uh, addressed. Firstly, we, we uh, recommend that we uh, terminate, immediately terminate the income compliance program. The government is leaving the door open and has not ruled out further income compliance programs, which is causing further distress um, to many people. Secondly, it is critical that the government ensures its communication strategy relating to the repayment of unlawfully raised compliance debts takes into consideration the additional needs of and provides support to vulnerable populations. Thirdly, the committee recommends Centrelink immediately allocate more staff to focus on contacting customers who have not engaged with the refund program uh, process. We've heard that there's uh, a, quite a, a large number of these people who have yet to respond. Fourthly, the committee recommends that, the, that Centrelink immediately review its evidentiary responsibilities for raising overpayment debts in all of its compliance programs. 
Fifthly, the committee recommends that an independent review is immediately initiated into the policy, design, administration and impact of Centrelink's compliance program. We believe that this is um, the um, majority report or the, the chair's report. Um, believe that the independent review um, is uh, necessary and I um, personally believe that we should be doing a forensic audit of these debts. Um, this program undoubtedly caused in, in, incalculable harm, distress and anxiety to hundreds of thousands of Australians. The refund program um, while now significantly progressed, is in fact causing some people um, additional trauma. I would like to express my sincere thanks and admiration for everyone who has given evidence to the committee so far. Sharing your accounts has been invaluable for us. The committee is inviting new submissions to the inquiry, especially around the issues of legality and the impact of the reverse onus of proof, the impact of changes to the, uh, to the income compliance program on individuals and the future of the Centrelink compliance activities and programs. We are also always interested in receiving personal accounts and evidence about the experience of people who have, who have been impacted by the the income compliance program or other Centrelink compliance activities based on averaged income. Uh, the program, the, the uh, committee, as always, would like to thank um, our secretariat, um, who do such important and valuable work for the support that they have given us and the support in um, preparing this report. We um, look forward to completing this inquiry. I mean, it is being um, slowed down by the uh, claims of public interest immunity, which is unfortunate. And I maintain that the role, the, this is the, the second inquiry into uh, Centrelink uh, compliance program, income compliance program. And I maintain that this issue would never have come to light without a significant, the overwhelmingly um, strong uh, community campaign and the work of so many people and organisations that have worked to shine a spotlight on this unlawful program. I would uh, recommend having a look at this report. I look forward to completing uh, this inquiry in the future. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. And uh, any other senators wishing to speak on reports? In that case, are there any ministerial statements? No. Committee membership. The president has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you. I move that contingent upon uh, Ms Lydia Thorpe being chosen to be a senator to fill the vacancy in the representation of Victoria, she be appointed as a participating member in accordance with the list circulated in the chamber. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? No. The ayes have it. Thank you. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Amendment, Jabiru Bill 2020, for concurrence. Minister. I move this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. Question is that the bill be read a first time. All those in favour say aye. Against? The ayes have it. Clap. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the town of Jabiru and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. All those in favour say aye. Against? The ayes have it. Thank you. Okay. Clark. Business of the Senate notice a motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, for the disallowance of the Industry Research and Development Water for Fodder Program Instrument 2019. 
Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to this motion of disallowance. This has been a matter oh, sorry, that has sorry, been. Excuse uh, me, Senator Hanson Young, you need to move the um, oh, disallowance yes. first. So I uh, seek leave to move the motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak to this motion of disallowance into the Water for Fodder program. Now, this was a program uh, that was um, thought up. Uh, it was a bit of a thought bubble of uh, the Prime Minister. Didn't know what to do uh, to uh, deal with um, those who were complaining that his government uh, and his coalition partners in the National Party had stuffed up the management of the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, as the um, drought uh, drew on last year and got harsher and harsher, and yet this government had done nothing uh, to make sure that uh, their uh, New South Wales counterparts, their Queensland counterparts and indeed even their Victorian counterparts um, did what they could to ensure sustainable use of uh, the limited amount of water in the Murray-Darling Basin. Uh, rather than doing anything to fix the problem, um, they went in for what they thought was an easy answer. And what is that, Madam Acting Deputy President? That's cutting South Australia's water supply. That's cutting the allocation that flows over the South Australian border. This program uh, was designed to reduce South Australia's water by 100 gigalitres and to say that uh, that water would then be packaged off uh, and sold uh, at a cheaper rate uh, for farmers further upstream who needed water in the midst of the drought. Now, rather than, rather than accessing water from further upstream from those who had already been too greedy, the government decided to pick on South Australia at the bottom of the system. Now, we know that this was happening at the same time as the government in South Australia, the Liberal government in South Australia had worked with uh, the federal, uh, environment, uh, federal Water Minister to commission a report into uh, cutting South Australia's water supply permanently and replacing it with uh, water from the desal plant. What does this mean, Madam Deputy President? This means that South Australians would be saddled with some of the highest water bills in the country. This would mean South Australians would be paying more than 40 times the market value for water—40 times—because this government and their national coalition partners in the various different state governments were, could not be bothered putting in place the recommendations and the reforms that have been needed for far too long to make sure that the water in the Murray-Darling Basin is managed sustainably and that there is enough there in the dry times as well as the wet. Now We know that the Murray-Darling Basin plan is uh, almost halfway through now, and we are still well short of the actions that were required to make sure the Murray-Darling was put on a sustainable footing. Billions and billions of dollars has been spent on this reform. And yet we are staring down the barrel of this government having to announce very soon that they're not going to be able to make the deadlines promised and set out in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. I remember back in 2010 when we were debating the draft of this plan, and it was those on the opposite side, spearheaded, of course, by the former spokesperson and person in charge of water for the coalition. That was, of course, Mr Barnaby Joyce, who never wanted any reference to climate change in the Murray-Darling Basin, would not accept that the system is over-allocated and did not accept the science. He did everything he could, everything he could, with his Nationals mates and his big corporate irrigator mates, to destroy that plan and to make it as difficult as possible for us to to recover the water that the environment needs. Fast forward to 2020, a decade later, billions of dollars have been spent, and the reason we've got this program before us today is because they stuffed it up, because they didn't listen to the science. They spent all the money. Some of it, of course, went to some of Mr Joyce's mates. Some of it went to companies like that who, like that's established by 
Minister Angus Taylor. A lot of the money went to friends of the National Party. And where did all the water go? Well, the water continues to be siphoned off, stored in big private dams, harvested at the expense of neighbours and downstream communities. The only reason this Water for Fodder program is even on the table is because this government is crap at managing the Murray-Darling Basin. Incompetent, incapable. But what do you do when you've stuffed up the process, you've spent billions of dollars and you still don't have a management system of a river that is choking and thirsty and crying out for intervention? And you've got farmers, small family farmers throughout the basin. It's not their fault the government stuffed it up. It's not their fault that the government did everything they could to make sure the big corporate irrigators were okay, but everybody else was left high and dry. So what did the government do? Well, they said, oh, well, the bottom end of the river, they don't need as much. So they came to South Australia and argued that South Australia should have 100 gigalitres less and that South Australians should be paying for it through the desal plant, 40 times the market value. The government's own report into this Water for Fodder program finally released, despite the fact that this place in the Senate only months earlier asked for the documentation to be tabled. The government refused. Another sign that this government continues to cover up their stuff-ups time and time again. They refused to release that report. It did come out finally. And what does it say? It says this program is a flop. It's a flop. They also released it at the same time as a feasibility study into, the, into South Australia's desal plant. Turns out that's a flop too. So no wonder we've got a disallowance before us today, because this government can't manage the Murray-Darling Basin. It's too busy filling the tanks and the dams of their big corporate mates and friends of the National Party. Meanwhile, small communities, downstream communities and fa small family farms are left high and dry. No wonder there are communities right throughout the Murray-Darling Basin who are turning their backs on the National Party. No wonder the National Party are scrambling around trying to work out why everybody's deserted them. It's because they have mismanaged the nation's biggest river system from, from year after year after year. And what do we know is coming next? There's a Water Minister's Council meeting in December, and we're going to have New South Wales and Victoria, probably Queensland as well, all refuse again to find that remaining 450 gigalitres that is needed if we're to give this river a fighting chance of survival. And we'll hear all over again that these state governments cannot get their house in order to deliver the water. There'll be a push to blow out the time frame of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan—$13 billion down the drain. The, min the mismanagement, the maladministration, the stuff-ups that have been overseen by this government in the Murray-Darling Basin are just, if it wasn't so sad, it would be laughable. And when the coalition came to power, the biggest mistake the Liberal Party made was by putting the Nationals in charge of the water portfolio. We could all see it coming. We all knew it was a big mistake. And yet, what did Tony Abbott do? He handed the keys to the Murray-Darling Basin and the coffers of public money to Mr Barnaby Joyce. And where are we today? We're up the creek, high and dry, because Barnaby Joyce cannot be trusted, the National Party cannot be trusted, and this government 
cannot be trusted with managing the nation's most important water supply, and they certainly can't be trusted to look after the environment and the environmental flows. So we will push through with this disallowance. And I'll, as, a, as a South Australian senator, it is the responsible thing to do, because it shouldn't be left up to South Australia to carry the can because of the mismanagement of the federal Liberal National Party and the corruption and the maladministration of the New South Wales, Queensland and Victorian state governments, who have done nothing to rectify this situation and to make sure that the reforms that science requires are implemented in full. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Um, I believe Senator Roberts was asking for the call, so I'll go to Senator Roberts and then to you, Senator Davies. Senator Roberts. The people of Queensland and Australia, as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I will be opposing this motion. The first 40 gigalitres of the Water for Fodder program has already been distributed. Farmers have used that water to grow fodder for their cattle to keep our struggling dairy sector in business. If this disallowance is successful, it may well have the effect of preventing the second 60 gigalitres of water. It will, however, cast into doubt the legality of the first 40 gigalitres. That's not something that One Nation can support. This scheme fired up the desalination plant in Adelaide to produce water that was exchanged for irrigation water in the Northern Murray. The Adelaide desalination plant has been a disaster. It was built in 2007 at a cost of $1.83 billion. In the 13 years since, the plant has produced just 148 gigalitres of water, about 10 per cent of its capacity. Even worse, for a state that is power poor, the plant takes $13 million a year in electricity just to keep it maintained. Yet another example of an economy killer from climate alarmism. But getting back to the water issue, I can understand the government was looking for an excuse, any excuse, to send some love down to that money pit in South Australia. So when One Nation demanded time and time again that farmers get their allocations, the government cooked up this scheme. It would have been simpler to just give farmers another 10 per cent of their water allocation. But no, why do things the easy way? Not when you had a white elephant sitting down there needing a cash injection. So here we are with another, one, another 60 gigalitres due under the Water for Fodder program. So what to do, Madam Acting Deputy President? What to do, I ask the people of Australia? The, people, the, the government has produced a report into the first release. I thank the minister for providing a copy of this report, this report in response to my motion for production of documents. That report clearly recommends that the second 60 gigalitres of the Water for Fodder program not proceed. This is based on predictions for water inflows into the Adelaide catchment provided by the Bureau of Meteorology. Not surprisingly, these predictions were wrong. Adelaide has way more water in storage now than the report produced in July anticipated. Way more. After a year of rain, there is currently 5,200 gigalitres of water in storage in the Upper Murray, and that is expected to continue to increase. I believe the projection is around 6,500 gigalitres. Lake Victoria, which holds South Australia's water supply, is full. The lower lakes are full. The water in the Menindee Lakes is still there from the recent flood in southern Queensland. And that's a pleasant change because no government fish kills this year. South Australian farmers have the water for 100 per cent allocations this year. Conveyance water for South Australia is 1,400 gigalitres. This is held in Dartmouth Dam, which currently holds 2,123 gigalitres. So Senator Hanson Young should be pleased to know South Australia is taken care of, well, well taken care of. Let us look at the irrigation areas that would have received the second 60 gigalitres under the Water for Fodder program. The Murray is banking along its entire length. The Mawala and National Channels have been pressed into service. Not to take this water to irrigators to run it around the Barma Choke and take the pressure off the water. Most of this flow will simply go to the South Indian Ocean, the, South, the Southern Sea go out to sea. There is nowhere left to store it. It'll just be going to the ocean. However, irrigators in the Upper Murray, 
in New South Wales and Victoria have not had their water allocations. Yet again, another year not had their allocation. Allocations are mostly 8% with some areas moving up to 40%. That's it. And yet Australia is still importing wheat and rice because farmers are not getting their water allocations. How much more water do we need to have in the dams before we let farmers have some? Inflows into the Murray-Darling Basin this year are right on long-term average. There is no reason for farmers to not get their full allocations. We have an economy that has been devastated by COVID restrictions. Our G GDP is going to be down billions. Jobs are being lost. Farmers could help save the economy if they get the water, their water. The difference between starving farmers for water and giving them their legal water allocation is more than $10 billion in agricultural output. $10 billion. 1,000 gigalitres of the 5,200 gigalitres in storage would have a dramatic effect on our economy. It would save jobs and save massive social security payments while bringing in foreign export earnings. It would save communities. What a bargain. Give our families their water. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Davey. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to agree with uh, one thing that Senator Hanson Young said, and that is that um, this government doesn't manage the Murray Darling Basin because we don't manage the Murray Darling Basin. We don't manage water allocations. We don't manage planned environmental water. The only thing that the Commonwealth does is manage held environment to water, which is also at the mercy of state water management rules and state water allocations. So I urge Senator Hanson Young to read the report developed by Mick Kilty earlier this year, which clearly outlines the different jurisdictional arrangements and the complexity of managing the Murray Darling Basin. What this government is doing is continuing to implement the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, which we inherited from the former Labor government. What this, bill, this disallowance motion before us today does, which actually has nothing to do with the Basin Plan but everything to do with what our government did to address the concerns and the struggles of irrigators in the Southern Connected System. We negotiated an arrangement with the South Australian government to, where possible, free up some water that we could put on the market, which is the only mechanism available to the Commonwealth government. We cannot allocate water. We don't have water to allocate. The market is the only mechanism we can use, and we made, in the first tranche, 40 gigalitres available. It was a highly successful program. That 40 gigalitres was distributed to 800 farmers, 800 farmers who were restricted to using the water to produce food and fodder crops to support livestock in the midst of the worst drought that our country has seen in a very long time. This at the same time that South Australia saw 900 gigalitres of water extra over and above their entitlement flows flow over the border into South Australia, nearly 700 of which flowed out to the Indian Ocean, as Malcolm, Senator Malcolm Roberts has just alluded to. Now, I have no issue with that extra water flowing to South Australia, but it is quite understandable that irrigators in Victoria and New South Wales who are on low or zero water allocations ask why. And it is quite right that when an opportunity arises at a time when temporary water prices are between seven to nine hundred dollars a megalitre and well out of the reach of fodder producers, that when the government offers a product at hundred dollars a megalitre, they raced for it. There were over four thousand applications, which shows that this was a program that was strongly desired. In the Review: 68% of survey respondents supported the program, and uh, more than 70% said they would actually participate again. 
Remember that this program was developed at a time when storages in the Southern Connected Basin were only 38 per cent. Today, thankfully, storages are at 58 per cent. What the government has done is put the second tranche of this program on hold, which is right, because thankfully we have had rain this year. We have seen water prices on the temporary market drop to between $150 to $250 a megalitre, depending on where you are in, in the Southern Connected system. We have allocations this year. In my home region of the New South Wales Murray, I'm pleased to say allocations have reached 12 per cent today. But as Senator Roberts rightly said, South Australia are on 100 per cent, as they are every year. They hold an extra 300 gigalitres over and above what they normally use in storage in what's called deferred water. Uh, South Australia has plenty of water. The environment now has allocations. They can use their water to deliver for the environmental needs um, as per their long-term environmental watering program. No one suffered through the rollout of this program. South Australia did not lose water. They finally got the opportunity to test their desal plant. They did not lose water. The South Australian government made money. They were at no cost loss out of this program. Farmers benefited out of this program because they could access water, grow the food and, fibre that, uh, food and fodder that they needed and were able to put some of that fodder onto the market to help drought-stricken farmers across the whole eastern seaboard, not just the southern connected basin. So, I do not see any purpose or any reason to disallow what was a very successful program that was fit for purpose and right for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davies. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Well, it's hard to keep track of all of the programs that the government has uh, managed to announce with a great big announcement and a lot of fanfare. Uh, only to see the actual delivery fall a long way short of what's promised. We can just add this one to the list because, of course, when Minister Littleproud first went out and started talking up this program, he said that up to 6,000 farmers could be supported by this program. Well, we had a chat about this at the Cross Portfolio Estimates back in February. Do you know how many people were actually able to be assisted by this program? At that point, 800. And I asked the officials how could this come about, that a minister would go out and say 6,000 farmers all getting extra water, and then in the end the number was 800, which is a much, much smaller number, even those on the other side I think would have to agree. And the explanation given to me was so Jackie, what are the we program doing design was modified somebody? after the first announcement so that a slightly volume of water, larger volume of water was made available under the program guidelines. Sounds like a pretty big mess, doesn't it? Because what happened? There's a decision to put out a press release, because that's where all decisions start with this government, a decision to put out a lazy press release, having done none of the work, and in this case, apparently not having even really determined in any meaningful way with officials about how this thing was going to be delivered. And I asked uh, the minister who was representing at that time, Senator Dunningham, I said, what happens when a minister goes out and says, I've got a program for 6,000 people, but in the end it's only for 800? And Senator Dunningham said, then, when officials do some further work and other models are adopted, it is consultation. Well, that's not really how policy and program development is supposed to work. What you actually are supposed to do is identify the problem, do some consultation and then make the announcement. But like everything else with this government, it's all about the announcement and the follow-through is dreadful. At the beginning of this year, Mr Pitt was out there saying, my strong view is that we'll deliver exactly what we said we would, and that's 100 gigalitres in the Water for Fodder program. This was the revised version. 
But on 7 August, the ABC reported that the federal government has walked away from plans to deliver 100 gigalitres of water to farmers to grow food for their livestock, uh, indefinitely deferring a decision about the future of the Water for Fodder program. Again, a lot of big talk, a lot of assurances, but the reality falls far short. Now, the disallowance before us doesn't deal with these problems. In fact, Labor's concern is that the disallowance that the Greens ask us to support would actually make the situation worse by generating risk and uncertainty in a system that is already struggling with questions of compliance. And the specific thing that we would point to is the possibility that this disallowance motion, if passed, would have the effect that the Commonwealth would lose their capacity to ensure compliance and enforcement. Now, compliance and enforcement is obviously key to the integrity of any program. It is particularly significant in the Murray-Darling Basin. Labor is not inclined to support a disallowance that jeopardises enforcement arrangements. The government does need to be able to check that the water is actually being used for fodder in the Water for Fodder program. And I do note again that when we talked about this in estimates earlier in the year, the department told me that the enforcement and compliance arrangements were not yet in place. And I look forward to hearing from government about the enforcement and compliance arrangements that are put in place to make sure that this program works in the way that they say it will do. More broadly, there is a problem with the government's administration of the Murray-Darling Basin. Scandal after scandal after scandal plagues their management of this critical system. Labor established the Murray-Darling Basin Plan because we want a healthy working river and we want it to work for graziers. We want it to work to manage the environment. We want it to work for irrigators. We want it to work for First Nations people. and We want it to work for the communities along the rivers of our basin. The reckless approach to water management taken by successive ministers, aided and abetted by the National Party, is a national shame. And like much else that's happened under this government under the last seven years, it falls well short of the big promises that they like to make to their constituencies. The government needs to get its act together. The Murray-Darling Basin is a precious national asset. Stakeholders all across the basin and indeed all across the country depend on it. We can't allow the mismanagement to continue. Thank you, um, Senator McAllister. So, the, uh, are you speaking on this matter too, yes. Minister? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, the government obviously won't be supporting disallowance. The Industry Research and Development Water for Fodder Program 2019 is a regulation that allows the Commonwealth to ensure compliance with arrangements agreed by landholders who receive water under the Water for Fodder program. Round one of Water for Fodder has offered 40 gigalitres of water in 50 megalitre parcels to 800 farmers. It is a measure to help farmers to grow fodder, silage and pasture in the Murray-Darling Basin, and the water is not allowed to be traded for profit or used on non-fodder crops. A decision on round two will be announced soon. Thank you, Minister. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Uh, I call the clerk. Oh, we'll do it. Well, there was a late message, so we'll do that. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives agreeing to the Senate resolution varying the resolution of appointment of the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System relating to an extension of time for the committee to report. I'll call the clerk now. Business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 2, standing in the name of Senator Steele-John relating to a reference to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee. Senator Seward. Oh, um, sorry, could I seek your guidance? Yes. Um, so we're dealing with. Um, yeah, yep. it's just do I need to move it in order to get Senator Steele yes. John? Yes. yes. Okay, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I ask that. Uh, I'm not asking, sorry. 
Um, um, that, so you, that you, I ask the yeah. business of the Senate notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator Steele John for today. I'm not asking for it to be to be brought on for debate, please. Because I'm not yeah, So you're just moving the motion. I'm just moving the motion. And then we'll go to Senator Steele John. Senator Steele John. I'm assuming you're uh, seeking the call. You. Yep. Yes, yes, sorry, yes. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy. Thank you, Madam President. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, last year, the, um, the Liberal, National and Labor parties uh, voted together to pass uh, legislation that implemented the Australia-Hong Kong Free Trade Agreement. Uh, they did this in the sat shadow of a most serious crackdown in Hong Kong uh, over strong objectives, uh, objections from civil society and uh, the union movement. It's worth recalling uh, the situation at the time. Uh, China's President Xi had just said of Hong Kong protesters, anyone attempting to split China in any part of the country uh, will end uh, in crushed bones uh, and shattered limbs. Uh, we had witnessed brutal months of on dissent, as p the people of Hong Kong called uh, for things uh, that we here uh, take for granted in Australia. Things as basic as universal suffrage. Protesters had faced uh, anti-democratic emergency powers to ban face masks. They had faced uh, tear gas and live bullets from police. Thousands had been arrested with children as l young as 12 uh, being among those uh, convicted. Now, in J. Scott's inquiry into the treaty, the ACTU uh, said the following. Given the escalating events taking place in Hong Kong at the moment, the ACTU calls on the government to wait until the situation is resolved uh, before proceeding with the enabling legislation of the Australia-Hong Kong uh, Free Trade Agreement. They went on, uh, we feel it is important that we show solidarity with protesters and our support for human rights, civil society and the rule of law in Hong Kong before we decide uh, how to proceed with a free trade agreement. Hong Kong activists called on MPs to do something very simple. They were asking Parliament to consider human rights and not proceed with the FDA at the time while they were being violently suppressed. Hong Kong Watch said in its submission, and I quote, in light of the erosion of freedoms and the rule of law in Hong Kong, we are, uh, which are important pillars uh, for Australian business, it is therefore imperative for the government to take action to ensure adequate consideration of human rights issues during future uh, trade agreement negotiations and include rights protections clauses in the Australia-Hong Kong free trade agreement, including uh, suspension clauses uh, to suspend an agreement if core human rights standards are not met and backed by an effective enforcement mechanism through parliamentary scrutiny and the monitoring of human rights compliance by both parties uh, to the trade agreement. Now, the response of the major parties to these concerns and abuses uh, occurring in Hong Kong at the time uh, was to push through the ratif ratifying legislation uh, through the parliament. They even refused Green's amendments uh, that would have delayed the implementation of the agreement by at least one year to allow us to monitor the situation as it developed. Indeed, they insisted that the implementation of the FDA would in fact strengthen Hong Kong's autonomous status within the one country, two systems framework. If you now navigate uh, to the FDA, FDA section of the DFAT homepage, the government still confidently tell browsers uh, that the deal reaffirms the value of Australia's, Australia uh, places on the degree of economy enjoyed by Hong Kong through the one country, two systems framework. Since the passage of the legislation Last year, however, the situation in Hong Kong has become even bleaker. A few months ago, uh, the Chinese government endorsed and adopted uh, the national security law for Hong Kong, the most aggressive assault on Hong, Kong, uh, on Hong Kong's people's freedoms uh, since the transfer of sovereignty in 1997. 
governments around the world, including Australia, strongly criticised the laws as fundamentally undermining the one country, two systems principle and in breach of legally binding uh, declarations such as the joint declaration signed by China and the United Kingdom. The passage and implementation of the laws marks the end of many of Hong Kong's unique freedoms. It prohibits activities that the Chinese government deem as crimes of succession, uh, subversion and terrorism, uh, and those they consider uh, collusion with a foreign power or force. These so-called uh, crimes are poorly defined and open to interpretation. The law is devastating to Hong Kong's human rights protections. It has created specialized uh, secret security agencies it denies rights uh, to a fair trial, it provides sweeping new police powers and weakens judicial oversight as it uh, in turn increases the restraints on civil society and on the media. In practice, it means that the people of Hong Kong face long jail terms for things as simple as owning banners uh, that authorities do not like or chanting slogans that are deemed to be inappropriate. Hong Kong's teachers, too, are on tentacles. They have been advised that they need to educate students about the new law uh, so that children uh, understand, and I quote, the importance of national security. Books in schools and libraries are being reviewed as we speak to make sure that they do not violate these new laws. Of course, the whole purpose of the national security laws is to stymie dissent. And since the law came into effect, Hong Kong authorities have arrested people uh, for wearing t-shirts and making tweets that are seen to be advocating for independence. They have asserted the right to, to prosecute critics abroad. They have barred pro-democracy candidates from legislative elections and postponed those elections by more than a year. In response to the national security law, the Morrison government suspended Australia's extradition treaty with Hong Kong. Now, the Greens welcomed uh, that move at the time. We were also pleased that the government finally decided to extend uh, visas for some Hong Kongers, although we were disappointed uh, that these actions did not go further, and we urge them uh, to do so. We need more than just extension schemes for some visa categories. What we need is protection for all those in Hong Kong who are at risk uh, from persecution uh, because of the new laws. On top of our existing, that has to be made very clear, this would be on top of our existing uh, humanitarian quotas. And we need a clear statement that so-called crimes, like illegal assembly, will be exempt from the character test. The Greens are also calling on the Morrison government uh, to consider further steps in relation uh, to the serious change in Hong Kong's status. In seeking to refer the Australia-Hong Kong Free Trade Agreement uh, to a Senate committee, we are merely asking the government and the ALP to review the deal in light of the changed circumstances. At the very least, we hope uh, that you will agree that this parliament should be given the opportunity to examine whether Hong Kong's status continues to be sign uh, significantly autonomous uh, to merit this agreement. And we therefore urge you uh, to support uh, this referral. Thank you, Senator Steele-John. Uh, Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, President. Uh, Labor is deeply dismayed about the Chinese government's imposition of national security legislation in Hong Kong, which directly undermines the one country, two systems arrangement. This legislation has curtailed the city's rights and freedoms. Ju and just this week, <coughs> we've seen reports of prominent democracy activists, including Andy Lee, arrested for attempting to flee to Taiwan. We expect Beijing to honour its commitments to the international community and to the people of Hong Kong. In opposing this motion, Labor strongly believes it is in our national interest to signal our support for one, con one country, two systems, uphold the international rules-based order, including through a robust trading system and regional economic engagement, 
and provide certainty and transparency for all Australian businesses operating in Hong Kong. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Hong Kong-Australia Free Trade Agreement provides certainty and transparency for Australian businesses trading and investing in Hong Kong. To terminate the agreement would remove that certainty of the operating environment for Australians doing business with and in Hong Kong. Australia supports a rules-based system that provides recourse for Australian businesses and investors. The Australian government has clearly and consistently expressed our deep concern regarding Beijing's decision to impose a national security law in Hong Kong. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Seawitt on behalf of Senator Steele John be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the noes have it. Um, call the clerk. Business of the Senate, notice of motion number four, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, relating to a reference to the Environment and Communications Legislation Committee. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I move the motion. This, uh, this motion, of course, is in relation to the uh, government's legislation that was um, put into the House of Representatives last week, tabled in the House, that uh, is going to weaken Australia's environmental laws. It's going to weaken the ability for the uh, federal government and the Commonwealth to ensure that we protect Australia's most iconic places, our special species and the wildlife that Australians right around this country and indeed the world um, uh, hold dear. This legislation is a carbon copy of the Tony Abbott bill from 2014, and it's very disingenuous of the government to put forward this bill uh, without, of course, uh, any other process, because we know that the government has been saying for the last few months now that they would be insisting on a piece of legislation that would uh, mirror or at least uh, reflect the recommendations from the Graham Samuel Review. That, of course, is the independent review uh, done into the EPBC Act. That is, of course, the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, the current law that is meant to look after our environment. That review has been 10 years waiting, and it's still ongoing. We haven't got the final report. Uh, the interim report, uh, which was tabled in June, made it very clear that what we need is stronger environmental protection, not weaker, stronger, because our environment is at breaking point. Our environment it is at a point where the decline is so bad that if we don't do something, it is simply unsustainable. The rate of extinction of Australian species is just unimaginable. Climate change, land clearing, pollution is pushing our environment to, to crisis point and our native species into extinction. What we need is stronger environmental protection and an independent watchdog to make sure those rules are put into place, that those standards are upheld. But what this government has done is introduced a piece of legislation that simply hands over powers for approvals to the states and the territories. And why, Madam Deputy President, does the government want to do this? Well, just the same reason they wanted to do this in 2014 under the leadership of Tony Abbott, and it's to make it easier for big miners and big developers to get approval for projects that are going to damage or be harmful to the environment. And the government today is arguing that we need it because of COVID-19. They're doing it under the cover of the pandemic crisis. It is so cynical. It is absolutely cynical and terrible that this government is prepared to sacrifice Australia's already damaged environment, suffering environment, in order to do what it is that these corporations have wanted for a long time, and that's an easy ride through the environmental approval process. Well, this parliament and this Senate needs to stand up to this government and to say that this will go to a proper inquiry. We need to make sure we scrutinise it. It is our job as legislators to do that. And there should be no more passing of a, 
or no more progress of this legislation in this place until there has been a full-blown Senate inquiry. At the very least, we should in fact be waiting until the final report is tabled, which won't be until October the 31st. That's what we should be waiting on. We shouldn't be allowing this government to rush through legislation that is going to trash our environment even more. Heaven knows what happens when there isn't strong enough environment protections, when the states make the decisions. You end up seeing Rio Tinto blowing up ancient Aboriginal artefacts. You see state governments wanting to dam the Franklin or argue for coal seam gas to be expanded in the Northern Territory and New South Wales. We can't trust this government. They want us to just rush this legislation through with no inquiry, with a nod and a wink that it'll all be okay. Well, we don't trust you. This must be inquired into, and this motion must send the legislation you, off Senator to Hanson inquiry. Young, your time has expired. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President. Um, Labor supports this reference to the Environment and Communications Legislation Committee. If ever a government needed scrutiny on environmental management and its legislative agenda, it's the Morrison government. This bill appears to be a rehash of Tony Abbott's failed 2014 Environment Bill, which would harm Australia's natural environment and put jobs and investment at risk. There are no national environmental standards in this bill despite those being the foundation of Professor Graham Samuel's proposed reforms. This bill would see more <coughs> major project job delays, more investment uncertainty, more conflict, less trusted decisions and worst outcomes for the environment. With no proposed standards, no independent cop on the beat and no additional funding for the states despite the extra responsibilities, this bill appears uh, uh, it is uh, designed for political conflict, uh, but it does need further scrutiny. If, the Morrison, if Mr Morrison is serious about securing broad support and durable reform, he would not be rehashing Tony Abbott's failed 2014 bill, breaking his promise on national standards or cherry-picking uh, the interim report of one of Australia's most experienced business regulators. Environment Minister Re um, Susan Lay said in July that the government would in introduce strong, rigorous environmental standards <coughs> that had a buy-in across the board at the same time as introducing proposed uh, legislative uh, change. This government has failed the test it set for itself. In its interim report, Professor Samuel warned against the exact approach the government is now taking. In 2015, the parliament did not support these amendments in response to significant community concern about the ability of, of states and territories to uphold the national interest when applying the discretion um, in approval decisions. Even when presented with an opportunity to provide more certainty for jobs, investment and our environment, Scott Morrison chooses conflict. Labor has constructively engaged with the Samuel Review from the very start. Scott Morrison has uh, very favor favourable conditions for reform, an opposition that has said we will engage constructively, a well-respected re review chair who is working with leaders from agriculture, resources and business, as well as traditional owners, conservationists and academics. The Morrison uh, government should um, <coughs> firstly introduce strong national environmental standards and secondly establish a genuinely independent cop on the beat for Australia's environment. And thirdly, fix the explosion of unnecessary 510 per cent job and investment delays caused by their massive funding cuts. The Samuel Review is the most significant opportunity for environmental reform in the last 20 years, but Scott Morrison is bungling it. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Minister. Uh, thank you. These amendments are minor and technical in nature, but are vital to implementing the decision by National Cabinet without unnecessary delay. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, of course, 
uh, these amendments ought be scrutinised by uh, a Senate inquiry. And it's really important for the Australian people to understand uh, that this government's legislation, this amendment bill, is designed for one thing and one thing only. It's designed to pave the way for our big, greedy, polluting corporations, many of whom pay little or no tax at all, to be able to trash our precious, precious environment with ever-decreasing environmental protections and ever-decreasing scrutiny. This is a government that will always, always go into bat for its corporate donors, for those big corporate profiteers, and it is a government that will never, never stand up yep. for nature. It will never, never stand up and take decent action to address the breakdown of our climate. When will we ever learn? How many more people need to die in floods and bushfires driven by dangerous climate change? How many more people need to lose their properties? How many more people need to have their lives destroyed because we are allowing and facilitating the destruction of nature by the big corporate profiteers? We must do better than this. We already know, thanks to the interim report of the Samuels Review, that the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act is misnamed. We already know, thanks to that review, that it does not protect the environment, that it, that it does not conserve biodiversity. And we know that because Mr Samuels has told us so. And what's this government's response? Come in and weaken environmental protections. Come in and say, we're going to do more to pave the way for the big corporate polluters. We're going to do more to make sure that they can continue to look after the interests of their shareholders above and beyond the need to protect our environment. We have to do better. And I say to the government, how are you going to explain yourselves to your children and your grandchildren? How are you going to look them in the eye and say, in the middle of an extinction crisis, in the middle of a climate crisis, you came in here to weaken environmental protections in Australia? You came in here to destroy the chances of getting strong action to address the climate breakdown. How are you going to look future generations in the eye? And I'll tell you what, you won't be able to. You won't be able to, Order. no matter what Senator Sazelja is uh, mumbling about uh, over in the corner, um, Deputy President, and on he goes again. I don't remember pulling the chain. Senator Sazelja, I don't remember pulling the chain and asking for a contribution from you, because I'm here to speak up for future generations. I'm here to speak up for Order. the threatened species whose Order. habitats you Senator are destroying. Senator McKim, resume your seat, please. Minister, I have called you to order at least three times. I expect you to respond when I call you to order. And um, Senator McKim has the right to be heard in silence. Senator McKim. Thank you. Uh, uh, Deputy President, I'm here to speak up for the threatened species who don't have a voice in this place. Species like the beautiful swift, swift parrot that is being driven to extinction by habitat destruction facilitated by the logging industry, the native forest logging industry in my home state of Tasmania, that beautiful little bird that's now on the IUCN red list because its habitat is being destroyed hundreds of hectares at a time by the brutal, rampant industry that strip mines our native forest down in my home state of Tasmania. That's why the Greens are in this place. And we will never, never go quietly into the night while people like you, the environmental destroyers, the rapers of our planet, 
continue on this dark path that you are on today. Thank you, Senator Kim. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, believe the noes have it. No. Division required. I bring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. The question is the business of the Senate notice of motion number four in the name of Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell her for the ayes. Senator McGrath, tell her for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 23, noes 23. The matter is therefore negative. I thank senators. I have received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the, to the amendments made by the Senate to the Coronavirus Economic Response Package JobKeeper Payments Amendment Bill 2020. I'll call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Payment Times Reporting Bill 2020 and a Related Bill, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Just allow, I'll give the senators a moment to clear the chamber and allow the senators to take their positions. She's kicked out of the division. I'm not sure she knows she's meant to be here. Ah. And in continuation, Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Now, before question time, I began to tell the story of a tradesman from the Gold Coast. His name's Mark. His business is one in which he has hired apprentices and trained them through to being tradesmen themselves. He's taken on subbies and held them for years. He's employed tradesmen. He's grown a business that is one which contributes meaningfully to the community around him. His business works for um, head, head builders in residential construction, and he's a contractor. But even though his name might not be on the, the homes, the signs at the front of the homes that he contributes to building, he's really proud of what he does. In his career, he has seen the industry go up and he's seen it go down. He's seen it ride out the recession we had to have, so called, by a former Prime Minister, um, and he has gone through the great hardship of that late 80s, early 90s period um, and prospered throughout the late 90s and um, through the early noughties. But he has some important feedback for the people who work in this chamber to take into account, and that is that whenever times get tough, whenever cash flow is tight at the head contractor, it's always those further down the chain that bear the brunt. Too many times he has been on the receiving end of a situation where the residential builder for which he is contracted has extended out the payment period for bills that he's owed little by little by little, until 30-day terms have become 60-day terms, have become 90-day terms, have become 120-day terms, without consent, of course. Um, never were the terms the subject of a consent to that kind of extension. And then, sadly, to find that the builder goes under, taking with it sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars but even when it's less than that, even when it's in the realm of tens of thousands of dollars, the hit to his business has been huge. And with it, it has risked the livelihoods of every person who works for him. It's put his house on the line. He tells the story of more than once being in a position where he and his wife have had to be in regular contact with the bank to try and negotiate more time for payments because there just isn't any more room left to wiggle. And he knows how very hand-to-mouth many of the people who have worked for him have lived. He has known how difficult it has been for them to bear it when cash flow gets squeezed in his business because of the manipulations of those further up the chain. The Morrison government cares about people like Mark, listens to their stories and is prepared to act. The Morrison government recognises that cash flow is a key issue for small businesses like Mark's. 
I find in my office I am getting concerns constantly raised with me about the payment practices of bigger businesses because businesses at the small end of the spectrum have staff wages, rent and other overheads that all have to go out, all have to be paid, and a lot of them have a code of great honour about making sure they pay their bills on time. But it leaves them in a vulnerable position when those with greater means, those with um, bigger overdrafts, shall we say, don't do the right thing. And ultimately, the time that small business owners have to spend chasing up bills to get paid is time that they're not investing into doing their job well, it's time they're not investing in training their apprentices, and it's time they're not investing in the future growth of their enterprise. And so this bill is really important. This bill means that there is a requirement for businesses with a total annual income of over $100 million, so people at that bigger end of the spectrum, to publish information about how and when they pay small businesses. So when the head contractor for Mark extends out the time for paying his bills from the agreed terms of 30 days to 60, that'll be something that's on the public record. When it's extended further, that too will be something the subject of reporting. Now, some people will say that doesn't go far enough. Um, Reporting isn't enough to help someone like Mark. Um, reporting alone won't solve this problem. And I take on board that, that concern. But the idea of having transparency about how people are conducting themselves is twofold. One, it means a contractor like Mark knows what they're getting into when they start working for a business. And they can make an informed choice about whether that's the kind of business with whom they want to deal. Now, some might say, we don't always have a, good, a whole lot of choice about these sorts of things. Sometimes we've got to take whatever works on offer. And I accept that too. But the way that this reporting mechanism will make a big difference to people like Mark is that when that head contractor wants to tender for Commonwealth work, the fact of their good or bad reporting record will be a relevant consideration in whether or not they should be brought on board. It's a way that the Commonwealth can lead by paying its bills on time, one very important measure, but also by selecting people with whom to deal whose business practices reflect the values of the small business people in the community that we are here to fight for. And I think that's significant. We know that long payment times hurt small businesses. It stops them from being able to have the certainty of cash flow that means they can take a punt on a new member of staff. It stops them from being able to make significant investments. There's a flow-on effect across the economy when these kinds of practices are engaged in. And if we can speed up the process of people getting paid so that it's done in a more timely way, the benefits are compounding throughout the economy. There's another criticism that's um, potentially able to be made about this regime too. And it's to say this, well, if businesses at the top end um, of the spectrum aren't doing the right thing and aren't paying people on time, well, let's not just make it reporting, let's make it a requirement that they pay on time. And I've heard that argument made by some in the community. But we have the benefit of observing the experience of the imposition of requirements like that in other jurisdictions. Um, in Europe, they have had the experience where in some countries they have introduced a requirement at law that a business must pay within 60 days. Now, at first glance, again, that might sound good, but that had a perverse effect in many ways. It had the effect of making all of those businesses who were paying faster than that time, say 30 days, changing the norms by which they did business to think that all they really had to do was 60 days. And so keeping it flexible, keeping it based on reporting and staying away from imposing a, an inflexible hard requirement allows not just for 
um, the improvement of standards on something more of a voluntary basis, but it also avoids that perverse effect of providing a disincentive to those businesses who want to pay more swiftly. And so I commend this bill. It's a way of us improving the norms by which people do business. It's a way of providing transparency for those businesses that do the right thing and a way of naming and shaming those who do the wrong thing. And it's a way of giving tradesmen like Mark ever improving cash flow, certainty about the bodies which, with whom they are doing business and optimism that they can expect consistency in the business practices with um, the market in which they deal so that they have the confidence they need to be able to take on more apprentices, train more staff, invest in the future of their industry, and that's something from which we will all benefit. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I also welcome the Payment Times Reporting Bill. It is a step in the right direction to support the cash flow of small business in our nation. It's a small step. It's in the right direction, but Labor believes it could be and it can be, with the right amendments, a much better and stronger step uh, to support uh, cash flow for small business. Now We know that the bill before us uh, is a reporting scheme, puts in place a reporting scheme requiring around 3,000 large businesses and government enterprises with turnovers of $100 million and above to report biannually on their payment terms and practices for their small business suppliers. Small business will be defined as businesses with less than 10 million in turnover, and a small business identification tool will be, assist, will be created to assist larger businesses identifying their small business suppliers. Now, we have heard the government argue, just as Senator Stoker argued, uh, in speaking before me, that the purpose of the scheme is to improve payment times for small businesses by making the payment times practices of larger businesses more transparent. <coughs> they've argued, <coughs> I'm sorry, they've argued that transparency uh, is an adequate measure to create the cultural change and pressure on payment time practices in our nation. And I acknowledge the uh, um, consideration that the government might have given to the flaws of uh, overseas schemes that have regulated and mandated payment times, but I think we can and should be a little bit cleverer than that in the way we legislate here on those questions. So this bill puts in place a regulator appointed by the Secretary of the Department of Industry, uh, Science, Energy and Resources. That regulator publishes the reporting entity reports or payment times on a central public register known as the Payment Times Reports Register. That register will include aggregated data on the reporting entities, larger businesses, the larger businesses' payment terms and practices uh, of that identifying uh, entity. Reporting is supposed to begin in January next year, and entities that fail to maintain payment records or provide false information may contravene a civil pe penalty provision. So that is essentially only a transparency measure, and I don't think that's going to be enough to support small business in Australia. As we've heard in the evidence before the Senate inquiry, uh, there are many um, uh, companies that simply don't mind what their public reputation is in these matters, and they actually just leverage off their market control uh, as large companies, and they're able to dictate long payment time terms, even if that's not what is written on the original contract or invoice. Uh, they dictate and move to those long payment times because they can simply afford to string small business along because those large suppliers are not as that those large businesses are not as dependent on the small business as the small business is on the larger business. So we on this side of the chamber are very concerned about what is frankly a light touch when it comes to the nature of payment times and their importance to small business. 
We very much understand cash flow, the survival of small business and how critical prompt payment times are. Small businesses need healthy cash flow. Uh, without them, uh, without good cash flow, and we also see small business already experience much higher um, interest rates from banks, whereas larger businesses have uh, more capacity to raise capital and juggle their finances around. So we have seen, despite the financial flexibility of larger businesses, unfortunately in our nation we've seen some firms take advantage of smaller businesses to boost their own working capital. And indeed, the Small Business Ombudsman gave us evidence of some international companies that simply said, look, it wouldn't really matter what uh, they were forced to report through a regime uh, like this. The overseas company has international policy settings and they will mandate what those payment times are uh, and they can be up to as long as 180 days. So transparency will do diddly squat, really, to manage payment times in those kinds of uh, where you've got an, an over, <coughs> overseas business that mandates uh, the long payment times so they can leverage profits out of it at the expense of small business. Some payment times are indeed unconscionably long, 180 days or more. When coupled with the practice of supply chain financing or reverse factoring, uh, these uh, long payment times become even more obscene in the sense that small businesses who have been forced into a 180-day payment time um, have asked why that should be legal and why anything hasn't been done to stop it. And then they end up being victims to supply chain financing or reverse factoring, where they end up taking a discount on the money that they're owned, owed by um, the company that they've supplied to uh, simply in order to get paid on time or get paid uh, in a reasonable length of time. Behaviour like this, Mr Acting Deputy President, is simply unacceptable. Labor has said this for a long time uh, and we don't believe that this legislation goes nearly far enough in fixing the issue. The member for Fenner, my colleague in the other place, said back in 2016, these large companies, the reason these large companies are squeezing suppliers is simple. It improves their cash flow and makes them money. Even in the current low interest rate environment, there's money to be made from taking your time to pay up. And the reason firms can get away with longer payment terms is straightforward. The reason they get away with it is they are big companies. Now, that was back in 2016. During the COVID crisis, we've heard uh, even further egregious behaviour from large companies such as Premier Retail and Just Group, and they have unilaterally extended payment terms for up to 180, for up to 180 days, which is six months, six months in an environment where small businesses might be struggling and already uh, have their backs against the wall. The Just Group, run by Solomon Liu, this is particularly offensive to smaller businesses, given Solomon Liu, they also told landlords at this time they weren't paying rent. They've accessed JobKeeper. They've reported record profits for the financial year. These are some of the companies who extend payment times simply because it makes them extra profits. Now, when you bring reverse factoring into that, payment times are blown out well beyond 30 days, and a third-party financier steps in to oh, save the day, pay the bill on time, but at a discount. In other words, small businesses must pay to be paid on time. Now, these practices are outrageous, and there is nothing in this bill that actually prevents them. So, what's to say? Oh, yeah, we paid your bill on time. It's here in the. It's it's here. It's paid in the bill. It's uh, we've reported that it was paid on time. Uh, but was it fully paid on time, or was it paid uh, with reverse factoring uh, inside it, so the small business didn't receive what they were owed? In the bill, the definition of supply chain financing and the associated reporting requirements 
are contained in the minister's rules. The draft rules require a large entity to report on whether they use supply chain financing, detail those arrangements and the proportion of invoices paid under such arrangements. So we might not know through this so-called transparency scheme exactly how much of a loss small businesses have faced in order to get their invoices paid on time. And I certainly think uh, that it's problematic that the only reference to supply chain finance is this passing reference of what the minister may include in the rules. We've got no guarantee that a minister won't remove requirements to report on the use of such arrangements on the whim or pressure from proponents of supply chain finance. So it's Labor's primary concern, uh, along with those that I've already outlined, our primary concern is simply that transparency Thank and you, self Senator Pratt. You will be in a continuation, it now being 7.20. I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Sasolja. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, you know, Acting Deputy President, I don't read enough fiction, so I'm always pleased uh, when the member for Fenner uh, puts his pen to paper, as I was uh, just recently when I read a piece that he wrote uh, in none other than the City News here in Canberra. Now, Dr Lee, uh, in his piece of fiction, appeared so determined to distract from the absolute failings of the ACT Labor government uh, that he resorted uh, to accusing the Canberra Liberals, who have the most ethnically diverse group of candidates of any party in the history of self-government in the ACT, of being indifferent to supporting multicultural diversity. Now, of course, unlike ACT Labor, whose candidates are all hand-picked by militant unions uh, like the CFMEU, uh, the Canberra Liberals are proud of the cultural and religious diversity our team offers that reflects the true nature of the city of Canberra, uh, voted on by the most democratic branch of any party uh, in the entire country. But I've got to say I did feel for Dr Lee uh, because he couldn't bring himself. In this work of fiction, I could see what he was doing. He couldn't bring himself to defend the record of 19 years of this ACT Labor government. So I want to take you through. I want to take the, the uh, Senate through uh, what Dr. Lee couldn't bring himself to defend. He couldn't bring himself to defend the fact that we've had to endure multiple education ministers who have failed our education system with overcrowded classrooms, school walls painted with lead paint, the worst rate of violence against students, teachers and principals in the nation and the falling academic outcomes, uh, the legacy of 19 years of ACT Labor running our education system. We've witnessed transport ministers oversee months of chaos as they tore apart the bus network in a revamp that saw 51 schools lose dedicated bus routes and dozens of bus stops around the city going unused. We've seen dodgy land deals uh, with their union masters in the CFMEU, uh, seeing Canberra taxpayers getting the raw end of the deal. In the health portfolio alone, uh, ACT Labor have overseen dodgy data scandals, a culture of bullying and harassment, the highest emergency department waiting times in the country, cutting hospital funding in real terms and a promised hospital expansion that Canberrans have been waiting for since 2010. Last week, horrifying figures were revealed. Children under the age of 16 here in the ACT were waiting exorbitant periods of time for an initial appointment with a specialist. Children in Canberra are waiting 606 days for ear, nose and throat specialists, 874 days for gastroenterology appointments and four years for dermatology appointments. If it wasn't already clear that ACT Labor can't manage health, it's now crystal clear. 19 years of ACT Labor has our children waiting years for initial appointments with healthcare specialists. It's a deplorable record. One ACT Labor should be absolutely ashamed of and proof that ACT Labor can't be trusted to deliver the very basic services we should be able to expect. Uh, this is a basic test of government. 
and over two decades Canberrans have expected and deserved more. Now, it would be remiss of me not to mention the policy that Dr Lee is most proud of uh, from his local co colleagues, and it would surprise no one uh, that it is a disgraceful, inequitable tax grab. In 2020, 2012, then Chief Minister, Senator, now Senator Katie Gallagher, declared that we were masters of spin when we unmasked the Labor's tax grab, which would see the tripling of rates for Canberra families. Well, eight years later, and rates indeed, rates revenue indeed, has tripled, uh, with no sign of the promised cuts to stamp duty. So, under the la leadership of ACT Labor, something Dr. Lee refuses to defend. Uh, Canberra has become the worst place in the country to do business, and the government's support for those doing it tough during the COVID pandemic has been amongst the most miserly in the country. Even the longest-serving Labor leader in the Territory's history, John Stanhope, has said who could possibly uh, vote for Labor or the Greens at the next election, and indeed he has pointed out that they are driving the Territory broke. I am not surprised. Dr Lee refused to defend this appalling record, but after 19 years of this negligent government here in the ACT, Canberrans absolutely deserve better. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Over the last fortnight, we have focused very much on this government's appalling record in relation to aged care, a record that extends the entire seven years that it has been in government. And of course, we have watched with horror as we have seen the tragic loss of over what, 450 deaths, uh, 450 older people in aged care facilities across Australia as a result of COVID-19. It has been right that we have focused over the last couple of weeks on the tragic loss of life in our aged care facilities from COVID-19. But there is another group connected to our aged care sector that it's important that we also focus on and that's the aged care workers who have held this system together over the last few months and, indeed, over the last few years. One of the reasons why I want to raise this tonight is that tomorrow is Thank You Day for aged care workers. It's a day when all of us have an opportunity to say thank you to the aged care workers who are holding our system together and are dedicating their lives to look after our loved ones. Not that long ago, I remember visiting my own grandfather in aged care, and I remember the care that he was provided uh, by loving, caring workers in the aged care system. Uh, and I know that my family was very grateful to the support that they provided. And I know that many of us can say the same things about our own loved ones. Uh, and indeed, over this COVID-19 crisis, while we have seen the terrible loss of life in our aged care sector, what we've also seen is some incredible work from our aged care workers under extremely difficult circumstances. We've known for many years now that aged care work is paid too little, uh, it is too insecure, with so many of the positions being uh, employed on a casual or part-time insecure basis. And that has really come to the fore through COVID-19. The fact that people are paid so poorly for the work that they do uh, and are employed on such an insecure basis has come, come home to bite through COVID-19. But there have been other things that we've observed with the aged care workforce that weren't apparent until COVID-19 hit. We've seen the lack of training provided to aged care workers in infection control, training that people want to receive but simply have not been able to receive. We've seen the shocking failure to provide sufficient PPE masks, gloves and other PPE to ensure that aged care workers are kept safe and to ensure that the people they care for are kept safe. We've seen the shocking understaffing of aged care facilities that, again, we've known for a long, long time but has really become apparent through the COVID-19 crisis. And we've seen the government's shameful exclusion of a large proportion of the aged care workforce from receiving the retention bonus that the government has handed out. So there has been a lot uh, that our aged care workers have, been, have had to put up with beyond uh, just the entrance of COVID-19 into the aged care facilities that they work for. So there is an awful lot that we have to say thank you to for our aged care workers. But it's not enough 
for us to just say thank you and move on to the next day. This COVID-19 has to be a turning point for how we deliver aged care, for how we fund aged care and how we care for our aged care workers. We have known for years that there have been fundamental problems in our aged care sector and that our aged care workforce has been severely neglected, along with aged care residents. And the time has well and truly come for some action to be taken to address the problems that we have seen for so, so long. Now, we keep waiting for this government to come up with some kind of a plan about what it's going to do about the aged workforce to support them, to nurture them and to pay them what they, what they are entitled to. But we haven't seen that plan. And that's one of the reasons why last week the leader of the Labor Party, Anthony Albanese, came out with his own plan on behalf of the Labor Party for what we would do to fix the aged care crisis in this country. It contained eight points, including, most importantly, setting minimum staffing levels for our aged care facilities. This is something that the government has run away from year after year, and it is simply unacceptable that we don't have the required number of staff, nursing and otherwise, uh, and, and personal care staff to care for the aged care residents who need that help. We need to see adequate PPE, we need to see better training and we need to see a lot more for our aged care sector. So thank you to our aged care workers. We're on your side. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On the 15th of March last year, the lives of Muslims across the world changed forever. Our worst fears were realised as an Australian man walked into two mosques and massacred dozens of Muslims at Friday prayers. It was horrific, it was devastating, and it was completely and unspeakably tragic. At the sentencing hearing of the Christchurch terrorists last week, the court heard testimonies from the families of the targets. Aidan Ibrahim Deary provided a statement about his three-year-old son, Ibrahim, who was killed. I don't know you. I never hurt you, your father, mother, and any of your friends. Rather, I am the type of person who would help you and your family with anything. Sarah Qasim spoke about her beloved father, Abdul Fattah, who was killed. I want to hear him tell me more about the olive trees in Palestine. I want to hear his voice, my dad's voice, my Baba's voice. Listening to these statements rips your heart apart. The attack was psychopathic, but was also political and ideological. It was an act of a white supremacist terrorist. It was an act of white supremacist terrorism inflicted on a community that had watched the increasing fervor of a particular populist strain of right-wing Islamophobia and anti-Muslim racism that had percolated for many years and resulted in acts of terrorism and violent, deadly hate overseas. Fervour that had been indulged and platformed in Australia, crossing over into mainstream politics and political commentary. On Thursday, the Prime Minister made a statement in the House about the massacre following the sen sentencing of the shooter. He correctly labelled Christchurch a terrible terrorist atrocity and said that justice had been delivered. This, of course, was welcome, but Mr. Morrison also said all Australians were and remain horrified and devastated by this despicable terrorist act. I wish this were the case, but sadly it is demonstrably untrue. Eighteen months on from the massacre, we should face up to the fact that some Australians were not at all horrified or devastated by what had happened in Christchurch. Let's start in this chamber. One former senator had the utter shamelessness to blame Muslim immigration for Christchurch, calling it the real cause of bloodshed, hardly horrified and devastated. Look further afield, any cursory glance at the online commentary on mainstream news sites following the massacre in March last year would reveal a similar truth, that not everyone was unhappy that the massacre had happened. We owe it to the targets of Christchurch and their families to acknowledge that not enough is being done to face up to this brutal reality. I am one of only a handful of Muslims in this parliament, and I'm the only Muslim in this chamber. My demands are simple. I ask for honesty. I ask for self-reflection. 
and I ask for action. I fear that we have learned very little from the events of last March. Last Friday at the National Press Club, the day after the sentencing, Minister Taj gave a wide-ranging speech about social cohesion in Australia, aside from a reference to the danger of echo chambers. He had only this to say about political extremism, and I quote, there are other challenges to our cohesion that remain, such as Islamic extremism and other forms of extremism and radicalization. Let's consider this for one moment. The day following Christchurch sentencing, when an Australian white supremacist was sentenced to life without parole for the cold-blooded massacre of 51 Muslims, the minister could not even name far-right or white supremacist violence as a challenge that we face. This government must properly acknowledge the existential threat of far-right and white supremacist extremism to Muslims and other communities of color. We need self-reflection. We need accountability. We need to complete this task with the seriousness it deserves. Otherwise, I fear that it will not be too long before I have to get up in this chamber to reflect upon an other day that the lives of Muslims were changed forever. Thank you, Senator. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Protecting the health of the Australian community is our number one priority as a government. There can be no doubt that COVID-19 is with us for the foreseeable future. And when outbreaks occur, as they will, Australians need to have confidence that all of us, state and federal governments, have a plan to deal with isolated cases quickly. We need swift, decisive action at a local level with a local response to ensure the safety of our communities. The one-size-fits-all border closures imposed on regional communities from other states is not a localised target approach. In fact, it has really served to highlight the disconnect that still exists between the city and the country here in Australia. Border communities are being impacted despite the fact there are no community transmissions and in many cases there's been no COVID-19 uh, cases at all in those local communities. While state leaders are engaged in a political game of one-upmanship to garner support amongst capital city voter bases, COVID-19-free border communities hundreds of kilometres uh, from COVID-19 hotspots are being torn apart. There's no medical evidence to support or justify the damage being inflicted on these regional communities. And this needs repeating. When asked by the Senate Select Committee inquiring into the government's response to COVID-19 by Senator Davey, a National Party Senator for New South Wales, what medical advice the border closures impacting regional areas are based on, the Chief Medical Officer did not have an answer. I've written to state pres premiers, every single one of them, asking that exact question. Provide me, as leader of the National Party in the Senate, provide our regional communities uh, across regional Australia the evidence base from a medical perspective that you're using to split these communities asunder and have significant economic, social and health impacts. Because I believe there is none. Decisions made in Melbourne and Sydney, and let's not forget Adelaide, Brisbane and Hobart. I'm not sparing either of the red and the blue team here. They're having untold impacts on border communities, on rural and regional health services, on education outcomes, and even more concerning, untold impacts on emotional and mental wellbeing. Last week, the Senate voted in sport, support of the National Party's motion calling on states and territories to urgently adopt risk-based health approaches based on a clear definition of COVID-19 hotspots. The failure by Labor to support the motion showed they are not interested in standing up for rural and regional Australians and instead are continuing to side with Victorian State Premier Daniel Andrews and his botched quarantine system and failed contact tracing system that has led us to this point. 
We need our national leaders to set and agree on a national standard approach to inbound quarantine with stringent checks and equivalent processing systems that will give us the confidence to learn to live with the coronavirus. I call on state uh, and territory premiers to have a heart and to act in good faith and with common sense at this week's National Cabinet on Friday. Use the evidence available to you. We have to agree on criteria for determining which areas are COVID-19 hotspots. The definition must ensure unnecessary restrictions are not placed on rural and regional areas that are COVID-free and to allow people to continue to work. It is easier to go to work in Melbourne, where we knew there were 12 LGAs that were hotspots in June. It is easier to get to work in Melbourne than to get to work uh, in COVID-free regional communities on our borders. We need practical approaches from our premiers. The Nationals understand the urgency. We live in these regions. We feel the frustration, the mental stress, the fatigue that our community is feeling right now. We're on the brink and we need to get this fixed. We've been talking about this for months, literally months. We need to avoid the human emergencies, the emotional toll and the hardship that we've been seeing. We need to protect all Australians because we actually are all in this together. Thank you. Senator McAllister. Thank you. Anita has been a volunteer at Perth Festival since 2012. In her years as a volunteer, she's helped stuff envelopes, cleared space for an aerial performance and done pretty much everything in between. And as she explained in an interview with the Arts Hub, it wasn't until retirement that I really had time to give more to the things that interest me. I can't act and I can't really sing other than in a community choir, but I love theatre and I love being involved in some way. Egyptian-born Mohammed volunteers to help prepare free meals, cares for the elderly in the community and helps new arrivals to Australia. And last year he told SBS, it's something that makes me feel that I have made a difference, even though it might only be a little difference and might not have a big impact. But if I had made somebody smile, it makes me satisfied that I have achieved something in my day. Anita and Mohammed are just two of the estimated 7.1 million Australians who did volunteer work through an organisation or a group last year. Research some years ago estimated that the time donated by people like Anita and Mohammed contributes some $290 billion to the Australian economy. Volunteers help feed older Australians, they hand out emergency relief packages to families who are doing it tough, they help new migrants make connections, they clean up rubbish from our waterways and they patrol our beaches to keep swimmers safe. But like much of Australian society, volunteering has been impacted by the pandemic. New research conducted by the ANU found that over 65 per cent of volunteers stopped volunteering between February and April this year. And the researchers believe that this is the equivalent of 12.2 million fewer volunteer hours a week. And older volunteers, in particular, were more likely to have stopped volunteering. And it's a problem for many organisations because older Australians are more likely to offer their services as volunteers in the first place. Now, some volunteers are returning as conditions return to normal in some places around the country. But I've been hearing that many organisations are still finding themselves short of the people that they really need to do important work in the community. Volunteering rates were already in decline prior to the pandemic. The ABS asks about volunteering rates as part of the census, and there had been a decline between 2011 and 2016. And it's a shame, because Australia needs volunteers now more than ever. Research shows that volunteering helps build community cohesion, it also helps individuals' mental health. Beyond Blue's lead clinical advisor, Grant, told the ABC the two main benefits of volunteering that can have a big impact on maintaining good mental health are the way it keeps people socially connected and how it provides a real sense of purpose. The federal government's Head to Health program encourages people to try volunteering as a method of self-care. But that's not enough, though. The pandemic has thrown up new challenges for volunteers and the community organisations that depend on them. I am calling on the government to listen to volunteers and to make sure that they have the support that they need to continue giving to the community. Thank you, Senator. Senator Griff. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. The willful neglect, suffering and tragic death of South Australian Anne-Marie Smith shocked us all. And whilst her former carer has now been charged with manslaughter, so many questions remain unanswered. Anne-Marie spent the last years of her life in an almost sedentary state, living in putrid conditions in a cane chair. Further details revealed by police into the circumstances of Anne-Marie's death continue to shock and enrage. With many of her cherished personal belongings missing, large loans taken out in her name, and her car racking up over $2,000 worth of traffic fines, even though she couldn't drive. Anne-Marie, an NDIS participant, was neglected by those paid to care for her in ways that are totally unimaginable. It is hard to comprehend that cruelty so vile could be inflicted on someone so vulnerable. Amory is a person deserving of respect, and yet she was mistreated in such a callous way. Anne-Marie's NDIS provider, Integrity Care SA, was recently banned from operating and had its NDIS registration revoked. And that prevented the organisation from providing services through the NDIS. The NDIS Quality Safeguards Commission has not released the report that formed the basis of that action. Except to say that because of, and I quote, a number of contraventions of the NDIS Act. Now that would have to be a complete understatement. It is imperative that the Commission provides detailed reasons as to why Integrity Care SA has been banned, because incredibly the company can still provide disability care services outside the NDIS framework as well as aged care services. Yesterday, Alan Robertson SC completed the independent review into the circumstances relating to Anne-Marie's death that focused on the NDIS supports and services that were provided to her. The review was conducted in a way so as to not prejudice the current criminal proceedings. No word has been heard by government about the report and I urge the government to release the report as a matter of urgency. South Australians deserve to know the truth about why the system failed Anne-Marie. We need to know this so that we can make informed decisions about whether to engage the services of Integrity Care SA and to make sure this never happens again. Last month I wrote to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner Janet Anderson and Minister Colbeck seeking clarification over whether Integrity Care SA was an approved provider of aged care services and if so to commence the process to ban them from providing aged care services under the Aged Care Act. Regrettably, perhaps not surprisingly, I have not received a reply from either. I have also raised a formal complaint directly with the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission about Integrity Care SA, who happen to be a registered charity. Integrity Care SA and its directors, Alison Virgo, Amy June Collins and Philip Greenland, completely failed in their responsibility to provide oversight and proper care of Anne-Marie. There is no way Minister Colbeck can have any confidence that they can be entrusted with the care of senior Australians. The horrendous catalogue of failures in the care of Anne-Marie leaves no doubt that Integrity Care SA is not fit to provide any type of care services. Thank you, Senator. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Acting Madam Deputy President. I rise to raise again in the Senate my deep concerns about the extreme distress and damage which is being inflicted on Victorians 
during the second wave of emergency restrictions. With now 70 new daily cases in Victoria today, there should have been a roadmap by now to reopen the economy. We need hope. We need a plan. We need a road out. The damage which is being caused is profound. A cost to our economy of an estimated $400 million a day, in total some $10 to $12 billion during the second wave. Treasury estimates up to 400,000 jobs will be lost. The social isolation, the travel bans, the eight o'clock curfew, the border closures, the closed workplaces, all are causing profound damage, including to the mental health of countless Victorians. Our Prime Minister has vowed to tackle this again at National Cabinet on Friday with a COVID hotspot definition, and we hope from the states and territories and from the premiers and first ministers more consistent guidelines and proper exemptions as to the border restrictions which currently exist. Victorians need to get medical advice, need to pick up their kids from school, they need to be able to travel to be with a loved one who's dying from a terminal illness. And as I said to the cross-border commissioner in a meeting I had yesterday, the haphazard and chaotic manner in which all of us are making representations as to particular exemptions uh, is unacceptable and a proper exemption unit must be established in New South Wales so that these cases can be quickly and urgently dealt with. There's now a new 50 kilometre border zone, but that is simply not good enough. A mother, Amanda, living in, in Birigara, needs to know that she can pick up her child from Yanko Agricultural School in New South Wales. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of children who are boarding in schools in Queensland, New South Wales, and other parts of the country that are trapped with the school holidays approaching and they have no certainty as to how they're going to get home or whether they will have a family with their, a holiday with their families. The Victorian government's failure to deliver any sort of plan to reopen the economy is irresponsible, undermining business confidence and causing growing despair. Victorians understand the need for health restrictions including those made using state of emergency powers. But restrictions must be proportionate to the public health risk, justifiable and temporary. Tonight in the Victorian Parliament, Premier Andrews is seeking a six-month extension to emergency powers, vehemently opposed by the state Liberals and Nationals after being stymied on a 12-month extension. I have already raised deep concerns about some restrictions which have closed business on what appears to be arbitrary grounds, including the case of Jim's mowing, gardeners, private gardeners who can outwork in Melbourne, but the same type of work is permitted by council workers. There are too many contradictions, too many inconsistencies. Large construction sites and other large businesses can function almost as normal. And yet a sole trader who wrote to me, Anna, who runs a dog grooming business, and a sole parent who works on her own, in her own home, is prohibited from working. It is absolutely almost destroying her. Victoria is becoming a state of thousands of broken businesses, destroyed jobs, lost livelihoods. Of course, our government is providing unprecedented economic support including through JobKeeper. But this must change. This situation must be fixed. We need a roadmap. We need to reopen the economy. And Premier Daniel Andrews needs to get on and fix this urgently. Thank you. Senator Seward. Acting Deputy President, I rise this evening to talk about the debacle that is the cashless debit card exemption process. Income management has been a racist 
discriminatory tool that the government and the opposition have used when in government and have imposed on First Nations peoples for over a decade since the Northern Territory intervention. The first so-called trials of the cashless debit card started in areas where there was a high population or there is a high population of the community that are First Nations peoples, Sojuna, the East Kimberley and the Goldfields, with the purported goal of tackling drug, alcohol and gambling addiction. Funnily enough, when a trial was later announced for the Hinkler region, the card was meant to target intergenerational unemployment. Amazing that one card could be such a silver bullet for addressing so many complex issues. Labor have unfortunately backed the cashless debit card most of the way, and I was really pleased when they opposed the Hinkler trial um, when that was um, put in place by the government. Great, I thought. We finally listened to the overwhelming evidence showing that income management doesn't work, but yet again I was disappointed. In April 2019, when given the choice to vote against the extension of the Sojourner, East Kimberley and Goldfield so-called trial sites, they in fact opted to keep them going. The government gagged the debate on the legislation that extended the trials um, by, to, by um, another year. Then the government and the ALP told the, and, the, and doing that, the government and the ALP told the community that it was going to be okay because they, they had organised an amendment that would op, with opt-out provisions, where people could just apply for an exemption from the card if they can demonstrate reasonable and responsible management of financial affairs. This amendment was so flawed that the government had to introduce a further amendment to fix the problem. Then it took months to put in place criteria and a form for an exemption process, and there has been no transparency on how this works since then. The exemption process is a complex process, complex forms that many people um, don't even know, and many people don't even know it's an option. And there has been no additional apply, uh, support um, to help people fill, access the form and fill it in despite the fact that all of the trial sites um, or that most of the trial sites are in remote and regional communities where populations um, do not necessarily have English as their first language. So in order to get off the card you have to prove that you can manage your money. But the card itself actually makes it harder for people to manage their money. That's the first problem right there. People on the cashless debit card can't save money by buying second-hand goods on Gumtree, for example, shop on eBay or, mar or Facebook Marketplace, or go to the local markets. Their rent is very often paid late by Inju, and they cop late fees. The problems, in fact, are endless. In many cases, people are being rejected from um, getting off the card as having transactions declined. But if they request to see these declined transactions, the department will not give it to them, and their statements from INJU don't show the declined transactions either. There is no transparency or procedural fairness in this process, and it's just another way that the government has made life harder for people on income support. Since July 1, 2019, when this process was supposed to start, 1,234 people have applied to get off the card, and just 291 have been approved. 584 have been rejected, and the rest are waiting. You are much less likely to be approved to get off the card if you are a First, a First Nations person, despite the majority of those being on the card being First Nations peoples. People from around the country have been hoping since 1 July 2019 that they would get off this punitive card. This card is causing so much hardship for those on low income. This process is a farce. The government should be ashamed of themselves that they have raised the expectation of people on the card that they may be able to get off it. It is simply not fair that people do not know the pro process uh, properly, that it's not transparent, and that people are being denied access to the card and not even given the evidence for why they are being denied. This is an unfair process. Income management is unfair, and the exemption process is totally unfair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Antic. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak in relation to the age-old maxim 
If it ain't broke, don't fix it, and why that is still relevant today. Madam Acting Deputy President, in 2017, the Turnbull government committed to developing a stronger national brand after the release of the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper. The National Brand Advisory Council was established with a brief to create a nat national brand which was to be uh, easily understood, consistently recognisable, quintessentially Australian and adaptable for different uses and industries. The National Brand website states that a strong national brand defines our aesthetic as a, uh, national, uh, as a nation and provides a set of principles that governs the expression of our identity. They set about creating a new brand using the time-honoured techniques of stakeholder engagement, deep dives, a domestic industry consultation, market testing. No doubt they took several helicopter views and probably did some branding exercises only to pivot over into uh, some vertical integration. I know, where would we be without corporate buzzwords? And for the princely sum of $10 million for the Australian taxpayer, they produced a report which contained inspirational words, glossy photos and even Venn diagrams. They also produced the now infamous Wattle logo with AU in the middle, a logo which was touted as an optimistic burst of gold positivity, which was going to promote Australia as a brand to an international audience, but a logo which was also unfavourably compared to the coronavirus. I must say I didn't see the coronavirus in the design, but I did see a waste of money. After all, we were already utilising a logo which, uh, the board briefly which as the board uh, suggested, was easily understood, consistently recognisable, quintessentially Aust Australian and adaptable for different uses, a logo which had been used for 34 years and was doing the requisite job quite admirably. The famous, iconic and entirely recognisable green and gold kangaroo logo. Now, Ms Acting Deputy President, coincidentally today is the uh, 1st of September being Wattle Day, but sadly only in this country do we really know what the wattle means to us. The rest of the world doesn't identify with the wattle in the same way that we do, but they do identify with the kangaroo and they do identify with the Australian-made push. Now, I was pleased to hear that the Minister for Trade has identified that the kangaroo logo will be reinstated and that the Waddle logo will be scrapped. The uh, Australian Made campaign chairman, Mr Glenn Cooper AM, has noted that the Australian Made logo will continue its pivotal role as Australia's domestic and overseas branding strategy. Mr Cooper says, who is a great South Australian, the iconic green and gold kangaroo has been clearly identifying Australian goods in export markets for more than 34 years with great success. It's by far Australia's most recognised and trusted country of origin symbol and central to the export strategies of Australian exporters taking their goods abroad. There's no need to make a change in this space. And I'm glad to hear that the kangaroo logo will be uh, retained, but I would go a step further and say that the rebranding exercise shouldn't go ahead. We already have a great logo, one which is known and which is instantly recognisable. <clears throat> and while this experience, uh, in my mind, has shown the divide between corporate Australia and everyday Australia. Now more than ever, with a push to rebuild our manufacturing industry, we need to go back to the future and stick with what we know. Sometimes in life, one answers questions which don't need to be asked, and this is, in my view, what's happened here. In this case of this branding exercise, it ain't broke, so let's not fix it. Senator Lyons. Deputy President, and um, yes, go the kangaroo. <laughs> During the time that Parliament was supposed to be sitting uh, and we were on break, I took the opportunity to travel to some of the regions in Western Australia that rarely see a federal politician. My team and I were warmly welcomed in Geraldton, Esperance, Corrigan, Meriden and Northam. We had the chance to meet with a huge range of community organisations, local government and dedicated individuals who are all contributing such important services and resources to their towns and regions. In Meriden, I visited the Community Resource Centre, which is a one-stop shop, one -stop shop, very dynamic, uh, do a whole range of um, uh, services for the community. And the Meriden uh, CRC, as it's known, publishes the fortnightly newspaper, The Phoenix. And the reason they do that, because like many local communities, uh, they were left high and dry when their uh, national, or should I say international, uh, owned newspapers uh, shut down. 
So Mercury, a Fairfax publication, had operated in Meriden for 103 years and shut down, and so the community were left without their own local newspaper. So the CRC came to the rescue. They were not journalists, but they put together a really real quality paper that picks up news, um, community information and regional information. And more recently, they uh, have gone to um, public publishing classified so that they can try and get the, uh, the newspaper on an even keel. And, um, it's available uh, online and they post it if you subscribe. So for a group of uh, women mainly who are not journalists, they are doing an amazing job. Similarly, in Esperance, which is WA's most southeastern town, it also lost its print newspaper, the Esperance Examiner. Uh, that happened earlier this year. I met a very talented young woman who has taken on the role of offering the community a new print and, again, online option. The Esperance Tide is a beautifully designed monthly print and online publication that showcases the area's stunning landscapes as well as providing an important line of information and updates for the local community in the form of long interviews, reviews and events that are going on around the town. And they too have just moved to classifieds in an attempt to make the, the, their uh, newspaper break even. Again, also in Collie, in WA South West, um, the editor and staff of the town's previous newspaper have started their own newspaper called the Collie River Valley Bulletin. Now, obviously, large newspapers with corporate uh, ownership and international ownership don't have a commitment to WA's regions and our small towns. And it's been fantastic to see that local governments have, that local organisations and individuals have stepped in. But, and here's the but, the federal government has offered. Um, uh, small grants to local community newspapers. But to show you how out of touch the Morrison government is, they don't go to publications like The Tide or The Phoenix because those newspapers don't have an established record and haven't been operating and can't show last year's financial assets because they are start-ups. So I would have thought, um, given um, the Morrison's government's um, the way that it's handled uh, print media in this country, and it's got to take some of the responsibility for what's happening to print media in this country, that you would make those grants much more flexible so quality publications such as we've seen in Collie, that I saw in Meriden, that I've seen in Esperance, that are local people, that are locally owned, uh, actually get the resources they need to help them flourish even more. So I would urge the Morrison government, um, who's out of touch with what's happening in the regions, to actually look at these publications, uh, to talk to the people involved in them, a, an amazing group of talented people, very enthusiastic, and to make sure that grant money actually meets the needs of these local, regional uh, community newspapers who are doing a fantastic job. Senator Rice. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to pay tribute to Professor Margot Pryor, who sadly passed away on the 24th of August. Professor Pryor was a trailblazing teacher, researcher and clinician, and is remembered for her warmth, enthusiasm, acute intelligence and generosity of spirit. Margot initially worked as a classical musician, playing piano, oboe and cor anglais. She suffered a tragic loss when she was 27, when her first husband drowned, going to the aid of fellow musicians, leaving her with three children under the age of five. Margot retrained as a clinical psychologist and excelled as an academic teacher, particularly as a pioneer in the field of autism research in Australia. She published the very first Australian journal article on autism in 1973, took up an academic post at La Trobe University in 1976, and became Professor of Clinical Psychology at La Trobe in 1989, the first woman appointed to such a role in Australia. And she was Director of Psychology at the Royal Children's Hospital and the University of Melbourne from 1994 to 2002. 
Professor Pryor's interests grew to encompass many other early childhood conditions, including attention and language disorders, clinical and developmental child and family psychology, and led to her research in childhood temperament. And she's well recognised as the architect of the Australian Temperament Study, which began in 1983 and continues to this day. Professor Pryor was honoured as an Officer of the Order of Australia in 2004, was Victoria's Senior Australian of the Year in 2006, and had the Margot Pryor Autism Intervention Centre, based in the Margot Pryor Wing of the La Trobe University Community Children's Centre, named after her in recognition of her work. But Margot's contribution to the world didn't stop at her impressive academic work. Margot was an activist for a better world. She loved life and wanted to see everyone and all the other species that we share this planet with given a fair go for a good life. Margot was one of the founding members of the Psychologists for the Prevention of War, and she co-established the La Trobe Institute for Peace Research. And Margot's leadership and her scientific contributions and her advocacy for child welfare and social justice were reflected in her chairing the Social and Human Sciences Net Network for UNESCO in the mid-2000s. Margot travelled on missions to countries including India and Vietnam to undertake development work, including training clinicians to support children with developmental challenges. She was a huge supporter of Oxfam and she supported the Alola Foundation in Timor-Leste. She was involved in land care activities at Strathcrete. She supported the ACF, Bush Heritage and various other environmental organisations. And she had a keen interest in Indigenous affairs and volunteered in an inner city Aboriginal health service for many years. And Margot mentored, encouraged and inspired so many. I got to know her when I was a Maribyrnong councillor and I was inspired by her life as a high achiever, as a mother and an activist working for the protection of nature, for justice and for peace, and her trademark warmth and generosity. She was supportive of me and supported our Greens campaigns for many years. And when I was pre-selected to stand for the Senate, Margot emailed me saying that she was delighted with the news. My heart goes out to Margot's family, her husband, John, and her three children, Johnny, David and Sean, her stepchildren, and her grandchildren, and all of her friends and colleagues whose lives she touched and changed. The last months in lockdown in an aged care home were not easy for her and her family. Johnny shared with me a few months back how this was really hard, but that luckily her room is at the front of the building so we can shout at her over the fence and we write daily, staff printed out for her. Very hard not to be able to give her a cuddle. And it is so hard with the restrictions of lockdown to not be able to gather properly after her passing to fully celebrate such an amazing person who lived such a meaningful life. And I look forward to being able to attend the celebration of her life at a future time when face-to-face -face gatherings are once again possible. Professor Pryor's passing is a tragic consequence of this pandemic, but her legacy will be felt for generations to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Labor governments have ruled Queensland for 25 of the last 30 years—25 years of failing Queensland. In the time that I have before me, I'm going to go through the top 10 current failures of the Labor government in Queensland. To begin with, Labor have failed to build the infrastructure to keep pace with population growth. Whether roads or bridges or the rail duplication in Nambour, that things are just not being built. Labor are not building dams. And they are, they are not only not building dams, they're reducing the proposed Rookwood Weir and they're tearing down existing dams. So that counts as an extra fail. And Paradise Dam, which I've spoken about in the Senate many times, is Australia's largest and worst infrastructure fail, and it happened on Labor's watch. We get to point three. Labor have failed business owners and job seekers alike, with Queensland recording the lowest business confidence, the highest unemployment and the highest rate of bankruptcies all before COVID. And Labor are using, shamefully, COVID as an alibi to cover up their dodgy record. 
The fourth failure, Labor have increased the basic cost of living in Queensland, jacking up registration costs or skimming cash off electricity generators so power, bill go, power bills go up. And they've failed our farmers, not only when it comes to water security, but they've also introduced draconian green tape in the name of reef regulation in a desperate attempt to gain love, cuddles and preferences from the Greens, because Labor know they cannot win the coming, coming state election unless they do a dodgy preference deal with the Greens. And the sixth failure, Labor failed to support Queensland's coal miners, from dragging their feet on Adani to refusing to secure the jobs of miners at Ackland or on the Darling Downs. This party of the worker can no longer look coal miners or their families in their eye. Just ask—don't take my word for it—just ask Joanne Miller former Labor MP and Labor Minister. But Labor have also failed the most basic requirements when it comes to integrity in government, from dodgy Jackie's property purchases to Mark Mango Q Bailey's sneaky emails to the Premier herself being found, found guilty of contempt of parliament. The Palaszczuk government has that sniff of old prawn head stuck in a wheelie bin in the middle of the Queensland summer. We've also got nine new or increased taxes on everything from payroll tax to land tax, gas royalties and property taxes. Labor are really, really good at increasing taxes or bringing in new taxes because they know that's the only way they're going to pay for their promises is by taxing you. The ninth failure is that Labor have failed to outline a vision or even deliver a budget before the next state election. Instead, on the last sitting day, they tried to sneak through a bill that would see journalists thrown in jail for reporting allegations of corruption. I wonder what they're trying to hide before the coming election. But more worryingly, Labor have failed to protect our most vulnerable children. They failed Mason Jet Lee. The Deputy State Coroner said, and I quote, in nearly every possible way. Wickedly and shamefully, they are using the politics of the border to be cruel, to be mean and to be horrible to the sick and the dying and the families of the sick and the dying. Exemptions are granted for the rich and the famous and the labour mates, but not for the sick not for their families, not for those who want to say goodbye to Dad who's passing away. No exemptions for them. Labor's record on the border is truly shameful and is something the Premier should truly hold, hold her head in shame when she thinks about the pain that she is causing to Queenslanders. Queenslanders know they deserve better. They know that they deserve compassion and common sense at this very difficult time. They know they cannot afford four more years of failure under this Labor government. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak about the crisis facing Northern Territory mango farmers as we face a critical crunch point in securing enough workers for the imminent mango season. The mango season begins in earnest right at the end of this month, so not far away, and worker shortages have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, which is limiting national and international travel. The NT mango harvest is worth $125 million to the NT economy, and plant-based industries combined are worth $355 million. That means melons, grapes, vegetables and other crops, which are also impacted by these shortages in the Northern Territory and also in other jurisdictions across the country. The Territory is mango proud and we're mango mad. We are the country's largest grower of mangoes, producing around 52 per cent of the national mango crop. The NT mango harvest equates to approximately 40,000 tonnes of mangoes, covering approximately 6,350 hectares. And to harvest this huge lot of mangoes requires between 2,200 and 2,500 workers for the picking season. Australian agriculture has always used seasonal workers and overseas workers. Often backpackers are required to do 88 days in regional Australia. But with around 60,000 less backpackers this year, we are facing a crisis that requires urgent attention and innovative solutions that bring together multiple jurisdictions and farmers' associations. And of course, this is not a new issue. It's just an issue exacerbated by COVID-19. The National Farmers Federation warned the Morrison government pre-COVID that agriculture's workforce deficit is one of the largest constraints to our sector's productivity growth. 
and we need solutions for agriculture to reach its potential of being a $100 billion industry by 2030. I acknowledge the work of Labor's Federal Agriculture Minister, the Hon. Joel Fitzgibbon MP, for his advocacy on this matter and for standing up for producers in this time. I also want to acknowledge the Northern Territory Government's Minister for Primary Industry and Resources, the Hon. Paul Kirby, MLA. Minister Kirby has been an active participant in cooperative efforts by Labor members across jurisdictions to advocate for the agriculture industry and particularly agriculture workers. The Northern Territory has worked with the NT farmers and Australian government on a deal to bring Vanuatu workers to the NT through the seasonal worker program COVID-19 pilot. This has been a complex process and final details are being worked through. Workers from Vanuatu are important. They come here every year and they will help fill the gap, but more certainly needs to be done, Madam Acting Deputy President. The NT Department of Primary Industry and the NT farmers are also working hard on an ongoing recruitment of Australian workers through targeted promotion. And in particular, I would like to acknowledge especially the CEO of the Northern Territory Farmers, Paul Burke. In fact, uh, Paul Burke's got some innovative ideas, and one of them is to even look at our Year 12 students across the country and looking at gap years, where a lot of students go overseas. Well, it looks like that's not going to happen. How about let's get them out on our farms across the country? So Paul's got some terrific ideas there, in particular around uh, even the HEX program and what could be done as incentivising uh, some of our young people uh, to look domestically uh, in terms of their gap year. Picking mangoes in the top end build-up is not a job that just anyone can do. It does require training and it is tough work in that heat. I certainly call on the Prime Minister, Madam Acting Deputy President, to urgently act to provide farmers and the agriculture sector with a strategy to ensure they're not left without desperately needed seasonal workers, and to clarify progress on the Agricultural Workers Code and give assurance that an announcement will be made on Friday. If a nationally consistent Agricultural Workers Code is not delivered this Friday as promised, the Prime Minister must accept the blame or consider the future of his agricultural minister. On the 21st of August, the Prime Minister said National Cabinet noted discussions had commenced on the code and agreed further work should be undertaken by agriculture ministers to deliver a paper to be considered by National Cabinet. But there seems to be confusion as to who is actually developing the Agriculture Workers' Code. And with National Cabinet just three days away, it's not looking good. The agriculture sectors need certainty. Producers need to be confident in the development of the code, and they will certainly be watching National Cabinet closely on Friday, as I will be too. Yes. Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Tonight I rise to speak about something that affects many of us, but these effects are often felt silently. Pain is not just physical, it can also affect our emotional and mental well-being, especially if it continues long term. As co-chair of the new Parliamentary Friends of Pain Management Group with ACT Local and member for Bean, Mr David Smith MP, I want to highlight the importance of recognising the impact chronic pain can have on ourselves, our loved ones and our community. Our Parliamentary Friends Group aims to raise the awareness of chronic pain and managing that pain with our peers and within our communities. Advocacy organisation Pain Australia is working with us to improve the quality of life for those living with chronic pain conditions. Pain Australia's remit is to develop the National Strategic Action Plan for Pain Management, which outlines the key actions Australia should take to tackle chronic pain. This plan was launched in 2019 and its recommendations are now being considered by health ministers. Chronic pain is, that continues, is pain that continues for more than three months after surgery and injury as a result of disease or from another cause. Although chronic pain can be a symptom of a disease or injury, it may occur without a clear reason and it can be a disease in its own right. There are many underlying causes of chronic pain. Although it is not always possible to determine the precise cause of the pain, chronic pain is often linked to changes in the central nervous system, psychological factors, and environmental changes that stay long after the tissue damage that initially triggered the pain has been resolved. Common chronic pain syndromes include back and leg pain, cancer, migraines and headaches, nerve pain, pelvic pain, sciatica, 
musculoskeletal conditions like arthritis, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis and gout. Almost 3.4 million Australians live with chronic pain. For most, their pain restricts the activities they can undertake. It impacts work, sleep and relationships. The effects of living with chronic pain go beyond the individual to their families, carers, friends, colleagues and the wider community. We need to address the needs of the millions of Australians who live with chronic pain and we need to do it soon. Pain Australia estimates more than 68 per cent of people living with chronic pain are of working age. Research indicates there are strong links between anxiety, depression and chronic physical illness. Almost 50 per cent of those with chronic pain also live with mental health conditions such as anxiety and depression. Modelling by Deloitte Access Economics shows that if Australia's policy around pain management doesn't change, the annual cost of pain will rise from $140 billion to more than $215 billion by 2050. This figure includes costs to our health system, lost productivity, reduction in quality of life and other financial costs such as informal care, aids and modification. It is expected that over 5 million Australians will be living with chronic pain within 30 years. Deloitte's report, entitled The Cost of Pain in Australia, outlines how changes in policy that extends best practice care to Australian chronic pain patients could lead to substantial savings and better health outcomes. Suggested changes include a national GP training program designed and led by pain specialists, doubling current levels of access to multidisciplinary care and prescribing atypical opioids rather than conventional opioids, although Deloitte does acknowledge that further research is needed in this area. Pain Australia considers the best way to manage pain is through holistic methods like the multidisciplinary approach I've just mentioned. Pain medicine was recognised as a medical specialty in 2005 and there are currently 316 active fellows of the Faculty of Pain Medicine in Australia. Pain specialists provide holistic care that includes prescribing medication, coordinating rehabilitative services, performing pain relieving procedures counselling patients and families and directing a multidisciplinary team that often includes psychological and psychiatric services and other healthcare professionals and liaising with public and private agencies. Just last month, the Parliamentary Friends of Pain Management Group launched the updated National Pain Services Directory, providing information on services offered by more than 200 facilities throughout Australia. This updated directory enables those with chronic pain to make informed decisions around pain management options and pathways available at locations close to them. Providing support like this early on allows someone with chronic pain to better manage their outcomes in the long term and it's a good start to making the changes needed. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, now more than ever, Australia needs a national plan for Australian manufacturing. COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of having a strong manufacturing sector. It has sadly demonstrated how vulnerable we are to global supply chain shocks. And it has been our local manufacturers who've answered the call when we needed medical equipment, adapted to making critical supplies, and when we needed smarter and more sophisticated um, uh, manufacturing in our economy. Our nation needs a plan for Australian manufacturing, a comprehensive plan for the future, and one that can be used as part of a roadmap of recovery for our national economy. COVID-19 has only highlighted this problem, but not exposed it. It's been laid bare for some time. For the last seven years that the Liberals have been in power, we've not seen a plan for manufacturing in Australia. It's only during this crisis, as other parts of the economy uh, have already collapsed, that the government starts to point to a manufacturing-led uh, recovery, having hollowed out uh, manufacturing industries all the while before, leaving them much weaker in terms of their capacity to play this role. We've seen a Liberal government having goaded the Australian car manufacturing industry into leaving, which they duly did. They failed to support TAFE and training, ripping $3 billion from training and seeing the biggest drop in apprenticeships and trainees. The budget update would have been a perfect time to do something about manufacturing, to talk up what plans the government has, 
But sadly, Madam Acting Deputy President, there was nothing. The only plan that this government has is to rip almost $2 billion out of research and development. I note that the government uh, has deferred the reporting date for the research and development bill from within the Economics Committee, uh, but I just think that they're conveniently delaying the political pain of the fact that they want to continue to rip that money out of uh, the budget while they'll come up with some small grants manufacturing program when we uh, get to the budget, finally get to the budget in October. Their manufacturing-led recovery is nothing more than spin and talk from our marketing-led Prime Minister. In the meantime, Australia continues to lose its economic complexity. The knowledge intensity of our economy, uh, which is embedded in our, uh, in the products we export. The knowledge intensity in our economy is most likely to be reliant on imports than producing unique products for export currently, sadly, in our nation. In 1995, Australia ranked 57th in the world, but in 2017, when it came to research and development, we ranked only 93. And so without more investment in research and development, we will lose more of our economic complexity and become again even further more reliant on com commodity exports. We need to capitalise on our mineral wealth, our world-renowned produce, our universities and our skilled workforce. But instead, we have a government that wants to rip more money out of Australia's universities. We need to invest in new industries like battery technology uh, and simply not just send our raw materials overseas. Advanced manufacturing and new technology should be the path for the future. But rather than looking to this, the government wants to increase the tax burden on innovative firms that do research and development in our nation by some $2 billion. We need a real plan for Australian manufacturing. After seven years, we still have no plan for manu manufacturing from the Liberal government. We have a government that simply likes to talk up manufacturing while presiding over its decline. You can see that uh, where they talk about a so-called gas-led recovery, and yet they've done nothing to bring uh, cheap gas uh, to shore here in Australia. They have ripped millions out of our university sector, millions out of recent research and development, millions out of CSIRO, and it's time for a real plan for manufacturing in our nation. Senator Moreland. Madam Acting uh, Deputy President, thank you. I rise today in memory of a strong advocate and a brilliant organiser for veterans and war widows, the aged and women in the army, uh, June Marie Healy, OAM, who passed away in August of this year. This accomplished ex-service woman was a former National Secretary of the Returned and Services League of Australia and National President of the War Widows Guild, Council of the Ageing and the Women's Royal Australian Army Corps Association. In, June 19, in 1990, June was awarded an Order of Australia Medal for service to veterans. She served in the Army in two roles as an enlisted army officer and later as an army wife, a member of the camp followers as army families, including mine, used to refer to themselves. June's family, the Davidsons, like most families, were impacted by the horrors of world wars. While working at the West Australia newspaper, she enlisted in the Royal Australian Army Corps in 1954. She was accepted into the Women's Royal Australian Army Corps in 1960. Reports of June and other female officers attending, of all things, charm and deportment classes made all the papers. How to turn on the charm was the daily news headline. What barely made the news was that June's group was the, were the first women to take part in the quartermaster's course at Kanunga, Kanungra Jungle Training Centre, Queensland. The media and the military have certainly come a long way. June became engaged to fellow Army officer John Healy in 1962, just before he was posted with the 1st Australian Army training team, known as uh, AATTV, 
and upon his return 15 months later, they married. June had to leave the army before her first daughter was born, shortly before John returned to Vietnam. Over those two combat tours, he was away for 780 days. She wrote at the time, I would have preferred a posting where I could accompany him. Well, I can't say I didn't know what I was getting into. Taped letters between her and her husband when he was in Vietnam are held in the Australian War Memorial Collection. There were decades of yearly and even shorter postings packing up the family, including another young daughter, to move interstate and overseas. In 1976, she was again living in the Jungle Training Centre at Canungra, where she had done the, masters, the quartermaster's course and where employment opportunities for spouses were limited. June always kept busy with army wives' activities and founded a thrift shop in Canungra, which raised money for the Girl Guides and provided a valuable service for army families relocating from vastly different climates. During her longest period in Canberra, June was appointed the first women, uh, woman executive to the National Headquarters RSL in 1981. The RSL media release described it as a major break with tradition, and she was later promoted from deputy to national secretary. During June's time with the RSL, her husband John had postings in the Sinai and at Kapuka. Most military families know the challenges of time apart, and fortunately, John returned to Canberra to Army office at the Department of Defence. After 13 years with the RSL, June retired following the death of John, her husband, in 1994, who had retired by then as a colonel. She continued taking veterans and families on commemorative tours, including many to Borneo and Gallipoli and to Bunker Island in Indonesia, with Vivian Bullwinkle and several other famous World War II nurses where I first met her. She remained a volunteer with many organisations, an enthusiastic participant on boards and committees, and as a member of the Prime Ministerial Advisory Council on ex-service matters. Chair Alan Hawke noted, your personal and professional experiences in advocating for the veteran community, your quiet dignity and your wicked sense of fun added significantly to council meetings. It's fitting that I am acknowledging June's outstanding contribution to her defence community during Legacy Week in most Australian states. She was both a supporter and beneficiary of the magnificent work of Legacy and the War Win Widows Guild. Vale June Marie Healy OAM, who defined for us all a life of service and whose unparalleled service will be greatly missed. Senator Walsh. Acting Deputy President, well, this has been a difficult year full of sacrifice for Australians, and it is critical that we get the recovery right. So we need to see a jobs plan from this government, a plan for good, secure jobs for all Australians, and we need to see it now. But right now, one million Australians are out of work. 1.5 million Australians can't find enough work and another 400,000 Australians are predicted to lose their jobs before Christmas. That's almost 2 million Australians who really need a jobs plan from this government. So what is the plan from the Prime Minister? Well, let me tell you his plan. Slashing JobKeeper, winding back JobSeeker, dumping the superannuation increase and freezing the pension. Scott Morrison is cutting people's incomes and support at the very time that they are struggling the most, while we're right in the middle of our first recession in almost 30 years, in the middle of this pandemic, before people have even had the chance to get back on their feet. Australians need to see a jobs plan from this government, and we needed a jobs plan even before this pandemic. We need one now more than ever before, a plan to create decent and well-paid jobs. Australians want to see this government stop with the announcements and start with the action. Stop with the photo opportunities and start with the job opportunities. Stop with the press releases and start following through. 
So here's three ideas for the Prime Minister. First, let's rebuild manufacturing. Manufacturing that delivers decent and well-paid jobs in our cities and our regions. We have a really proud history of making things in this country. If we needed it in the past, we made it right here. And it's time we supported manufacturing to revitalise, to produce more of what we need right here and to employ more Australians in our cities and, critically, in our regions. Second, let's rebuild our nation's infrastructure. Let's invest in projects that will transform Australia into a nation that is actually ready for the future. Let's start projects that improve people's lives, improve our competitiveness and get us ready to take advantage of the future. And let's invest in projects that create jobs right now, today. A new generation of high quality social housing is just one project that this government could get behind today. And third, let's rebuild secure employment in this country. We have seen enough gig jobs. We have seen enough labour hire jobs. We've seen enough casual contract temporary jobs in this country. And in this pandemic, we've relied on some of our lowest paid and most insecure workers to get us through. We've recognised that some of our lowest paid workers with the least job security have been our most essential at this time. So it's time that we called time as a country on the explosion of insecure work in this country. It's time we committed to rebuilding secure jobs that people can actually count on and build a future on. Indeed, it is long past time that this government delivered a jobs plan. For seven years, we've seen flat wages. For seven years, we've seen the growth of insecure jobs. For seven years, we've seen our heartland manufacturing industries decline. For seven years, we've seen our national infrastructure run down by this government. And right now, a jobs plan is urgent. It's urgent for the two million Australians expected to be out of work by this Christmas. It's urgent for the children who are leaving school this year and want to know what the future holds for them. It's urgent for all of us who know that good, secure jobs are our strongest foundation. So it's time the Prime Minister delivered. Senator McLaughlin. Madam Acting Deputy President, honourable senators would know of the extremely high regard in which I hold paramedics. They witness trauma and tragedy every day of their working lives. And in these times, when our nation is ravished by the coronavirus, they must endure the added stress of saving life while the constant risk of infection hangs over them. Still, they mount duty day and night, hearing and then responding to the clarion calls of the community that relies so heavily upon them. The same community that does not always acknowledge and reflect, as it should, on the personal cost our paramedics suffer, nor the cost paid by those close to them. It is important that accounts of their lives become public record. Only then can we attempt to gain a better understanding of what we are asking these brave individuals to do in our service, on our behalf and for the great collective benefit. For when we are in need, we do not hesitate to call and they do not hesitate to come to our aid. That is the starting point on a journey that the states and territories need to begin to ensure our paramedics receive the care and support that is commensurate to the burden they so nobly carry for us. Honourable Senators, there are distinct approaches across the nation. I suggest that in some jurisdictions a greater generosity of spirit might need to be found and much more done to ease the pain of the men and women of our ambulance services endure as a consequence of their service. Madam Acting Deputy President, I have been contacted by the daughter of a South Australian paramedic who recounted to me the impressive record of the service of her father, Mr Paul Cottier. Paul has lived a life of service to others. 
He served in the Royal Australian Air Force in the 1980s as a medic, which included time in Butterworth in Malaysia. Subsequently, he became an ambulance officer with St John Ambulance. These were the days when the ambulance service was run by St John Ambulance with a mixture of full-time staff and volunteers. When the South Australian Ambulance Service was founded, he joined as one of its first cadre of paramedics. He has proudly served the South Australian community for over 30 years. I know from his loving daughter, like so many, that despite the stresses and strains of serving as a paramedic, he has continued to devote himself to his community's welfare. It is an example of service above self. As a volunteer myself for St John Ambulance, I thank you, Mr Paul Cotter, for your service as an ambulance officer for St John. As a senator for South Australia, I thank you, Mr Paul Cotter, for your service as a paramedic to my state. Senator Ferrovanti Wells. Deputy President, uh, following my prescient warnings in early 2018 regarding the China's, Chinese Communist regime's debt trap diplomacy activities, especially in the Pacific, I was pleased that an international debate ensued. Debt trap diplomacy refers to the strategy used by China to lure or trap developing or underdeveloped countries to borrow money to be used mainly for infrastructure projects. The terms of these loans are not transparent. They are often debt for equity, so that when a country cannot repay the loan, China takes the equity and ends up owning the asset. Interest imposed is generally higher than the international financial institutions. The international debate focused on the communist regime's Belt and Road strategy. Suddenly, the world started to understand the repercussions of BRI. BRI is debt trap diplomacy. The CCP is using the pandemic as a cover to take advantage of the economically stressed nations and companies. I have continued to advocate that as part of decoupling, it is also vital that we overhaul our critical infrastructure and foreign investment framework. This includes expanding the parameters of national interest to ensure we protect our national sovereignty. We need to look at practical ways to protect our sovereignty, starting with the port of Darwin. Any reform of foreign investment policy will require more areas to be subject to scrutiny. More restrictions will need to be placed on foreign ownership and control. Following, following the acquisition of the Port of Darwin by Chinese company Landbridge, some changes were made to foreign investment rules. However, the exemption from foreign investment review still exists for acquisitions from Commonwealth, state or local governments unless the purchaser is a foreign government investor and the subject of the sale is public infrastructure. Consequently, businesses carried on by governments at any level in Australia are exempt from Foreign Acquisition and Takeover Act 1975 scrutiny. For example, a government-owned insurer could be sold to an overseas insurance company without FERB oversight. Hence, unless we remove the exemption so that all acquisitions by foreign entities are subject to scrutiny and the national interest test, we will not address the elephant in the room, namely investment by the CCP and its entities in Australia, especially in strategic assets. This brings me to the recent announcement by Scott Morrison and Maurice Payne regarding arrangements that states, territories, councils and universities have with foreign governments. It will only cover state or territory entities, including departments and agencies, local governments and only universities established under state or territory law. The Commonwealth will ask the states and territories to undertake a review, a stock take, of their current arrangements. Due diligence will apparently be, then be done. I ask, though, is it the intention to overturn existing arrangements or merely putting in place a framework for future arrangements? Already, the government has said that the Port of Darwin has been excluded because commercial arrangements are not covered. This legislation will have little or no credibility in the eyes of the Australian public unless the starting point is taking back the Port of Darwin. We are told that an open source review has identified over 135 agreements from 30 different countries over about 10 subjects. Let's be clear. The Australian public has no problems where the agreements are with democratic countries or their entities. 
What the Australian public will no longer tolerate is business as usual with the communist regime in China. What troubles the Australian public are the insidious practices of those loyal to Beijing in Australia. Publications by Professor Clive Hamilton and Aspie's Alex Josky have demonstrated the extent of these activities, especially by the United Front Work Department. The proposed legislation will be very limited in its application. It does not cover commercial arrangements where the bulk of the issues exist. In Australia, there are 588 sister city relationships uh, held with 52 countries. 99 relationships are with China. Indeed, Canberra itself has a sister city relationship with Beijing, not surprising given the number of fellow travellers residing here. Australia also has 76 friendship city affiliations, 32 of which are with China. Friendship relationships, being partnerships of a more limited scope, require only one exchange per year, in contrast to three undertaken by sister cities. I now turn to the Confucius Institutes. They are run by an agency of the Chinese Ministry of Education called the Hanban, which provides teachers, textbooks and operating funds. Its website shows where they are located around the world and their Chinese partnership arrangements. The first institute in Australia was founded in 2005. There are now 14 Confucius Institutes located at 13 universities, all with a counterpart university or institute in China. In 2015, an institute was founded at the New South Wales Department of Education and Communities with the Education Department of Jingzhou Province. Since 2009, we have also seen over 60 Confucius classrooms founded at schools and colleges in Australia. Only agreements entered into by universities, colleges or schools established under state laws would be part of this review. Agreements entered into by private universities, colleges and schools will not be covered. On the issue of universities, I am pleased that finally there will be an inquiry into foreign interference. It is time measures were put into place so that we do not see a repeat of the disgraceful conduct by the University of Queensland in the Drew Pavlou affair and the University of New South Wales impeding free speech. We need also to uncover the tentacles of the Thousand Talents program. Universities do incredibly important research, often with large levels of public funding. We need to protect against intellectual property theft, cyber attacks and incursions on freedom of speech. The problem for many of our universities is that they were prepare, prepared to turn a blind eye to Beijing's skullduggery, so long as the rivers of gold were flowing from China. They relied primarily on Chinese students. They clearly did not follow the advice of their own business schools in practising diversification of income streams. Universities are now billions of dollars in debt, and some are looking to the Australian taxpayer to bail them out, and this cannot occur. My strong advice to those universities is to accept the government's higher education reform package and accept that you alone are responsible for the bad decisions that you made. In my speech of 10 June to the Senate, I referred to a study by, uh, entitled Mapping the Legal Landscape Chinese State-Owned Companies in Australia by Professor Tomasic and Senior Lecturer Ping Zhong. Its precision would indicate that the authors had good sources. There has not, as far as I know, been any update to this listing. There is no public listing of PRC companies or PRC-invested projects in Australia. The most accurate sources for PRC investment and corporate presence in Australia, both state-owned enterprises and others, is held within the Treasury. These figures are not publicly available and are often simply approvals rather than records of actual investments. China obviously has the best figures, but they are not publicly available. China has in fact established a Chamber of Commerce in Australia to oversee the activities of its state-owned ent entities, both national and provincial. This body is highly influential given it represents the owners of many billions of dollars. The Chamber has branches across Australia and economic sphere committees including legal, aviation, energy, foreign relations and financial industry sectors. 
the massive financial power and thus influence of this body on Australian companies and governments has not yet been fully appreciated. It is time the Australian public be made aware of the corporate reach of these PRC SOE companies, and this includes details of what government agencies know of their holdings and activities. An open source search of the entities listed in the Thomasic Zhong paper will be slow and laborious. It would not yield a comprehensive picture, given that these companies do not necessarily provide details of their assets or all their assets on their website. A public database of Australian assets owned by Chinese entities would be an informative national resource for economic and security purposes, but to my knowledge, such a database does not exist. As we move to decouple from China and increase self-sufficiency, especially with vital supply chains, it is essential Australians know full well who and what they are dealing with. They need to know who owns what. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The northwest of Tasmania is my home. It's a beautiful place, a place of great potential, full of good people, making a go of life in regional Australia. And COVID-19 hit them hard, particularly the outbreak at the Burney Hospital, which saw thousands of North West Coasters quarantined, businesses shut down, the hospital closed and the army brought in. When these restrictions were eased in early May of Tasmania's 221 confirmed coronavirus cases, 147 were, were in the North West, including 12 of the 13 deaths. At that time, I began a community survey. It told about the level of fear in the community, with many, many people saying they wanted the borders to stay closed until COVID-19 had disappeared. And there were some truly heartbreaking stories, like the person who was so terrified of having anything at all to do with Centrelink that he accessed his superannuation instead of applying for JobSeeker. How is it that this country has created a system so complex and hostile that an ordinary Australian, a taxpayer perfectly entitled to seek social security support, could be so traumatised at the prospect of visiting a Centrelink office that he would spend his own retirement savings instead. Then there was a family in despair at having to close their business. Their daughter was also lost her casual job and wasn't eligible for JobKeeper. Where on earth would they get the money to pay their way? And the school swimming instructor, after 15 years of regular casual employment with the state government, laid off, not eligible for JobKeeper, and genuinely distressed that the support available paid no heed to her dignity as a long-serving employee. And then there was the visa holders, unable to return home, unable to access JobKeeper, supported by charities and their communities, living with huge anxiety. One I spoke to had his full-time hours reduced to less than 16 hours and was trying to support his family on a little over $300 a week. There was a pensioner desperate for the return of his wife who was stuck in the Philippines. The only way to communicate with the Australian Embassy and the airlines was by email, and he had never sent an email in his life before. And the young couple who sought the relative safety of his hometown in Tasmania from the virus-raged UK. He secured a job there, but his partner, who had been waiting for two years for her partner visa, with no prospect of it arriving, felt she had no alternative but to return to the UK, so they are living apart for the unforeseeable future. All of this has provided me with an insight into how, in a time of crisis, all the government's stuff-ups and neglect compound. How, with this pandemic shaking the foundations of our country, the structural cracks are opening wider and wider. And these cracks are invariably in areas of policy that have been either neglected, put in the too hard basket, or insidiously invaded by ideology rather than common sense. The ideology of privatisation and trickle-down economics of the market will sort it out. This ideology has undermined our institutions and the very idea that a government should care about the common good and strive to advance the welfare of all its citizens and aspiring citizens. Centrelink so badly broken. Partner visa processing absolutely broken. Childcare and early learning broken. Aged care broken. 
Then, as restrictions eased in Tasmania and local travel was allowed, it was time to get out and touch base with people to see how they were faring. I visited each of the eight local government areas in northwest Tasmania. Circular Head, Waratah, Wynyard, the West Coast, Burnie, Central Coast, Devonport, La Trobe and King Island. I met with chambers of commerce, mayors and general managers, tourism councils, community and neighbourhood houses, men sheds, the CWA, individuals and large and small businesses. I want to thank every single organisation and individual that I met with. Thank you for your welcome, your candour and sharing your stories. I'll be back to see how you're doing and what I can do to help. Overwhelmingly, I was taken by the sheer resilience of the people, the hope and optimism, if we can just get through this very tough time. I forget how many times I heard the disheartening phrase, we had to let our casuals go. Disheartening because the government had cruelly decided that casuals who had been with their employer for less than a year were not eligible for JobKeeper. I spoke to cafes and restaurants who were staying open on takeaway service largely to maintain some kind of income for their visa-holding employees. The other phrase was, we're surviving on JobKeeper. At the very beginning of this crisis, Labor called for wage subsidies to support jobs. When the government that initially spurned the idea eventually adopted it, we took that as a win, even if their scheme had major, major holes in it. On the west coast of Tasmania, 41 per cent of businesses applied for JobKeeper, and in Burnie, 39.4 per cent applied, and in Devonport, 40.1 per cent. And now I'm worried, deeply worried, about Treasurer Frydenberg's plan to dramatically reduce the amount of JobKeeper payments without developing a plan for jobs. Full-time employees who have been supported at the current JobKeeper rate of $750 a week from the 28th of September have to get by then on $600 a week, and on the 4th of January next year, $500 a week. And part-time workers will have them in their income halved from $750 a week to $750 a fortnight and then reduced to $650 a fortnight in January. For many, many businesses, particularly in tourism, entertainment and the arts, travel and hospitality, until our borders reopen, until tourism restarts and people can gather in large groups, they cannot restart. To give you an example is King Island Car Hire, a perfectly viable business run by Anna and Adam Healy, who are very much cup half full sort of people. But right now, with no visitors from Victoria and no international tourists, they are in a holding pattern. Hardly anyone from outside of Tasmania, not even the visiting dentist from Victoria, can get to King Island. All cutting JobKeeper will do for these employees of businesses like King Island Car Hire is to make it even harder to pay their bills and to buy food. There are many businesses in a similar situation on King Island, hundreds like that in the northwest Tasmania, and tens of thousands across the country absolutely viable and waiting for coronavirus restrictions to ease. And we must consider too the hundreds of thousands of dollars the reduction in JobKeeper will strip from the economy, with people's spending power, including their capacity to holiday at home, dramatically reduced. Labor was very concerned about the government's plan to rip JobKeeper support out at the end of September. It made no sense at all. We campaigned for and supported the extension of JobKeeper to March next year. But the wind down in the payment rates of JobKeeper, as proposed, will come at the worst time for many workers and businesses. This bill has passed this week to extend JobKeeper, doesn't specify its rates. The Treasurer alone has that power to decide what that rate is and who receives it. I urge him and the members opposite to consider this carefully because the outrage of thousands of small business people and their employees could be a mighty thing if they discover the only plan the government has is to force them into poverty and to the wall. Let's see that plan for jobs and industry from this government before the toe cutters get to work on JobKeeper. The plan for jobs, a plan that protects viable businesses and their employees, a plan that takes into account and subtly and needs of different sectors a plan for tourism, a plan for hospitality, a plan for manufacturing, a plan for energy, a plan for early childhood education, 
a plan for aged care and a plan for visa workers. And I say to my colleagues on the other side, you've already broken Centrelink and you broke partner visa processing and you certainly broke aged care. It's well past time to show that you can now fix something. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Uh, we have Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Mark Twain once famously said, a mine is a hole in the ground with a liar on top. Acting Deputy President, I'm about to tell you a story and you decide whether or not this is a hole in the ground with a liar on top. Let me set the backdrop for you. We go back to August 2013, seven years ago, where a company called Venture Minerals gets a permit from the then Labor government for an iron ore mine in Riley Creek, Tasmania. Now, Riley Creek is in the southern end of the Tarkana, Tarkine, one of the most tranquil places you will ever find. A landscape so rich and wild, assessed to be of national and world heritage value. Not to mention, home to the spotted tail quoll. And this time, in 2013, one of the last strongholds of the Tasmanian devil populations that remain free from the devil facial tumour disease. Being such a sensitive area for our Tassie state emblem, conditions were attached to the 2013 mining permit approval. No trucks outside daylight hours to reduce the roadkill risk to the devil at night. And within two years of starting, the company must pay a chunk of money to save the Tasmanian devil program. Another important condition gave Venture five years to start their mine, or in legal terms, to substantially commence. If they didn't start in those five years, they would have to seek written agreement from the minister, which would likely involve a reassessment of the mine licence and conditions. Now, the reason for seeking ministerial approval was that the devil facial tumour disease was expected to rapidly spread throughout this area following 2013, when the mine was approved. Now, remember, this was one of the last places left in Tassie that the devil was free of this awful disease. So much so that an insurance population was even released into the Tarkine wilderness not long after the mine was approved in 2013. Now, even with that insurance population, the devils continue to face significant stress from roadkill and a serious loss of habitat from frequent bushfires. So any significant delay to a mining project with thousands of truck movements certainly warranted a further risk assessment to the long-term survival of the Tasmanian devil. Now, almost a year after the permit was granted, nothing had been reported to the Department from Venture Minerals about the commencement of their mining. And then, for the next five years, the company publicly reported to their shareholders and to the Australian Stock Exchange that they remained in a pre-extraction stage, ready to take out iron ore when the market was right. But pre-extraction is not considered to be substantial commencement under the 2000 permit conditions and approval. They had to actually extract ore for the permit to remain valid. Then, in 2018 and 19, the price of iron ore is on the up and the market looks right. But wait a minute, we're out of the five-year limit. So what does Venture do? In July 2019, they write to the department and the environment minister and they say, hold up, we've actually ripped out over 10,000 tonnes of iron ore way back in 2013 and 14. And yeah, that was five years ago. Uh, sorry it took us so long to let you know, but now we're doing that totally contrary to what they disclosed to shareholders and to the Australian Stock Exchange. Now, at this point, assuming this Riley Creek project was material to Venture's share price, and I've got to say, based on their statements, I'd say it was, they need to mine the Riley Creek mine to get cash flow to ramp up other potential mines in the area. This slip-up in reporting, intentional or not, had to have breached ASX continuous disclosure rules and no doubt the ASX will investigate that. But that's not the key issue here, Acting Deputy President. This is where it gets really interesting. You would think the Environment Department must have been pretty surprised about the changed status to Ventures mining operations 
after receiving all these notifications for years that no mining had commenced. They were supposed to have let the department know if they had substantially commenced, and when that happened, they were due to pay a chunk of money to the Tasmanian Devil Fund, which they clearly hadn't. What does the department do? They apparently investigated the permit conditions and then gave Venture a slap on the wrist. A $25,000 fine for breaching one permit, the condition related to not paying the Devil Fund. Now, to my knowledge, and more importantly, the department never investigated if Venture, in fact, had actually substantially commenced mining in line with their permit conditions. And remember, if they hadn't, their mine licence wouldn't be valid and they would have to apply to the minister and potentially undergo a new environmental assessment. Why wasn't this critical factor assessed? Nobody knows. So what would you do if you were Venture Mining? You've been waiting for six years. The iron ore price is now running hot from this extraordinary event internationally with COVID. But you find yourself in breach of your licence conditions because you've never substantially commenced mining. Do you look for a loophole? Do you change your story and admit to years of misreporting? Pay a $25,000 fine, a veritable slap on the wrist, a cost of doing business? Or do you admit you overlooked an important licence condition and seek a new agreement with a potentially lengthy approval process and run the risk you might miss the iron ore price window. Now, interestingly, this convenient reporting mistake to the Commonwealth also gives Venture a defence against being in breach of state permit conditions, which also expired on the 24th of September 2019. Bob Brown and Save the Tarkin using satellite images to corroborate Venture's early statements that substantial mining had indeed not occurred, in April 2019, last year publicly raised the issue that the minister should not substantially commence without an agreement and without representations or with representations around properly assessing the Tasmanian devil. Now, those formal representations were made to Minister Lay in June 2019 that she should not agree to any substantial commencement until a proper assessment or reassessment had occurred in light of the rapid spread of the digital facial tumour disease and recent bushfires. Now, it's worth noting that Venture didn't disclose their innocent mistake to the federal government until the 17th of July, a month after Bob Brown Foundation had gone public with this, immediately following these representations. Though it's highly unlikely to be a coincidence, and it's almost certainly a response to the efforts of conservationists to get the devil risks properly assessed. Now, following Venture's remarkable mistake with their reporting, both these organisations, Bob Brown Foundation and Save the Tarkine, then provided substantial information to the Minister about Venture's recent statements being at odds with a number of striking facts, publicly available facts. They also point out in detail exactly what the legal term for substantial commencement was in relation to the mine approval, which had clearly not occurred on site. They mount a strong case that the activity Venture claims was substantial was in fact simply exploration, not mining work and not substantial commencement. Save the Tarkine have put it to the Minister that Venture has attempted to recast exploration activity as ore extraction in order to not be found in breach of permit conditions, and I note to have not misled investors at this point and to avoid further assessment of its EPBC permits and the lapsing of its Tasmanian land use planning and approval purchase. So, did Venture, sitting on a hole in the ground, tell a lie to capitalise on rising oil prices and risk the Tasmanian devil? Given the prima facie case made against them by the Bob Brown Foundation and Save the Tarkine, surely this should be properly investigated. Given Venture recently and last year and 2019 raised millions of dollars in share placement on the stock market around their renewed activity in the Tarkine, primarily at the Riley Creek ore mine, I would expect that they disclose the risks of a potential legal challenge or investigation by authorities relating to being in breach of their permit conditions and disclose the risks of a new federal assessment process 
at a time the Tasmanian devil, a threatened endangered species, is under acute risk. A failure to do so surely would have been reckless, negligent or even deceptive and misleading. Now, I can't find any public record of such a disclosure. The only record I can find from a statement to investors was in 2019, the second half of 2019, in which the company says their EPBC permits are valid. So I intend to ask the Australian Stock Exchange and ASIC, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, to investigate this. Venture may well have disclosed these risks to shareholders. I'm not saying they didn't, just that there is no public record that I can find on such. I also understand that Bob Brown does Bob Brown Foundation have lodged complaints with the Australian Stock Exchange and the Australian Securities Commission over their concerns around existing statements by venture also Thank being you, potentially Senator deceptive. Thank you, Senator Wilson. Thank you, Senator. Misleading. Your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In my uh, ten minutes uh, this evening. I rise with some disappointment to speak about a policy decision taken by one of Queensland's biggest companies, Suncorp Metway. On 21 August 2020, Suncorp Metway released its most recent annual results. At the same time, it released its Responsible Business Report. I quote from page 28, quote, in 2020, we strengthened our fossil fuels sensitive sector guideline to cease underwriting, financing or directly investing in new oil and gas projects, phase out financing oil and gas by 2025 and directly investing by 2040. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, here we have Queensland's largest company announcing that it is going to turn its back on the oil and gas industry. A sector which has invested more than 70 billion, that's billion with a B, in Queensland, including $49.7 billion between 2011 and 2018. A sector which employs close to 5,000 Queenslanders and provided 39,000 jobs between 2017 to 2018. A sector which provides gas to our manufacturing and metal processing industries, which employ 225,000 Australians. A sector which is vital to our future if we are going to increase manufacturing in this country, if we are going to make more things in this country, become independent and self-reliant in every sense of, that, of those words, instead of having our supply chains totally dependent upon imports. A sector which generates billions of dollars in export income, exporting energy to the world and lifting millions of people out of poverty. A sector which the chief scientist Alan Finkel says is vital for our future because, and I quote, natural gas fired electricity can pick up where batteries and pumped hydroelectricity fall short, end quote. And this is a sector, Madam Acting Deputy President, which Suncorp refers to in a section in their Responsible Business Report 2019-20, to 20, this is a sector, the oil and gas sector, which Suncorp refers to in a section entitled Responsible Underwriting, Lending and Investment, Sensitive Sector Guidelines. And in the same section of this so-called Responsible Business Report, in the same section they deal with cluster bombs, biological warfare, chemical warfare, child slavery, forced labour, in the same section as dealing with the oil and gas industry. How out of touch, how out of touch has Suncorp become? How out of touch with Queenslanders has Suncorp become? So what are we Queenslanders meant to think of this? Go no further than 4BC Talkback Radio on 21 August. My friend Scott Emerson's afternoon talkback radio show. And our quiet Australians are not so quiet, not so quiet about this travesty. Ray, who has Suncorp insurance products, said after hearing the managing director defend the policy, or try to miserably, this is what Ray said, if he's not on our side, well, I'm not going to be on his side. 
He is making a political statement. End quote. Wayne, with Suncorp shares, said, and begin quote, I'm fairly disgusted. Suncorp are just shutting the door on us. End quote. I felt the same way. I felt exactly the same way when I heard that Suncorp were taking this policy position. And I reflect, I reflect on what some great Queenslanders who were part of Suncorp Metway's journey would make of this. Premier Rob Borbidge and Treasurer Joan Sheldon actually pushed for the amalgamation of Suncorp with Metway. Great Queenslanders were, chair, were chairpersons of the board's board of directors, Martin Creerot, John Storey, great Queenslanders, outstanding legal represent, representatives to the Queensland government, Ken Macdonald and Aaron Ferros, senior government public service, Tony Bellis and John Grayson. I, I wonder what they would all think of it. I wonder what they would all think of it, whether or not they envisaged that this great financial institution that they helped create and which continued a legacy which started all the way back in 1916 or 17, when the Queensland government set up the State Government Insurance Office of Queensland to insure state government assets, but also to provide life insurance and general insurance, car and home insurance to Queenslanders, all the way back in 1916. And the other institution, which was part of the, the merger, what was known as the Metropolitan Permanent Building Society, which was established in the 1950s, those two great institutions brought together in 1996, I reflect what all those people involved in that would now think of this. And I reflect on whether it was a mistake in 2010 that the then Queensland Labor government watered down the requirements for Suncorp to have a majority of its directors resident in the state of Queensland. And I reflect on that because I think Suncorp has lost touch with how important the oil and gas industry is to Queensland. It's lost touch with its historical roots and it's lost touch with us Queenslanders. But there is perhaps a path to redemption at hand. There is perhaps a path to redemption at hand. If Suncorp Metway really wants to earn its social licence in Queensland, then one of the things it could do is help Queenslanders, especially Queenslanders in North Queensland and far North Queensland, to secure insurance. After all, as I said previously in this speech, the State Government Insurance Office was established in 1916 to actually assist Queenslanders to procure insurance. Fast forward to 2020 and we now have a situation, a devastating situation for many Queenslanders in my home state, where they simply cannot secure insurance. I saw some advice given to an in, from an insurance underwriter or an insurance broker, I should say, to the owners of a strata, strata title complex in far north Queensland. And they sought to obtain insurance for the owners of those strata title apartments. Not a single Australian insurer, not a single Australian insurer would provide insurance in relation to that strata building block to that apartment block. Not a single Australian insurer. Suncorp said no. Suncorp said no. Vero, who is a subsidiary of Suncorp, they also said no. The only insurer the owners in that strata title block, that apartment block, could find was a UK insurer at an exorbitant cost. That was the only place they could go to obtain insurance to the UK. What a far way we've come. What a far way Suncorp Metway has come from 1916, when the State Government Insurance Office was established by the Queensland Government, primarily to insure state-owned assets and provide insurance to Queenslanders. If Suncorp really wants to reinstate its standing amongst Queenslanders, the best way it can do it is to make sure that every single Queenslander can access access affordable insurance. Every single Queenslander has a right to affordable insurance. If you can do that, Suncorp, if you can recapture the spirit of the SGIO set up in 1916, then I'll be the first to rise in this place and sing your praises. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Roberts.
Senator my Thank you. Thank you. Yep, we can hear you. Proceed. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We we can hear you, Senator Roberts. Can you hear us? Can you see me? Yes, we can see you now as well. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm not that short actually, but anyway. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note the Moran report cannot be sensibly refuted because it presents the government's own costs from budget programs and government agency reports. The Moran report, which we released Sunday week ago, titled The Hidden Cost of Climate Policies and Renewables, shows that the added cost on net electricity is $13 billion each year, and that's $1,300 per household every year. The government says renewable solar and wind energy, or as they should be called intermittent energy, is 6.5% of a typical household electricity bill. The reality from the government's own costs is 39%, six times higher, six times higher. The government says the portion is $90 each year when it is really $536. And with, indi that's, and with indirect costs added, a staggering $1,300 each year for each household. No wonder the government stopped providing the consolidated costs. The policy of funding the parasitic intermittents that add costs to other forms of generation like hydro, coal and gas means that for every solar and wind job, 2.2 jobs are lost in the productive economy. Our economy and our lifestyles are being fundamentally changed through decarbonising. And that is really deindustrializing. To a UN agenda in accord with the UN's 1996 Kyoto Protocol, and the UN's 2015 Paris Agreement. It's killing our food security, killing our manufacturing, killing our economic resilience, killing our productive capacity, killing our economic and national sovereignty. It perpetuates our dependence on other nations, our loss of security, whereas before these UN agreements, we were as a nation independent and secure. That leads to another report titled Restoring Scientific Integrity that I released yesterday. In turn, that raises significant and fundamental questions of the basis for the massive subsidies on renewables and climate. In 2016, 17, 19 and 20, I had four presentations from the CSIRO and after each I cross-examined CSIRO's climate science team. I'll share what we learned from CSIRO's own admissions. And by the way, recently I cross-examined 17 internationally respected scientists in climatology physics, astrophysics, statistical analysis, geologists, mathem mathematicians and computer modeling experts, meteorology, sea levels, earth sciences. These eminent, capable and authoritative scientists have confirmed the conclusions that I now share with you from our report titled Restoring Scientific Integrity. These are some of the conclusions from the report. The CSIRO has never said that carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger, never. CSIRO has admitted today's temperatures are not unprecedented. CSIRO has cited papers that do not show the rate of temperature rise is unprecedented. CSIRO relies on unvalidated models giving erroneous projections. CSIRO has never quantified any specific impact from human carbon dioxide. And without that, there can be no policy. CSIRO has relied on discredited and poor quality papers on temperature and carbon dioxide. CSIRO revealed a little understanding of the papers they cited, and that was very embarrassing for them. CSIRO admits to doing no due diligence on reports and data they cite, some of those from overseas, some from within Australia. CSIRO allows politicians to misrepresent CSIRO without correction, CS so they participate in perpetuating this scam. CSIRO misled Parliament. Let's look at something in particular, one of their papers. CSIRO admitted that today's temperatures are not unprecedented after we tore apart the Marcot paper. It failed under our cross-examination. They submitted the Marcot paper as showing something unprecedented in Earth's climate in the last 10,000 years. That paper was admitted by, the, by its lead author that he said that the 20th century temperature uptick that they put it, that they show in the paper is not robust and not representative of global temperatures. It was fabricated. Initially, the author himself as a PhD, in his PhD thesis showed no temperature uptick. 
He was then joined by two UN authors, and, and that produced the Marcotte 20, 20, uh, 2013 paper, and that's where the, pa where the temperature uptick was fabricated, and that's what CSIRO relied on. Willie Soon, who is an astrophysicist and geoscientist, said, quote, two weeks after publication, this Marcotte paper was completely destroyed, and yet someone as high up as CSIRO trying to say this paper is legitimate and can be used as a supporting scientific evidence is, is scientific malpractice. He also, the paper also admits that it, its process that it uses cannot find temperature trends shorter than 300 years. And yet here's the CSIRO citing this as proof. And so they withdrew the paper. I could go on and talk about the Harry's paper that they submitted about carbon dioxide. That shows that the that carbon dioxide today is unprecedented. Well, that is false because the current 60 year blip of carbon dioxide levels rising, in fact, is just a rise of 0.009% from 0.032% to 0.041%. I'll say that again, a 0.009% rise in just 60 years. When the gaps in the ice cores that, that Harry's cobbled together are 1,000 years minimum and up to 6,000 years. You would never see this rise. Then, after they withdrew Harry's, C CSIRO submitted a paper to us, Feldman, 2015. And that paper confirmed that Harry's was poor. It was poor science and, and identified the same problems that we identified. I mean, the CSIRO is putting out a paper and then another paper that contradicts it. But none of the papers CSIRO cited specified the amount, if any, of human causation. CSIRO had not even read the papers or understood the papers, nor done its due diligence. Thirdly, when it all is stripped away, the CSIRO relies on unvalidated computer models based on limited and incomplete understanding of climate and giving erroneous projections. They forecast, these models forecast, that the upper troposphere will warm and get moister, more moist, and yet it actually is the reverse of that. It's cooler, and drier. The models cannot understand, cannot comprehend, uh, cannot portray anything about clouds, and that's a significant climate variable variability. They cannot present uh, updrafts. And yet this is what the government relies upon for policy. The only thing they rely on, because CSIRO has not got the evidence, the empirical evidence that should be used. Models are not science, they're not empirical evidence. They don't produce any confidence levels at all. So there's no validation of these models. In fact, they're unvalidated models, full stop. Professor John Christie, one of the world's leading climate scientists and the climatologist at Alabama, has said that he has closely examined CSIRO's access models and found them below par, as the projections simply do not match what we actually see in the real world. Quote, climate is so complex, our ignorance of the climate system is enormous, and the myriad of models have not even agreed on a key variable not even agreed on carbon dioxide sensitivities. Dr. David Evans, one of the world's top modelers and an Australian, says CSIRO climate models should not be used for policy as they are not right yet. I have done a freedom of information search and a parliamentary library search that proves no CSIRO or Bureau of Meteorology document has been given to ministers or MPs over the last 15 years that contains evidence that we are affecting the climate. I'll just go to now the CSIRO's response to my report. Get this, the CSIRO chief executive came out with a response to my report before the report, before my report was released. And thus, his report, his response to my report is not even based on observation or facts. It doesn't bother with the facts, CSIRO. The CSIRO's chief executive response yesterday simply recycled his letter to me dated 4th of March in response to my letter of 28th of February. The chief executive attempts to use nine substitutes for science that are there instead of science and that masquerade as science. He uses pseudoscience. He diverts into implying my letter smears CSIRO's people when it does not. I mean, this was last February and it's and it false. He appeals to a name or a brand or an authority in saying that CSIRO is uh, a prestigious organization. Well, that is, that is not science. There's no data. There is repeatedly no data, no data, no data. His comments are unsupported and therefore unfounded. He ignores completely the facts we provided. The chief executive has already dug himself into a hole and his response is to dig deeper. 
And we can say that now the onus is on government, which is where it should be, to provide the empirical evidence, the science, to justify their policies. We can also say to them it's futile for the government because we have the data and it will eventually break. Data always prevails, truth eventually emerges, it will drag alarmists kicking and screaming into reality. And One Nation will be there to protect the people of Queensland Thank and you, Australia. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Your time has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. Um, I rise to let the Chamber know the Isolated Children's Parents Association and the Australian Boarding Schools Association have commenced a social media campaign. Hashtag no borders for borders. They've been driven to do so by the farcical and inconsistent approach to border restrictions and the significant impacts it is having on the mental health and well-being of our students from some of our most re regional and remote locations. These students are being kept virtual prisoners by these border restrictions and the dogmatic refusal, refusal to show common sense and empathy for their situations. We have the ridiculous situation where one school in Victoria, because of announcements by the Victorian Premier, had to close its regional campus. And students from New South Wales were told they had to fly back to Sydney to return home to isolate. My office was inundated with calls. They were saying, why would we make our student, our children, go into a COVID hotspot to fly as unaccompanied minors into another COVID hotspot to then drive halfway across the state to return home to a COVID-free zone? It made no sense to me and it made no sense to these parents. Not one of these families have a problem with the need to self-isolate. In fact, in a response to a survey by the Isolated Children's Parents Associations, they all said they could guarantee their children would isolate for the full 14 days. They are willing to follow the rules when the rules make sense. But it was the requirement to fly, which in some instances meant a two to three day logistical exercise when to pick up their kids directly would have been a day trip. I have to thank the New South Wales Education Minister, Sarah Mitchell, for helping me get some of these students via a more direct route home through Albury on a sterile bus route. But I couldn't help all of them. Some parents, for whom Albury was just not an option, had to go to the expense of flying their children unaccompanied to Sydney to be picked up and driven across the state to isolate at home. But one family couldn't get their children home. Their boys, Barney and Charlie, in year 11 and 12, drive themselves in their old farm ute the 900 kilometres to school at the beginning of term and normally drive themselves the 900 kilometres home again. But when the campus closed, the family applied for an exemption to allow the boys to drive and they were refused. They were told to fly their boys unaccompanied, where the family would then have to drive 1,200 kilometres one way to pick them up, leaving the ute and the dog behind in Victoria. The family made a very difficult decision at that point in time for the boys to stay on at the closed campus and remote school from their boarding house. Credit to the school for facilitating this and taking care of those boys, and they are doing a damn good job. But the boys can't go out, they can't leave campus, they can't go to school because the school is closed, and they can't go home. These boys have kept their chins up. Barney and Charlie, good on you. They're tough kids. You have to be when you live 150 k's west of Burke, when you've been through years of drought, and when you've seen the sacrifices your parents have made so that you can get a good education. These boys are tough. But when they heard that they can't go home for school holidays, that's too much, and they are being sorely tested. Barney and Charlie, I want you home. 
just like I want to help other Victorian students who are at New South Wales boarding schools, who are facing the reality of going home for holidays but then having to lose two weeks of their school term to isolate on the way back. I want to help the students from northern New South Wales come home to their families from their Queensland boarding schools without having to fly back into Brisbane to quarantine and lose two weeks of the term in isolation. I want to help young Angus be able to go back to school in Adelaide from far west New South Wales without having to isolate yet again with his mum who had to leave the other kids on the farm to spend two weeks in a hotel with her son before he could start school at the beginning of this term. I want to help these kids get home for their holidays, to see the improved conditions because we finally had a better season. I want, to see the, I want them to see the tired relief on their parents' faces after the years of drought. And I want them to be able to spend their holidays helping with the first harvest they've had in years, which is what they want to do. Because anyone who lives in these regions and anyone who knows these farmers knows these kids see the stress and the strain that their families go through in the tough times that we've seen in this year. They know how tough it is for their parents to send them away. And add to that the usual teenage angst. And now tell them they can't go home for the foreseeable future. I can't stress to you enough the concern I have for the mental health and well-being of these kids, even though I know how strong they are. This is not political. We have borders being closed by both sides of politics, but neither have produced cred credible evidence for this. I have asked, through the COVID Select Committee, the Acting Chief Medical Officer on what medical basis is it better to advise families to undertake such a lengthy and potentially infectious round trip when common sense would say taking the most direct route from COVID-free zone to COVID-free zone would appear safer? And the answer? There is none. There is no medical advice to support the requirement to funnel people through hotspots. I am told border closures are very popular in the cities. And I get that. I understand that living in an area where there's community transmission would make you nervous. The idea of a lockdown seems to make sense. But we are talking about families that live hundreds of kilometres away from any COVID infection. And we are talking about kids that have been in schools that have the most stringent COVID safe practices imaginable. The steps that these schools have taken to keep their students, their staff and their communities safe is to be commended and puts other sections of our society to shame. And I commend the Boarding Schools Association for the work they have done. I fully support the hashtag No Borders for Borders campaign, and I call on the states to develop a nationally consistent approach as soon as possible, before school holidays, to deal with regional and remote students who are being unreasonably isolated from their families due to border restrictions that are based on no sound medical advice. Do it for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Green. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Tonight I'd like to tell you six reasons that the Liberals' uni cuts and fee hikes are absolute trash and should go straight in the bin. They are absolute trash and they will hurt uni unis and students, particularly in regional Australia. Many students will pay more some much more than others. That's number one, Madam Acting Deputy President. Students on average will pay 7% more for their studies and around 40% of students will have their fees increase, some of by 113%, paying 93% of the cost of their course. More money for uni fees. 
Students studying law, accounting, administration, economics, commerce, communications and humanities will pay more for their degrees than people doing medicine and dentistry degrees. There is definitely an ideology behind which courses are getting a fee hike. That we know. Reason number two, universities will get less to do more. Universities will pay, be given less money from this government and be required to do more work. The university sector will face a cut in their guaranteed funding of around $1 billion a year. And the average funding per student, well, that will drop by 5.8%. 5.8% per student. Number three, it won't even work, Madam Acting Deputy President. P policy assumptions behind this policy are flawed. Experts are convinced that the student choice will not be swayed by price signals. So the government trying to usher people into certain degrees by making them more expensive isn't actually going to work. And the pricing model used by the government to calculate the average university teaching costs is weak, and the authors of the research said that they should caution against using it in its fundings for the purpose of multiple methodological reasons. The government's job demanding modelling is based on labour force marketing forecasting done prior to COVID. Prior to COVID. They haven't even sat down and have a look at how COVID is affecting the labour market to be able to make these policy decisions. Number four, the Liberals' policy will do the opposite of what it's actually claiming to do. It will do the opposite of what it is claiming to do. Humanities graduates are just as in demand in the labour market as maths and science graduates, but the cost of humanities degrees is going to double. We're going to punish those students. We're going to tell students who want to go to university and study humanities that there is no place for you unless you are willing to pay a lot of money. In a Deloitte report called The Path to Prosperity, Why the Future of Work is Human, they said that actually today's jobs are increasingly likely to requ require cognitive skills of the head or, in another way of putting it, something new is also happening. Jobs are increasingly needing the use of our hearts. There's no reason why we should be punishing humanities students. We need humanities students, but this government is punishing them by rising the fees of their university degrees. Number five, the worst impacts of this new legislation that the government is introducing will impact on regional universities. Under this package, nearly twice as many regional and remote students will have to pay the highest rate of student fees. So much for standing up for the regions in the middle of an economic crisis. So much for supporting students from the bush. Regional universities deliver a greater proportion of courses that will have funding cut than non-regional universities. This government doesn't care about kids from the bush. It doesn't care about giving them a go if they want to go to university. They're making it harder for kids from the bush to go to university. And finally, the real clincher, the one that seals the deal on this legislation, which means that it definitely should go in the bin. While well, the Liberals are punishing Aussie kids, students will lose access to government support if they fail more than half of the subjects that they are enrolled in in the first year. This could create an incentive for universities to lower standards so fewer students fail. You know, going to university the first year, especially if you live in regional Australia, is tough. It's a hard year, it's a transition year, it's not easy for everyone. You go and you do your first course and maybe that is not the course for you. But are we going to punish kids for having a go? Or are we going to give them a go, as Scott Morrison always says? This Liberal government says, if you can't get it right the first time, see you later. We're not even going to give you a chance. We're not going to give you a chance to go to university if you can't get it right the first time. Well, Madam Acting Deputy President, this policy is absolute garbage. It belongs in the trash. Put it in the bin. 
students in regional universities deserve much better. Uh, and that brings me to my other topic I wanted to talk to you tonight. Uh, in regional areas, we're a tight-knit bunch. And tonight I want to share a story about a Cairns family man and a staunch trade unionist, John Lee. John's health isn't that good right now, and he's having a bit of a tough time, but I wanted to share his story with the Senate tonight. John's love of tugboats was sparked when he started working between Brisbane and Gladstone. He went on to work as a delegate for the Maritime Union of Australia in Mackay before moving to Cairns and going into semi-retirement for a few years ago. On the sea, John has always felt at home. John's most remarkable claim to fame goes back to 2014 when he formed part of a specialist crew on board the ocean field vessel to find the fallen MH370 aircraft black box. John is a father, a grandfather, and a beloved friend to those who know him. He is loyal to a fault, a man of principle, and a talented storyteller. Those who know him say that he can't speak highly, they can't speak highly enough of him. They are better off because they know John. The thing about John is he always tells 10% of the story to all his mates. So between us, we all get the full story in the end. John is humble like that and is never one to blow his own trumpet. John understands Labor's values, the importance of the union movement. He always listens to advice from unions in the interests of his family. John is particularly passionate about superannuation and contributions towards his retirement savings from day one have secured the future of his family. This has brought him happiness at a time when thousands of people are losing their jobs and facing an incredibly uncertain future. John has his quirks and his taste for VEB is certainly one of them, particularly being a Queenslander. But if there is one thing that John is famous for, it is his chant of giddy up comrade at the end of every phone call. John, you have been an inspiration to your loved ones, your friends, your work colleagues, and I wish you and your family all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak about a vision for South Australia, a state that is currently being inhibited by a perfunctory administration. South Australia is a great place to work and live. South Australians know it, yet we've seen a drop in population relative to the other states. The state's population has gone from 1.5 million in 2000 to 1.7 million today, an increase of 200,000. In the same period, WA's population has grown by more than 700,000. So we're not attracting people and businesses, and in many instances we're losing some of our best. Part of the reason for this, along with the broken migration framework that doesn't facilitate skilled migration, is a track record of failed infrastructure planning and execution. We've seen the closures of railway on the Air Peninsula. We've, about 75 per cent of our roads are in poor condition. We've got a state government that's dilly-dallied on ports. Now engaging KPMG to examine the best location for a port in circumstances where the federal government and uh, I thank them for that, has already backed Cape Hardy to the tune of $25 million. And then we've got insufficient power supplies to the South East and Air Peninsula. And that's just to name a few things. Sadly, we don't have a vision to inspire new businesses and investment to come across our state line. This is in spite of all the wonderful things about SA. So I want to lay out a vision and ask that Premier Marshall pay some attention. Down in the southeast, there's a Green Triangle freight plan. It's secured federal funding on the Victorian side of the border, but the SA government has failed to get funding, it, funding for it on our side of the border. This is a project that would see upgraded roads providing the means to get uh, the wood to the mills and to market, whilst improving safety for all road travellers. It's essential, yet sitting idle. Further north into the Mallee and Renmark, they're holding out for a dual carriageway 
from Renmark to, to Gawler, one that bypasses Truro and is capable of handling, handling high productivity vehicles, that's uh, trucks with lots of trailers. Such a road would transform commercial operations out that way. We also need to get power out there. Whilst there's a will for investment, the way is blocked through lack of electrical capacity. Closer to Adelaide, there's a need to establish a northern rail bypass, which will benefit both the Adelaide Hills and the Fluro Peninsula. It's been a topic of debate since the early 2000s, but that's all. Not good enough, Mr Marshall. In Adelaide, we've seen the building of the North-South Corridor. This went uh, into the infrastructure plan in February 2016, and four and a half later, years later, it's still going. What's there is a great road. I've travelled it a few times, but it seems to be the only significant uh, SA project underway, perhaps on account of successive state governments not thinking much beyond Jepps Cross, despite the prosperity that lies in our regions. Missing from any uh, serious consideration is the merging of Adelaide Uni, uh, Uni SA and Flinders Uni into the Australia University, something that would create Australia's premier higher education facility. And yet there's only background chatter on what would be the pathway to the establishment of SA as the education state. And of course, there's Osborne Naval Shipbuilding precinct. That will support hundreds of millions of dollars of annual activity. But Premier Marshall has been silent on this front, not advocating hard enough to keep Collins full cycle dockings uh, in uh, Adelaide and not pushing for additional OPVs to be built in Adelaide to fill the Valley of Death, nor to press for other naval ships on offer, such as the HADR vessel the Navy is planning. Before departing Adelaide, I note there is opportunity for electric vehicles to be built there. And that is something I have been talking to the federal government about, and I thank, uh, thank them again. They've been listening to that. Heading north from Port Adelaide um, is, is really good because it's got dual highway all the way to Port Whitefield and to the, to the newly planned overpass. And I welcome the newly planned overpass, but we still need to get from Port Whitefield up to Port Augusta with dual carriageway all the way. And as for Port Augusta, a town sitting above the goiter line with 300 days of sunshine per annum, it's Australia's future, future renewable e um, energy epicentre. We don't see enough being done there, however. Solar, wind farms, batteries, it's where it all belongs. And if fostered properly, would see South Australia exporting energy to the eastern states via the SA New South Wales interconnector. And of course, the transmission towers will be built from Wyala steel, made in Wyala rather than China, uh, and that will spur, spur demand for the Wyala steelworks. I'll come back to Wyala shortly. If properly seeded by government, we'd see bricks and tiles being made from the ash dam waste from the old coal-fired power station at, uh, at, uh, uh, at Port Augusta, the northern power station. Jobs and, environment, uh, and environmental uh, benefits, all in the same package. Heading out back, there's the Streslecki track. It will give uh, greater access to uh, the Mooma gas fields, assisting in cattle tra trade from Queensland down to Adelaide, and creating tourism opportunities. Sealing the Streslecki track, like so many other SA projects, has been in the planning since February 2016. I'll acknowledge it's, it's started, but of the 476 kilometres required, they're sealing only 50. After four and a half years, the tardiness of this road project is simply not good enough. Meanwhile, $330 million of federal funding has been secured to widen and seal the outback way running from Laverton in WA to Winton in Queensland via Alice, bypassing South Australia. Back down to the Air Peninsula and Whaler. We need to ensure that Sanjeev Gupta, uh, that is mini uh, SA Vision, and it's not that mini, gets underway. Expanding Whaler to become uh, one of the world's largest steel mills will transform the Iron Triangle. 
a 20 million tonne per annum facility? Well, I've already spoken about that uh, in this chamber, but it would take Wyala from 22,000 residents to 80,000, a town that would be serviced by Qantas and Virgin 737s flying from Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. And we need to extend the standard, rail, uh, standard gauge rail track from Wyala to Cape Hardy, the Air Peninsula's new deep water port. That would open up access to minerals in the Braemar province, the Woomera prohibited area and Woodna. It must happen, but the state government hasn't even started looking at it. Now we've got Cape Hardy. Well, that be, that, that's going to be good for grain and graphite and will serve as a hydrogen export hub. Green hydrogen is something the state government has been talking about but sadly only talking about. Port Lincoln is a successful fishing town and tourism town, but it should also be our space town. And whilst we've got the headquarters of the Space Agency in Adelaide, Port Lincoln and indeed Sejuna can and must be where our launch capability lies. At the moment, the greatest hurdle to the whole Australian space industry um, appears to be the Space Agency, who, who need more than a year to issue a launch per permit. Rest assured, they're in my, targets, uh, my, my sites for estimates. Unacceptable. If we get this wrong now, we will lose the opportunity. And of course, all these things on the Air Peninsula and Far West need to be properly fed by power, something that we're not, that we're not doing at the moment. Furthermore, we need to have appropriate transport options and accommodation. There's so much more I could uh, say, Madam Acting Deputy President, but I'm constrained by time. My message is to Premier Marshall. If you snooze, you lose. If you don't know how to drive a state forward, then grab a book on Tom Playford from the State Library of South Australia and have a read. I've tried to lay out the skeletons of a vision tonight. We need change. Only then will we draw uh, back to South Australia all those who have left and others willing to contribute. We need to be focusing on a long-term uh, SA population of three million people. And if it's done right, we'll be able to create a constitutional crisis by requiring those who want to come to South Australia to have to apply. Only then will we, will we be able to congratulate ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam. Acting Deputy President, uh, tonight I rise to report on my recent travels through the Kimberley, Pilbara and parts of the Midwest regions in my home state. And I'm pleased that Senator Smith is here this evening because I know Senator Smith, uh, for him, this is a, a very uh, important part of the great state of Western Australia and he's uh, and acknowledged the great work that uh, he does across that region. It's indeed a, a patron area for him. Uh, while uh, Parliament was cancelled, I decided that if I couldn't head east over that two-week period, I would head north, covering over 6,000 kilometres and with my staff covering even more. I spent two weeks on the road and the trip took me through Mekathara, Newman, Tom Price, Onslow, Caratha, Port Hedland, Marble Bar, Pardu, Broome, Derby, Fitzroy Crossing, Halls Creek, Wyndham, Kununurra and numerous small communities. The purpose, primary purpose of this trip was to see how the regional uh, communities across Western Australia have been affected by the coronavirus pandemic. And I was also pleased to visit a school and two volunteer organisations that have received grants with the support of Melissa Price MP. My first meeting of the trip was with the Shire of Mekathara. It was a great uh, to meet with them and get an insight into what's happening in the Midwest. And we discussed topics including school attendance and how the surging gold price had increased exploration both by Fossickers and exploration companies in the region. The road to Mekathara is, of course, the Great Northern Highway, which has had significant funding put into it by this government, improving the quality and safety of the road. One thing that struck me on that trip uh, was just how much equipment was being trucked up to the north. Indeed, I must have overtaken at least one oversized load an hour, and there were just as many heading in the other direction, as well as double, triple and even quad road trains, carrying everything from specialist mining equipment to laundry. And if anyone has ever doubted the phrase that without trucks Australia stops, they ought to spend a day driving on the Great Northern Highway. It really is like a freeway. The Mika Thara, uh, from Mekathara we travelled north, heading uh, into the Pilbara region, uh, into Newman, where I met with both the CCI and the Shire. 
And I'd like to thank Tanya from the CCI and the Shire President Lynn and CEO Jeremy for meeting with me. While in Newman, uh, not for the last time, the effect that FIFO was having on their community was raised. At any one time, there are over 40,000 FIFO workers in the Pilbara, and I can only imagine the economic and social benefits that would result from having even 10 per cent of these FIFO workers working uh, and relocating permanently into the region. I note the research that's been done by Regional Australia Institute over a 30-year period that for every 100,000 Australians who live who choose to live in growing small cities rather than our big five capitals, an additional $50 billion will be released into the economy. From Newman, it was on to Tom Price, where I was lucky enough to get a tour of Rio Tinto's uh, iron ore mine. Thanks to Jamie very much for hosting me and my staff on that visit, uh, a pioneering uh, mine site in the, in the Pilbara, uh, one of the first uh, iron ore mines up there. And it was terrific to see the difference between there and other mine sites that I got to visit. Uh, after the mine tour, I visited the North Tom Price Primary School, where Principal Linda Villanova showed me around the school and the new playground that would be built through the receipt of a volunteer grant with the support of the member for Durack, Melissa Price. Following this, I met with Ken Donoghue, CEO of the Shire of Ashburton. Ken outlined the, the Shire's strategic plan and raised with me the issue of childcare in the regions. This is an issue that I look forward to progressing, as I've heard it many times, uh, not just on this trip, but certainly on this trip uh, I heard it many times. From Tom Price, it was on to Onslow. And first stop was a meeting with the Onslow Sea Rangers, who are doing a magnificent job at monitoring and managing local wildlife. I also stopped by the Onslow Marine Support Base, a project which got off the ground thanks to NAIF funding by this government. Finally, I was given the tour of Chevron's Wheatstone LNG facility, a very impressive facility indeed, and another example of the Pilbara's premier economic position across this country. I'd like to thank Sean and Tiff at the Chevron for their hospitality. Uh, Chevron Shop's uh, local voucher campaign in the town was a great model of coronavirus stimulation that was created by a company. Uh, my next meeting was in Karratha with Mayor Peter Long, who gave me a tour of the town and showed me numerous sites of interest, as well as a tour of the Dampier foreshore development. That, uh, and, and I thank uh, his uh, support and Chris uh, Adams' vision for the city, and it really is to be commended. A Chamber of Minerals and Energy dinner uh, that evening was a fortuitously timed event, and I was very pleased to be able to attend. Uh, meeting with uh, representatives and executives from the resources sector who have uh, really been carrying the nation at this time, you'd have to say, with regards to the economic activity that is occurring up there. One particular uh, site that I'd like to make particular mention of while I was in, uh, in the Caratha and Dampier area was uh, uh, the company called Yarra Pilbara uh, in the Dampier Peninsula. Yarra is a visionary company that supply ammonia and ammonia nitrate to the region with plans to export renewable green hydrogen. Now, this is an exciting project, and I look forward to seeing what will come from it. There is an opportunity for, it, for Australia, and in particular this part of the world, to become a world leader in this space. And so I'd like to thank Luke and Mark for organising and hosting me on this visit. I learned a tremendous amount. I got to meet uh, Bo and, and his family, who run Karatha Asphalt, and they've got business uh, that, that's been given, uh, that's been provided because of the federal government investment into roads and, uh, and investment in infrastructure in that area, a local company taking advantage of local procurement and opportunities that, that follow. Uh, on the visit, I was especially uh, excited by the Pilbara University Centre with Susan Grills. Now, this is a fantastic facility, part of a fantastic program rolled out across Australia by this government. It will allow students to study uh, in university courses at facilities in the regions rather than leaving home to have to study in a capital city. Now, this is brilliant for regional communities, but also for the social fabric of regional centres. My final visit in Karratha was to the Dampier VFRS, another grant recipient. This was a volunteer grant. Uh, the, and the family-friendly atmosphere that I encountered there as they gathered together uh, for, for, for the opportunity for me to come was just so beautiful. And it was a great way to finish off the day, to see this amazing group of volunteers, not just there, 
uh, and be proud of their facility, but also to see their families there. Uh, these guys turn out when there's an emergency. Uh, they're volunteers and they're an amazing group of people. Look, uh, I've, there's so many uh, other places that I visited uh, right throughout the trip. I'd like to thank Fortescue for the opportunity to meet with them uh, uh, and to, to see firsthand the iron ore uh, delivered off the trains and onto the ships, uh, going over those conveyors uh, straight into the ships. The Pilbara exported in July alone over $12 billion in iron ore. $12 billion in iron ore went out through the Pilbara ports over the month of July alone. I visited a, a few uh, smaller communities on the trip as well. Uh, the advantage of taking it by road is you get to go to places that you'd often just fly over the top of. So going to a place like Marble Bar, for example. Now, Marble Bar is the hottest place in Australia. It has the highest temperatures in Australia, but I tell you, it is also one of the most picturesque and beautiful places, particularly at this time of year. And I got to meet with the CRC up there, Amy, who talked to me about the local issues, the need for training, the need for employment and the need to really activate a local workforce for the jobs that are, exist that are existing around there. I uh, got to ben spend some time uh, with a, a fantastic project uh, called Pardu Station. This is a cattle station there in the middle of the Pilbara. They have uh, centre pivots, uh, bores that, that go into the aquifer. Uh, without any pumps, they're able to actually deliver uh, uh, fresh water onto their, onto their um, um, pasture, and they're actually producing and growing Wagyu beef, would you believe, in the middle of the Pilbara. Look, I went on to the Kimberley. In the one minute that I've got left, I had a tremendous time uh, with uh, various community organisations, indigenous community organisations, uh, employment providers, training providers that are all active in working to improve the lives of particularly Aboriginal people up in that community. And those that know me and know my passion for that area is something that I'm wanting to persist with and see uh, some, some uh, real benefit come into these areas. This part of Australia is a great part of Australia, the North West. Uh, it is not actually a part of Australia that people on this side of the country really think too much about. But thank God for uh, the, the northern parts of Western Australia, because if it wasn't for the economic activity that is occurring right now over there, then boy, how would we be able to support the coronavirus uh, supports that are there for communities at this time? So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Billick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As many in this place are aware, I've been a long-time advocate for patients of cancers with low survival rates. It frustrates me that while cancer survival generally continues to improve, there are some cancers for which survival rates have languished, often due to insufficient attention or investment. The most common low survival rate cancer is lung cancer. It has the fifth highest incidence of cancer in Australia and is well ahead of other cancers as the leading cause of cancer death. Lung cancer is so deadly that it kills more Australians than breast, prostate and ovarian cancer combined. It is sadly a cancer whose patients are often stigmatised by the mistaken belief that all lung cancer is caused by smoking. The Lung Foundation is currently campaigning for an investment which would have the potential to significantly improve outcomes for lung cancer patients, Australian government funding for 15 specialist lung cancer nurses. The call is outlined in the Foundation's paper, Making Lung Cancer a Fair Fight, a Blueprint for Reform. And it's backed by a petition with over 4,000 signatures. The Australian government has invested in specialist nurses for breast and prostate cancer, and this has led to a significant improvement in patient outcomes for these diseases. Specialist cancer nurses can be an important part of a multidisciplinary oncology team, and their roles can include, but are not limited to, clinical care, patient care, coordination, provision of information to patients and families research and education, identifying and leading safety and quality improvements, advocacy and preventative health. The Senate Select Committee on Cancers with Low Survival Rates, which I chaired, recognised the benefits of specialist nurses or specialist care coordinators. Recommendation 21 of its unanimous report was that the Australian government, in conjunction with its state and territory counterparts, works to improve access to specialist cancer care coordinators or nurses for low survival rate cancer patients in every state and territory. 
and I was disappointed to see the government simply note this recommendation. The government said in their response that states and territories have primary responsibility for the employment of nurses and care coordinators. Even accepting this point, I fail to see why the Morrison government couldn't at least work with the states and territory on a consistent approach to employing care coordinators which invest in the areas of greatest need. And if the Morrison government thinks states and territories should be entirely responsible for funding these positions, then why would they announce $27 million in Commonwealth funding for specialist breast cancer nurses and $23 million for prostate cancer nurses? Now, I'm not saying, and I'm by no means arguing, that the Commonwealth shouldn't invest in specialist prostate or breast cancer nurses, but I believe the Lung Foundation has put forward a very compelling argument that the case can be just as easily made for federally funded lung cancer nurse specialists. A study by the Lung Foundation shows that patients who have access to a specialist lung cancer nurse are 34 per cent more likely to receive access to treatment than those who do not. Right now, Australia has 12 full-time equivalent specialist lung cancer nurses, and this equates to less than one nurse for every 1,000 lung cancer patients, which leaves Australia lagging behind many comparable nations. A study in the Asia-Pacific Journal of Clinical Oncology found that people living with lung cancer have the highest unmet needs, the highest levels of psychological stress, the poorest quality of life and tend to underutilise hospital and community support services. The situation is likely to get worse because of COVID-19, with the challenges of travel restrictions and self-isolation, not to mention a reported 50 per cent fall in referrals for lung cancer patients between March and June this year. I wrote to the Minister for Health, Mr Hunt, to put to him the case that the Lung Foundation has made for funding specialist lung cancer nurses. And I received a reply from the Minister's Chief of Staff reiterating what they told the inquiry, that state and territory governments are best placed to provide cancer care coordinators or nurses. But what the Minister's office didn't explain, and I'd be interested to hear this explanation from the Minister, is why he believes a case has been made for Commonwealth funding of nurse specialists for Australians diagnosed with other types of cancer, but not for lung cancer patients. I urge the government and Mr Hunt in particular to give this issue more serious consideration. And Madam Acting Deputy President, the other thing I want to speak about tonight is something quite different. It's about I want to speak about the disturbing trend in Australia where increasingly you work for a company but you don't legally work for them. You might spend day in, day out working to provide services for a company, but instead of working for them, you are in fact employed by a subcontractor which provides your labour as a service. For many people, they are now doing exactly the same job as they had previously done for the same company, and yet their employer is different. We saw the tragic effects earlier this year when Donata, which bought Qantas's in-house catering services, was unable to obtain JobKeeper for Australian workers. These workers have paid taxes in Australia while providing services to an Australian airline that they had, before the buyout, worked for for many years. And now Qantas is going to repeat the same dirty trick. Qantas has received hundreds of millions of dollars in government subsidies yet it's refusing to protect the jobs of their workers. They've revealed plans to outsource ground handling at major Australian airports as well as at larger regional airports. And the airports expected to be affected include Adelaide, Alice Springs, Brisbane, Cairns, Canberra, Darwin, Melbourne, Perth, Sydney and Townsville. They're planning to axe all of their 2,400 ground baggage and cleaning jobs and outsource them on top of the 6,000 redundancies they announced in August. It's not good enough to get rid of workers, only to rehire the same workers through another provider with lower pay and worse conditions. And it's especially not good enough when the CEO receives almost $24 million last year. Qantas says it will save $100 million per year by outsourcing its ground handling work. But where will that $100 million come from? It will come from the pockets of workers who will receive lower pay and less entitlements, causing inconvenience to travellers as there will be fewer workers to provide the same service. We've heard reports that some employees in air services industries have been paid below award wages and have been asked to work in unsafe conditions. 
This must not become the fate of these thousands of employees that have been proud to work for the national carrier, some for decades. This outcome would simply be un-Australian. Australian workers deserve better. Australian taxpayers deserve better. Now, I was a union official uh, that represented ANSET workers when it went into liquidation almost two decades ago. And it made me angry then, and it still makes me angry now, that workers are the ones who are forced to have their paying conditions cut when things go bad, that workers are retrenched but top-end management keep their jobs and high salaries while banks and other creditors manage to take their share first. Qantas has received $267 million through the JobKeeper program so far and $248 million through other government financial assistance packages. What is the benefit of this expenditure if not to keep Australians employed? Let's be very clear. Josh Frydenberg is entirely responsible for who gets JobKeeper and how much they get. So it's absolutely crucial that the JobKeeper payments are going to businesses that are going to look after their workforce. Qantas will be paying a dividend in September to its shareholders. So while crying poor, accepting hundreds of millions of dollars in government subsidies and sacking thousands of employees, they're still able to shovel public money into private hands. And I'd like to quote the National Secretary of the Transport Workers Union, Michael Kane, whose union represents the workers impacted in these changes and the earlier Donata decision. And he said, we are calling on the Prime Minister to intervene and call Qantas to account over its misuse of taxpayers' money. There is no dividend for the public if a company like Qantas can sack thousands of workers after receiving such financial support. The Prime Minister has failed to date to implement a national plan on aviation. He must act now to urgently save jobs and ensure return for the public. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'd just quickly like to thank all the Transport Worker Union members, delegates and activists who will fight to stand up for these jobs. We've seen earlier this year how the actions of these members and the broader union movement resulted in the government doing a backflip on a wage subsidy the Prime Minister previously said would never happen. In closing, wage subsidies should be used to protect Australian jobs. They should not be used to prop up corporate dividends and high CEO salaries. The government must hold employers to account, including Qantas, that take hundreds of millions of dollars in wage subsidies and then sack their employees in the end and hire them through other companies on lower page and worse conditions. That is completely unacceptable behaviour. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In the same week that the Skype scandal broke around the Australian Defence Force Academy, next door at the Royal Military College, Duntroon, a cadet hung himself. He had asked for help from his leadership and he was turned away. The public never heard a damn thing about it. All the cadets at the Royal Military College at the time were called together and told by the commanding officer not to discuss their mate's suicide. The commanding officer was worried it would add to the media storm on the scandal that was brewing outside. In issuing the order to go silent, the commanding officer at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Jason Hedges, and you know who you are, didn't even have the respect or the care to correctly remember the deceased cadet's name. That's how strong the culture of cover-up is on our defence faces. It goes right to the top of our brass. It is right to the school of our officers, and it's killing people. And the public don't hear a damn thing about it. I'm ending the silence, and I'll continue to do that. I'm speaking up today on behalf of the people who have reportedly been told to shut up about the toxic culture at the very top of the Australian Defence Force. I'm going to tell you what our cadets are going through. The cadets who have been through the military college at Duntroon know what the culture is like better than anyone else. They have been through hell time and time again. They have seen their mates being bullied and harassed by their own superiors, what is supposed to be the very top of our echelon. They have gotten dodgy health care that too often left them worse off than when they first visited the doctor on base. And Every time they tried to speak up, they got shot down from the very people who are supposed to be looking after them, the top dog of the officers. They were called malingerers and told to get on with it. Here's an example. On the 12th of March 2011, most of the cadets at the Royal Military College were off-site on field exercises. The only ones left on base were in rehab for service-related injuries. The wounded cadets were sitting in their rooms trying to recover when they heard the voice of their regimental sergeant major yelling that there was a fire in the library. 
Despite their injuries, they rushed out to fight the flames. One of the cadets, and we'll call him Lewis, was covering from knee, knee surgery. Ignoring his pain, he ran into the library to put out the flames side by side at the time with the regimental sergeant major. Other injured cadets were grabbing fire extinguishers from around the base and running them back to Lewis and the regimental sergeant major who were fighting the blaze. They were running on reconstructed knees, carrying equipment on reconstructed shoulders and lifting equipment with broken hands, many re-injuring themselves in the process. One cadet hurt himself so bad, badly that he was ultimately discharged from the Australian Defence Force as a result. After the fire, the cadets were required to write a written statement about what had happened. They tried to tell the truth, as had always been taught, that Lewis and the regimental sergeant major and the other wounded cadets had bravely worked to put out the fire. But the senior officers at Gets Great Now told them what they had to put in their statements. What they had to put in their statements. The cadets' written versions of the events were returned to them for revisions over and over again by their direct chain of command. They were given verbal warnings to include some details and leave others out. Their commanding officers forced them to paint a picture that falsely glorified the actions of their superiors and downplayed their own. One commanding officer had only entered the burning building to tell the Re regimental sergeant major and Lewis that the fire brigade had arrived, but despite doing next to nothing, he used the biased statements to claim responsibility for the actions of his subordinates. He took credit for things that he never did. That man got a commendation for brave conduct that he did not deserve. Lewis, on the other hand, was driven out of the military within weeks. I hope you're listening to this, Chief of Defence Force, because there's more to come, and I've got the evidence. Let me tell you about Lewis. This is his story, like so many others. He entered the Royal Military College of Duntroon as a bright, enthusiastic, friendly kid. He was excited to be able to join the Army, and he was cut down on day one. On the first day, he was told by the senior officer of his company that he didn't belong there. His senior officer told him that he'd do everything in his power to stop him from graduating. This is what we do to our kids, our cadets. And he was told directly around others that his senior officer didn't like him. He was injured. He needed knee surgery. But his senior officer spread rumours that he was making it up, that he was lazy, that he was only going to rehabilitation to spend more time with his boyfriend. I don't know how the, I don't know how the senior officer finds that amusing. This is the sort of crap that's going on. It was bullying, plain and simple, to the point of wearing T-shirts around, giving this young boy a hard time. This, this is the truth of the matter. It came from the very top. It comes from the very top of the leadership comes from our colleges and military colleges, the very top of the brush, and nothing's been done about it, nothing was done about it then, and still nothing has been corrected. Eventually, Lewis was forced out illegally and abusively. He left the Royal Military College as a shell of his former self. Lewis's story is the same as so many other, other cadets. The bullying and intimidation by senior officers is one of the reasons why one veteran a week takes their own life. It breaks people's minds and their bodies. And when they try to speak out, the bullying only gets worse. So many of the cadets at RMC had the same problems as Lewis and continue to have the same problems. They all suffered from the lack of care and respect by those at the top. Here's another example, the medical care that they put, had, put, had put up with. Royal Military College at the time only had one doctor, and I'm going to name you today, Barbara. Your name is Dr Barbara Thompson. Are you listening to me, April? Because you had better be investigating this by breakfast in the morning. She was the only doctor they were allowed to see. Any review of Dr Thompson's treating history whilst at RMC would show a slow-moving train wreck of neglect and carelessness. She did enormous damage to so many of, cadet, of those cadets at RMC, and their senior officers knew about it and ignored it and still continue to ignore it. She lied, she bullied, she coerced and she covered up. And in one case, Dr Thompson used a cadet's personal records to track down his parents online, find out their jobs and pressure him to voluntary discharge because she thought they were well enough off to pay for him to go to uni, and therefore he wouldn't get compensation either. She repeatedly refused staff cadets access to their own medical documents, which they needed to substantiate the veteran, their Department of Veterans Affairs claims. One of the cadets who helped fight the fire in 2011 entered Dr Thompson's medical care with a single broken bone in his master hand. Today, 12 surgeries later, his wrist and hand are completely fused. He's had five bones removed, has permanent nerve damage and a degenerating condition. 
another cadet presented with a badly injured hip. You've got two of them. You've got two hips. Dr Thompson ordered an X-ray of the wrong one. She even wrote in his medical records that the specialist who recommended surgery, which he tried to deny, was doing so because he wanted a new boat for Christmas. The whole command structure knew this was going on. It took multiple cadets over, going over the head of their senior officers to, at Royal Military College to finally provoke an investigation into Dr Thompson's conduct. Just as she was finally going to be investigated, she disappeared. How about that? Defence covering something else up. And in 2011, her office was cleared out and it appears that no, end of it, no investigation has ever been formally conducted. Well, come on, we're coming now, girlfriend, I tell you. Some of those army medical records of cadets under her care have completely disappeared too. But I'm sure that's just a coincidence, right? Yeah, sure. Now, there are bad doctors out there. It's not remarkable that we'd have one here. What's remarkable is that when this was raised repeatedly, nobody did anything. None of those senior officers did a damn thing, and they're supposed to be full of leadership. I've documented proof that Defence was made aware of the complaints against Dr Thompson in 2010 and 11. They ignored it. Instructors knew they ignored it. That is negligence. That is plain as day a breach of Defence's duty of care. This is what's going on. Defence is failing its recruits. They're losing our good kids. Lewis, an injured cadet who ran into a fire on a busted need and fought to save his base, was bullied and abused until he had to leave. He should have been decorated for his actions on the day of the fire, and instead he was broken by his senior officers. He was told he was useless and his supervisors stole the credit for his bravery. He is still suffering to this day. He experiences daily panic attacks. He barely leaves the house. His family life has fallen to pieces, and he is in constant chronic pain. He has attempted suicide multiple times, and he is not the only one out of these group of boys. So far, I have 13 of them on my list. And you know that you're under investigation, and I know you're under investigation, and I know that the minister knows about this of defence too, and she'll be questioned tomorrow. And within that same group of RMC cadets, there have been three suicide attempts since Anzac, Anzac Day, and there have been many more before that. One of these cadets was in the emergency department this week after self-harming. That's the situation that they're in. And everything I've said tonight, I've said because I can prove it. Notes, records, documents, you name it. I've seen the proof. I've got this proof. And tonight's just the tip of the iceberg. What's more, I know that the ADF has seen it too. And more people know about this than have come forward so far. So if you are one of those boys, if you are one of those boys, then please come to my office because I know I know of 13 of you and I know there's many more to come. Don't let this, don't let them get away with this. Come to my office. Thank you, Senator. Lambie, the Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.